Go like this. Hi. Please be sure to mute your microphone upon entry. If you haven't already, thank you. Madam City Clerk, are we ready for uh, a roll call? So, Mr. Mayor, I see Jack and uh, John as attendees who need to be promoted. And Jack, we will be letting him into the meeting right now. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, John was there too. I see he's joining. That was my fault. I apologize. So yes, we're ready. All right, this is Mayor Tom Schwedel. I'll call this meeting to order. Madam City Clerk, can we do a roll call, please? Yes, Council Member Dowd. Present. Council Member Tibbetts. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Council Member Rogers. Here. Council Member Oliveras. Here. Vice Mayor Fleming. Here. Mayor Schwedhelm. Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. Great. Thank you for that. I've got some housekeeping I want to read to everyone. I uh, just want to remind council members to keep your audio on mute unless you're speaking. Uh, council members other than uh, myself can mute themselves. Staff will remain muted until needing to speak. And as members of the public join the meeting, you'll be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and camera will be muted. Only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. And then if you're calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during the public comments portion of today's agenda, for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to citizen in the last four digits of your phone number. Uh, Madam City Clerk, could you explain the public comments and how they'll be heard during today's meeting? 
Yes, as each agenda item um, comes up the, and the item is presented, the mayor will ask for count, council comments and then open it up for public comment. The host in Zoom will be lowering all hands until public comment is open for that specific agenda item. Once the mayor has called for public comment, the mayor will announce for the public to raise their hands if they wish to speak on that item. If you are calling in to listen to the meeting audibly, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on public on the public who have raised their hands. Public comment will be limited to three minutes and a timer will appear on the screen for the council and the public to see. Um, then the meeting host will play any voicemail public comments received and then all public comments will received will be made part of the archive record. All right, thank you for that. Uh, let's see, we had no closed session. Let's go to our stay session. Uh, item 3.1, Mr. City Manager. Item 3.1, fiscal year 2020-2021 O&M and CIP budgets. Council, um, I, I do have some opening comments to make. Uh, as of Monday, the city of Santa Rosa has spent 84 days with an activated EOC in this fiscal year. That includes time spent responding to PSP events last fall, the Kincaid fire, and the current pandemic. Staff has come up with solutions to address the loss of sheltering space. The city lost 20 26% of its shelter capacity. That has been more than offset by staff's work to accommodate shelter in place requirements of the Sandman and the Finley Center. But the burn rate per month to sustain those two locations is close to half a million dollars. Addressing the challenge, Catch staff has also addressed the challenges to convert from a counter community facing business model to a virtual intake and processing business. And, and, and you will see at the end of this presentation, the staggering list of accomplishments that Team Santa Rosa has been able to address during the course of this fiscal year in face of all those challenges and uncertainties. And, and I'm more than a little ashamed that we won't have a chance to actually go through them in detail. I just wanna highlight the range of those particular types of accomplishments. The, the city legal department has worked incredibly hard on PG&E litigation and CPUC proceedings during the course of the year. Staff added after school sites to support the Roseland and Coddington neighborhoods. They processed over 1500 meter requests to reestablish water services in our fire impacted areas. Staff filled nearly 5,000 potholes and removed 1000 cubic tons of debris from the public right away. And the police department created a recruitment um, team whose mission includes addressing diversity within its ranks. Fire and the PIO team created a Know Your Way Out evacuation toolkit for the community. And that seems such a long time ago now that that particular tool came into play. We're heading into another very challenging budget cycle. Um, we are actually, as the Fed chairman said, at the tip of a recession um, that can leave lasting damage to the productive capacity of the economy and households and businesses face insolvency that can weigh on growth and our economy for years to come. We trail that, but you're gonna to see today we're already being impacted by that particular set of circumstances. Santa Rosa is not alone. The League of California Cities estimates that statewide, cities will lose nearly $7 billion in revenue. And as was illustrated back on 428, the city of Santa Rosa is projected to lose at least $20 million in the current fiscal year in the current year, and as much as $70 million over the next three years. That has led a staff to propose essentially a flat budget. This will staff allow staff to analyze actual impacts and hopefully see some relief from our state and federal partners. We will be back on September 15th to review the pot and potentially take further actions beyond this budget. Today, we're gonna present some of those decisions and directions. We're looking for clarification and input from the council so that we can bring back a well thought out adopted budget hearing process on 623. I'll also, now I will ask to switch to the next 
uh, after my comment slide, if we can advance the deck to unbudgeted events. I just want to take a moment and just flip to the next slide and remind council that we have faced a tremendous amount of unbudgeted activity this year. As I said 84 earlier, 84 days in an activated scenario with an EOC. This, this particular counting looks at hours spent. Those hours are, are straight or overtime, straight time, overtime. It includes PPE, media outreach, and sanitation work that we've done. This is the COVID estimated expenses. We've applied for an advance to get those that expedited uh, it through an expedited process with FEMA, where we can it's, we think we can receive about six hundred thousand dollars through that expedited reimbursement. But as council knows, through past experience, the reimbursement process is a long, rigorous process. So we we will not be seeing the full one million dollar reimbursement even as we accrue more costs around those particular engagements and particular response items. So just this gives you a, an idea of the costs that we're accruing, the, the, the difficulty it will be to adjust to those particular types of cost centers, and the uncertain end date for this particular emergency. And I, and I just need to remind council, reimbursement does not happen on day one. Reimbursement is a long 12, 18, 24 month, in effect, still in the process of trying to get reimbursement on several projects from our 17 fires. Advance the slide, please. And this is just a, a further breakdown on some of those costs to give you a capture of what we're facing and where we, we believe will be through the through estimated June expenditures. Um, and that concludes the city manager's prelude to the budget presentation. All right, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Council, any questions of the city manager on his presentation? Mr. Rogers, is that you? Yeah, just as a, a quick um, aside, Sean, you had listed the amount in contracts uh, for COVID expenses. Uh, and I'm just wondering where the public can see what those contracts ended up being uh, either now or uh, as we move forward uh, as a review. We'll, we'll provide a breakdown of that so that we can fill that particular item out. Hey, Mr. Tibbetts, you had your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Um, Sean, those PSPS uh, costs, were those included in the management partner's estimation that they provided to us about two, maybe three weeks ago now? In, 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 they, were, they were recorded as actual costs for the last year, but they, there's no projected costs for next year. And again, we only have one year to make a basis upon, but that's why I'm showing that slide. You're likely to incur costs in response to PSPS and potentially fire events in the fall. And so we need resources available to address those particular events and those uncertainties. So it was provided in the management partner's budget. I'm sorry, I was- It, it was provided in the recap. There is not, it is not budgeted for in the, in the next coming year, but those are costs that may repeat themselves if not grow. And none of those those costs were not eligible for federal reimbursement. Okay, thank you. All right, any additional questions? So just let staff or uh, council know how we'll be going through this. Um, we've got some pauses here where we, where we can ask questions. And I'd ask any of you to use the uh, raise hand feature um, of Zoom. And if you need to, find where that is. If you just click on participants, then one of your options, you can invite, mute uh, mute, or raise your hand. Just raise your hand that way. It'll be easier for me to uh, call upon you as we continue on with the presentations. So with that, for the citywide proposed budget overview, Shelly, I believe you're the presenter on this item. Correct. Good afternoon, Mayor Spratholm and City Council. This is Shelley Riley, Acting Deputy Director of Finance. Um, I will be going over the 2021 CYS proposed budget overview. Next slide. This first slide is the citywide revenue by fund. 
The fiscal year 2021 forecasted revenue for all funds is $400 million, a 5% decrease from last fiscal year, with the general fund and enterprise funds experiencing the greatest decrease in revenue due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The general fund rev revenue is estimated to decrease by 14.3 million and the enterprise funds to decrease by 12.6 million. In future slides, we will go into more detail about these revenues. The special revenue funds include the original measure of sales tax fund, the two county measure M funds for parks and streets, gas tax, park development fees and capital facility fees. These funds are expected to increase by $4.8 million, primarily driven by a 7.5 million increase in Measure M funds dedicated to street repair. These funds were uh, existing at the Sonoma County Transportation Authority and will be used on two CIP projects, the Hearn Avenue overpass and Fulton Road widening. The increase in the special revenue funds is offset by losses related to the pandemic as well. The original measure O for sworn and violence prevention is expected to decrease by 15%, down from 10 million annually to 8.5 million. This 15% loss estimate is identical to the sales tax loss estimate in the general fund. Other funds is made up of debt service funds, special assessment district and investment funds. These funds are forecasted to see a minor decrease in revenue of $100,000. Housing authority revenue is forecasted to be flat with less than a 1% increase from last fiscal year for a total revenue of $40 million. Successor agency expected, is expected to see a minor decrease of $300,000 for a total revenue of 3 million. Again, the total citywide revenue for fiscal year 2021 is forecasted at 399.1 million, a $22 million decrease from last year's budget. Next slide. This slide is the proposed citywide expenditures for all funds. With the total citywide expenditures for fiscal year 2021 at $437 million. This is a $2.2 million budget reduction, less than 1% from fiscal from last fiscal year. The general fund budget increased by $6 million to a total expenditure budget of $177.3 million, and will be discussed in more detail in future slides. The enterprise operating funds budget decreased by 1.7 million to $128 million, while the enterprise capital improvement funds increased by $1 million to $33 million. <clears throat> the enterprise budgets and CIP projects will also be discussed in greater detail later in the presentation. Non-enterprise CIP, CIP funds saw a significant drop of 22% in expenditures due to the one-time funding last fiscal year of general fund support to fire recovery proje projects and infrastructure. This funding was not included in the 2021 budget. The special revenue funds propose a budget increase of $1.2 million. Special revenue funds include the Measure O for Sworn and Violence Prevention, Homeless Services Fund, Admin Hearing Fund, and the Santa Rosa Tourism BIA for a total budget in the special revenue funds of $16.5 million. The budget for other funds is expected to decrease slightly by $200,000, primarily driven by the decrease in debt service expenses for total expenditures and other funds of 5.2 million. The housing authority again is relatively flat and is expected to have a $100,000 increase from loan activity for total expenditures at $44 million. The successor agency is budgeted at $3 million, $300,000 less than prior fiscal year due to decreased administrative costs. Overall, the operating funds of the city are budgeted at one point at a 1.4% increase as the city tried to hold the 2021 budget similar to last year. The CIP funding was reduced overall by 7.3 million, primarily from one-time funding in the prior fiscal year 
And again, the CIP projects will be discussed in further detail at the end of the presentation. Next slide. Uh, these next few slides are going to go into the fiscal year 2021 general fund proposed budget. Next. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the proposed fiscal year general fund revenue by category. As you all heard a few weeks ago when our consultants presented the long range financial forecast, the general fund is facing significant and dramatic reductions in the revenue forecast due to the pandemic. Overall, the general fund revenue is forecasted at $164 million or an 8% an eight or 14 million reduction from last year. As you can see, most of the categories of revenue are estimated to be lower than the prior fiscal year's adopted budget. The exceptions are property tax, tax and vehicle license fees. These taxes are paid in arrears so they are not initially affected by the pandemic. Overall, we expect property tax and vehicle license fee revenues to increase by 5.5% due to the Tubbs fire home rebuilds and new construction. As advised by our various consultants, we are estimating sales tax to be, due, to be reduced by 15% next fiscal year. General fund sales tax includes the general sales tax, Measure P and the new Measure O for fire relief. Some of these, <clears throat> some of the 15% reduction is offset by the expected growth in online sales. So you see, overall, the sales tax revenue is estimated at a 7.5 million reduction from last fiscal year for a total of a little over $54 million. Utility users tax is the usage tax on electricity, gas cable and telecommunications. We expect to see a 5% reduction of these taxes due to the pandemic. In addition, the city has been experiencing reduced revenue in UUT as customers move away from cable and turn to streaming services. Overall, the revenue forecast for UUT is a reduction of 600,000 or a 5.7% decrease. The other taxes category has multiple revenue sources. Some of these sources are expected to be affected by the pandemic, including the transient occupancy tax, tax also known as the hotel tax, real property transfer tax, and business tax. Along with a consultant, we are estimating a 30% loss in the revenue for each of these taxes for, for a combined loss of $4 million for these three revenue streams. Other tax revenue also includes franchise fees and cannabis business tax, which are estimated to not be affected by the pandemic. Fortunately, we expect franchise fees to be stable, which accounts for about $10 million annually and are estimating an increase in the cannabis business tax. Already in fiscal year 1920, cannabis business tax revenue is higher than the budget, and we expect this to continue into next year. Cannabis revenue is forecasted to be almost $2 million next year with a gross of about half a million dollars. Permits, fines, and charges for services are primarily funds collected by the Planning and Economic Development Department, but also includes fines charged by the police and fire departments and parking enforcement. As advised by the consultant, a reduction of 25% was forecasted for this category next fiscal year for an overall total of almost $11 million in revenue. Interfund charges are revenues collected by the general fund from other citywide funds for general administration. The total revenue is $14 million for fiscal year 2021, which is essentially flat from last fiscal year. Recreation fee revenues are also hindered by this shelter in place order and the limitation of large gatherings. They are forecasted to decrease by 30% next year. This results in anticipated loss of $1 million for a total revenue of 2.5 million. Intergovernmental interest and other revenue is comprised of, fun is comprised of funds received from the county for the Roseland annexation area which is about $1.2 million. 
strike team reimbursement, about 800,000. Crime mitigation funds from the Grinton Casino, about 345,000 and other grant funds. This category is estimated to be reduced by $600,000, primarily due to the expiration of one-time grants received last year. In align with the presentation in April of the Long Range Financial Plan, you can see the general fund revenue estimates are dramatically impacted by the current pandemic with the overall forecasted reduction in revenue of 8% of $14 million compared to the last year's adopted budget. Next slide, please. This slide is a pie chart of the revenues by category. As you can see, the largest percentage of general fund is in sales tax, and the second largest is property tax. Next slide. Uh, now we will discuss the 2021 general fund expenditures. Um, these are the proposed general fund expenditures by category. For fiscal year 2021, the general fund was budgeted to be held flat compared to last year's budget with very few exceptions. Overall, the expenditures <clears throat> only increased by 3.5% or $6 million for a total budget of $177 million. Salary and benefits are the biggest portion of the budget at $139 million or 80% of the total general fund budget. Salaries were held, held relatively flat with minor adjustments for new hires and merit increases. Overall, the general fund is proposing to reduce by a total of 1.5 positions, which will be detailed shortly. Benefits saw the largest increase of $2.9 million, mainly due to increases in both the normal CalPERS retirement rates and the unfunded liability payment. Normal retirement costs increased by $1 million for a total of $14 million in the general fund. The unfunded liability increased by $1.5 million to an $18.5 million, pay million dollar payment for the general fund's annual share. I just wanted to note here that last year, the council decided to apply an additional $4.2 million to the unfunded liability. This payment allowed the city's um, payment for fiscal year 2021 to be reduced by $165,000. Healthcare is the next major, med major benefit. It's expected to have a minor increase next year for a total of $14 million. All other be benefits were held relatively flat with insignificant changes. The service and supplies budget and the general fund experienced small increases and decreases, but most of this movement was between the categories to better align budget with actuals. Professional services are budgeted at $13.4 million. The increase of 1.5 million is mainly driven by the cost of the November 2020 elections for a total of $440,000. And for the ball field and turf mowing landscaping contract, which added an additional $530,000, as well as some other minor contractual increases. Vehicles expenses increased by 10% or $500,000. Most of this increase is in the replacement funding for vehicles and increases in garage rates. A small portion of this increase was also offset by a decrease and the other miscellaneous category. Operational supplies is budgeted at 3.3 million with a decrease of 100,000. Most of this movement was between the various other service and supply categories. Utility costs are budgeted at 5% higher than last year, mainly due to an anticipated cost increase by PG&E. IT costs are the general funds portion to run our IT department and software costs. This increase of 8.5% is mainly driven by increases in the software costs for licenses such as Microsoft Office and NeoGov. The other miscellaneous category includes expenses for dues and subscriptions, advertising, meetings, conference and trainings, and lease payments. As mentioned earlier, a portion of this budget shifted to vehicle expenses, 
as the lease for the fire truck expired this year, these funds were shifted to the replacement cost of the vehicle. There was also a minor increase of $60,000 for print services related to the election. Capital outlay are expenses for items such as replacement of existing playground equipment and vehicle charging stations. These costs were held flat at $100,000. The O&M projects are budgeted at 2.6 million with a 1.5 million decrease. This is due to the slowing down of the fire recovery center as the vast majority of the fires of the fire destroyed homes are permitted and rebuilt, we expect the contract cost for the service center to decrease further over time. There's also some movement of these funds to other service and supply categories. Next slide. These are uh, the same general fund expenditures, just broken down slightly differently by department. Again, all the departments held a budget consistent with last year's budget. The significant changes in the department budgets is mainly due to the continued reorganization of the city. New for fiscal year 2021 is the Communications and Intergovernmental Relations Department. This department was established by moving positions and budgets from various departments into this one. The Communications is part of the administration and has a budget of 1.1 million. The Housing and Community Service Department reorganized and transferred the Code Enforcement Division to the Planning and Economic Development Department. Code Enforcement Division consisted of over 1 million in budget and 10 positions moving to PED. Leaving Housing and Community Services Department with a total budget of $200,000 and PES budget of almost 15 million. The fire and police department both held their service and supplies budget the same as last fiscal year, but had significant increases in benefit costs for retirement. For the fire department, both the unfunded liability costs and CalPERS normal retirement costs increased by over $500,000 each with a net budget increase of $800,000. The total budget for the fire department is proposed at 44 million. For the police department, the unfunded liability costs increased by 1.2 million and the normal retirement costs increased by 500,000, accounting for the majority of the increase in the police department as well, for a total budget of 62 million. Recreation and community engagement transferred $500,000 of budget to the communications and intergovernmental relations department. This included a marketing and outreach coordinator, a rec specialist and service and supplies budget for brochures and marketing for recreation and engagement activities, leaving the department with a total budget of 9.8 million. Transportation and public works budget increased by 1.3 million to a total of 28.2 million. As mentioned, part of this increase is due to the increased landscaping costs also, the real estate project funds were transferred from the city manager's office to the to TPW to better align with staff. The water department has a small section of the general fund budget for stormwater. Stormwater's budget was held relatively flat with less than $100,000 change from last fiscal year's adopted budget for a total budget of $600,000. Non-departmental's budget includes costs for the animal shelter, county administrative fees, the general fund portion of the fire and liability insurance and other citywide contract services. The budget also includes credits for anticipated salary savings and the offset for the general fund administrative costs charged to other general fund departments. For fiscal year 2021, this budget is proposed as a credit, a credit of almost $5 million. Overall, the general fund proposed a budget expenditure very similar to last year with a total budget of 177 million. Next slide. This is just a pie chart of the expenditures by department for the general fund. The public safety department, so the majority of this fund with the police department at 35% and the fire department at 25%, followed by um, public Works of Administration and Planning and Economic Development. 
Next slide. Uh, the general fund baseline calculation. In accordance with the original measure of sales tax measure for public safety and violence prevention, the general fund's contribution to these programs is required to be a, at a specific funding level as set forth in the ordinance. For the police department, the baseline level is 34%, 24% for the fire department and 0.4 for the violence prevention program. Each of the programs is over the baseline requirement percentage for fiscal year 2021. The police department is over baseline by 1.4 million, the fire department by 2.2 million, and the violence prevention program by 27,000. Next slide. These next two slides are just highlighting what was proposed in the general fund budget. Uh, as stated before, the proposed budget is a carryover from fiscal year 1920 with minor adjustments. Included in the budget is funding for the Roseland uh, Library at $150,000, the Veterans Fair Free Transit Program at $30,000, continuing the Tenant Landlord Services Contract at $87,000, and the Secure Family Funds Contract at $50,000. Next slide. Also the ball field and turf mowing contract for an additional 500,000. We also added funding for the November 2020 election funding at uh, half a million dollars as well. As mentioned before, we are continuing to reorganize and we created the communications and intergovernmental relations office. Next slide. We also wanted to highlight the budget for homeless services and affordable housing. We are proposing a budget identical to last fiscal year. According to council policy for fiscal year 2021, the general fund should transfer 35% of the real property transfer tax revenue to homeless services and affordable housing. Unfortunately, the pandemic is also affecting the forecast for real property trans transfer tax revenue. We are assuming a 30% decrease from last fiscal year for a total revenue of 2.7 million. 35% of this anticipated revenue is approximately $950,000, which is broken out between homeless services, fair housing, and affordable housing. In order for the program funding to be equal to last fiscal year, the general fund is contributing 2.7 million, in addition to the 35% designated by policy to bring the total funding to 3.6 million for homeless services and affordable housing. Next slide. In this slide, we just wanted to highlight the details of the homeless services budget of 3.3 million. We are continuing funding Sam Jones Hall at $1 million, Housing First Fund at 634,000, the host contract at 500,000, homeless service center hours expansion at 100,000, domestic violence shelter beds for 50,000, grant writing 50,000, annual homeless count 68,000, and administration 923,000. Next slide. So here's the overall summary of the fiscal year 2021 proposed budget for the general fund. As mentioned earlier, revenue is forecasted to be 164 million with transfers into the fund of 2.7 million for a total of 167 million. The transfers in include gas tax, measure in and various other funds. The expenditures are budgeted at 177 million with a with an additional 2.2 million to capital improvement projects and 5.7 million to other funds for a total of 185 million. <clears throat> Again, the capital improvement projects will be discussed later in the presentation. The 5.7 million transfers out to other funds include the homeless services and affordable housing funding that I just mentioned, um, courthouse square debt service payments and funding for parking enforcement. 
Since the extent expenditure budget is more than the forecasted revenue, the general fund is at a deficit spend of a little over $18 million. This deficit assumes that the council will take will not take any preemptive action to further reduce the expenditures, which will also be discussed later on in this presentation. Next slide. The status of the general fund reserves is pretty bleak without any intervention. The fiscal year end 1920 estimated unassigned reserve balance is $19 million. This balance includes council approved spending of $9 million appropriated during this current fiscal year. Um, just so you recall, these appropriations included funding of a fire truck purchase, police communications upgrade project, additional funding for the fire recovery center, and the general plan update. After using reserves for the fiscal year 2021 $18 million deficit, the estimated reserve balance at 630.21 is forecasted to be $1 million. Obviously, this is less than the policy mandated reserves of 15% of expenditures or $26 million. This slide also assumes that council will not take any preemptive action to replenish the reserve balance, which will be discussed in future slides. Next slide. Next, we will go over the full-time equivalent staffing summary. Next. Uh, the next two slides break out the authorized position by department for last fiscal year, the change and the total requested for fiscal year 2021. I'm not going to read all of these, but I will go into detail of all of the changes shortly. Uh, next slide. As you can see, the citywide position changes from last fiscal year to the proposed budget is a decrease of three positions for a total of 1,255.75 positions. Most of the year over year changes are staff moving from one department to another due to the continued reorganization of the city. Next slide. So this is the detail of the general fund position changes. In the city manager's office, the associate right-of-way agent moved to the water department to better align with the real estate division. The director of communications and intergovernmental relations moved to the newly created department, along with four marketing and outreach coordinators, a rec specialist, and the inter intergovernmental relations and legislative officer. This last position is 50% funded by the water department. Next slide. The code enforcement division moved from the housing and community services department to planning and economic development, transferring 10 FTEs, had also moved a marketing and outreach coordinator to the communications department and eliminated a department technology coordinator with the workload being transferred to the IT department. Police, Recreation, and TPW transferred their marketing and outreach coordinators and a rec specialist to the communications department as well. Next slide. Also, a limited term electrician and public works will expire at year end and will not be extended into next fiscal year. The total general fund decrease from last fiscal year is one and a half positions. Next slide. These next slides are the detail of the non-general fund position changes. The parking division eliminated an operations coordinator and a supervisor. They also added a program coordinator for an overall savings to the fund. The risk management department is extending their limited term risk analyst for another year. Community engagement is also extending the limited term community outreach specialist for another year. This is a grant funded position. And transits marketing and outreach coordinator was transferred to communications. Next slide. Okay. 
Lastly, the water rate department received the associate right of way agent from the city manager's office and also eliminated a senior buyer. For a total of non general fund FDE changes of one and a half positions to go with the general fund changes for the total of three. Next slide. Next slide is position reclassifications. The Human Resources Department has conducted classification studies for several positions on behalf of departments throughout the city and has made recommendations for reclassification requests, new classification studies, and salary studies. These positions include create new classification specification of intergovernmental relations and legislative officer, reclassify one deputy city attorney to assistant city attorney, reclassify one bus service worker to a skilled maintenance worker, update the job classification and salary of transportation planner, create new classification specification of active transportation planner, reclassify emergency preparedness coordinator to a more emergency preparedness manager, create new classification specification of assistant land surveyor and associate land surveyor, reclassify economic development manager to deputy director of economic development, update the job classification and salary of the arts coordinator, create the classification of zero waste coordinator, reclassify principal financial analyst to budget and financial analysis manager, reclassify four meter, meter specialist and one meter specialist to meter technicians and senior meter technician. Next slide. <clears throat> Due to the current economic circumstances, the city has already initiated a hiring freeze on vacant positions. In order to reduce the projected deficit, the general fund is targeting $5 million in salary savings next fiscal year. The city will review and continue to fill positions related to health and safety of the community, economic development and recovery, and regulatory requirements. And that is the end. Any questions? All right, thank you for that, Shelly. Council, I don't see any hands raised. Does anyone have a question? Okay, so we're not going to use the raise hand feature. Please, it, it, it's much easier to coordinate if you could use the participant raise hand feature. Mr. Tibbetts, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it, it took me a minute to find the, the setting for raise hand. Um, yeah, so one question I had was on the, actually, I've got a few, but my first question is on the utilities users tax. Um, and we consistently see a decline in that figure because of people going to mobile phones, correct? Or has, has that been corrected, but we're able to collect UUT for mobile devices? Uh, that hasn't been corrected yet. We are currently not collecting UUT. To correct that, do we have to institute that with a sales tax measure or is that a state legislature action? I believe it would be a ballot measure. measure. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's correct, uh, Council Member Tibbetts. It would require uh, a ballot measure to, to correct. When you brought that up, one thought that I had is I, I don't know what the city is thinking in terms of future uh, tax initiatives, but I think that's something that should probably be looked into in lieu of uh, sales tax. Um, another I can, question I can I bring that back to, if council member wants, I can bring that back to the long-term finance committee as a, a, a review point, if you wish. Another question I had was on the Wayfair decision and how that affects our local coffers. I know that we spoke um, about a couple months ago on this, but I thought that the sales tax only goes to the state of origination or does it get collected by the state and then returned to the cities? The Wayfair will add sales tax. Um, that's why you don't see the exact 15% because it will be collected by the state and then refunded to all the cities based what, on what, our local tax. Is that currently happening or at what point will that happen? It, it is currently happening. Currently happening. Thank you. Um, and then the big question that I had uh, was on the um, turn back, uh, or excuse me, actually I'll start with turn back. I didn't see in the presentation, if I missed it, I'm sorry, but anything on department turn back. 
So, so at this point, the council member, there is no turn back because we haven't completed the fiscal year. Part of what we're gonna be doing is coming back in September and verifying that the revenue forecasts are what they are, uh, mm -hmm. understanding any potential relief and its impact on the budgeted forecasts um, and uh, having a second go at additional work the council would might want us to do. Unfortunately, while I'm phrasing that in optimistic terms, it might actually be the opposite. It might require us to take further actions and further reduction actions at that point. So, the, so but the, there is no turn back because the fiscal year hasn't closed. There's no validity to the, to the revenue streams yet. So that's why on September 15th, we're coming back to have a conversation with council about actuals at that point. Okay, thanks, Sean. And my last question is, is it was pretty unclear uh, when we talked about the unassigned balance, 19.2 million, um, that was a little, I think the, the number for management partners was 22.7. Uh, but I'm, I'm my, I guess my question is, is uh, after the $18.1 million deficit, we have a surplus of $1.1 million. And then in the slide, it, it asked, or it stated rather, that this was 1% of our reserves. Now, is that our emergency reserves? Are we down to $1 million in emergency reserves? Or is that unassigned? So, so you're going to get a chance to look in the further end of the presentation, as Shelley uh, pointed out. There will be some opportunities uh, to to uh, reduce additional costs, uh, specifically in the CIP program. Uh, mm -hmm. We continue to look at some things, and we may be bringing back additional opportunities at the at the actual budget adoption. But the reality is that if we do not take additional action, and that includes the five million dollars in salary freezing right now you will have essentially $1 million left in the bank at the end of the fiscal year. And that doesn't account any emergency expenditures you might encounter during the course of the year. So you're gonna see some opportunities in this, specifically in the CIP program to take some immediate action to reduce some expenditures. Um, but that is, that's the story in a nutshell is that right now uh, we're way below uh, where we need to be, and essentially the city would have about a million dollars left if everything held true. All that being said, we're coming back in September. We'll propose additional actions at that time. There are just so many unknowns uh, right now on the forecast. So that's that's where we sit. So to be clear, we've got, and I think I asked this at every single budget session, and you always answer it, so I apologize for asking it a, a fourth time now, but we have our general fund, our unassigned reserve balance, and then our catastrophic reserve. There, We're talking about. There's not two. They're not two. They're not two funds. There's only one fund. There's an unassigned reserve. We use it in emergency situations. So that's why the number is changing, because we use it to deal with overtime costs that are currently happening. So there's yeah. only one reserve fund. Okay. Thanks, Sean. All right, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, a couple of questions here. Um, and I, Sean, I, I think what I heard you just clarify is the potential $5 million in savings from the hiring freeze, that that is not currently accounted for in this budget. And if we find, if, if we find that the, uh, the hiring freeze brings in or, or doesn't spend $5 million, then, then that's an additional $5 million that would be in the unassigned reserves, correct? At, at this point, yes. I mean, there are operational impacts and you're going to see that later in the presentation is that some real challenges about how we operate. It still gives us time to get through and have a more, a, a better, uh, more, uh, 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 a more thoughtful process on how we address these. What we just wanted to say is that there's a, that there, there are these savings we're still going to do some strategic hiring, but right now we're at a, we're a freeze. So we do have capacity in the budget to deal with unexpected events. Yeah, no, I just, I, I want to be clear because I know that there's a little bit of uncertainty around whether or not that 5 million will materialize uh, because of some of those that you've talked about. And I wanted to make sure that we were clear that uh, that's that's not being baked in uh, as it Correct, is. correct. You, um, in one of the slides, it assumed a 2.6% uh, uh, increase for salaries. That is based on the, the current contracts that we have in place. 
not based on the uh, negotiations that are happening right now with all of our bargaining units. Is that correct? That is based on the long term. It's placeholder. It's based on the long term financial forecast that we we did and that was updated. So it's the same numbers that were based on the long term financial forecast. So in our uh, salary negotiations with our bargaining units, anything over a 2.6 percent increase uh, would uh, exacerbate that number. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Well, again, there's no, there's no, there's no forecasted increase. The increase would have to be dealt with department by department. They would have to essentially absorb the increase. Okay. Um, we, uh, Shelly, if you could just verify what I, what I think I heard, there isn't really a question other than to make sure that I heard this correctly, that the pension payment to CalPERS this year for the city went up 1.5 million and that our annual payment share is 18 million. Is that correct? That is correct for the general fund portion. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Um, you also went over the way that, uh, the measure O calculation is done uh, and that we meet all of the baselines. Uh, if the uh, settlement is signed off on with PG and E and comes in, do we have to take it in as a budget amendment that would also bump up our measure O number in this fiscal year? Or would we have to then in the 21-22 budget account for that added 90 something million dollars uh, in the way that it impacts the measure O budget? So I think we're gonna have to, what I would suggest is we'll take that conversation under consideration and have the city attorney look at it and get you an answer. I don't, okay. I don't know if we have a finalized answer on that. Yeah, I, I guess my specific question then, Sue, is in the way that Measure O is written, once those dollars come in and we have to do uh, a budget adjustment to take in those dollars mid-budget year, does Measure O mean that at that point we have to meet the baseline or is it meeting the baseline in the next fiscal year, I guess is the question. And, the, and, I, and I hear the question. I do not have an answer for you today, but we'll look at it and uh, be able to respond back later. Okay, thanks. So it's a, hopefully a good problem to have. Um, so I, I know services budget, it doesn't include the 150000 that we're spending currently uh, to get Finley up and running and then as a monthly expense. Is that accounted for in the total cost for our COVID recovery? I'm going to defer to, I'm going to ask if, uh, if, if we can get Alan uh, promoted for that. The one thing while we are getting Alan promoted for that, as I will stress is those numbers will change. Um, and part of the reason we don't budget for that is that you will recall council members that if part of the federal regulations are that if you budgeted for something, you're not eligible for reimbursement. So just remember that's part of the, the um, interesting world we live in, that if you choose to budget for certain emergency things, they may not be available for reimbursement. Okay, uh, so go ahead, Alan. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question really quick? Yeah, so we're spending uh, the, the cost for the Finley uh, safe social distancing site is about $150,000 a month. Mm -hmm. Is that accounted for in our total calculation of emergency response due to COVID, or is that accounted for in our homeless services budget? Uh, we are, we're using that as a cost going for the COVID um, a response. Okay. And is that, uh, Sean, to your point, is that so that we can try to get reimbursed by Correct. FEMA? Okay. Correct. Um, and so then I assume that that also means that we will not see in this budget, uh, rather than what we have in our unassigned reserves, a forward looking pot of money for the anticipated cost in the 2020, 2021 budget, uh, due to PSPSs. That is correct. Okay. So we should assume then that the 1.6 million we spent last year on PSPSs, uh, needs to be uh, at a minimum in our reserves untouched uh, if, if we're going to see the same impact. 
I would be recommending that that's you would you would have that access to that funding so that you could address emergencies as they occur. Okay. And it's going to be an interesting conversation with the public about if we know that this is a potential impact, why we don't have it specifically spelled out in the budget. So I wanted to make sure that we had a little bit of that discussion uh, for the public to understand as well. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a dereliction of of budgeting. It's it's a uh, it's, it's a reimbursement issue. Um, do we have a list of uh, what our outstanding asks are to FEMA uh, that we have already fronted the money on for recovery projects? Uh, to you know, if FEMA approves it, what would we potentially be reimbursed for work that it was already done? Are you are you talking about the current emergency, or are you talking about a total total? <laughs> Sorry, from 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 tubs. If there's anything outstanding still, we can. I, I think you're going to see some of that in the in the further in the presentation, but we can give you a specific accounting of where we sit um, as we at, 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 if it's not in there. Yeah, uh, what I was looking for, I didn't see it in there uh, when I was doing my prep. What I'm specifically looking for is um, the dollar amount that we have already spent that could potentially come in as reimbursement. Um, Again, looking at what our unassigned fund balance might look like six months, nine months out, if FEMA were to say yes and reimburse us 75% or 90%, depending on which category it was in, since we've already spent those funds. Does that make sense? Yes, we'll, we'll provide what we, what we, what, what that, um, uh, the number is, um, cannot guarantee a timing on that. Okay. Yeah. And I know we're also a little bit at, at their whims. Uh, last question. Uh, on page 28, it showed that we were shifting a uh, marketing and communications person, I believe, from the Water Enterprise Fund into the newly created department. Will that position still be paid by the Enterprise Fund, or does shifting that staff person from one department to another also shift them into the general fund uh, for allocation? No, 50% remains funded by the Water Department. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mr. Dowd, you had a question? I, I had one, but I, I think uh, Sean already addressed it, and that is that uh, the, and my, my question was, this is such an uncertain time. How do we feel that the budget's going to be? Uh, how accurate is it going to be? And when we reduce the bulk of our reserves, we're walking a pretty thin line. But Sean responded to my question before I even asked it, and that is we're going to take a look at it again, uh, as we, maybe more than once, uh, a couple of times, as we go through the next three to six months, uh, depending upon what we find out is reality. Uh, the other question that I have is, do we have any uh, further feedback than I've seen on the national the league of national national league of cities, and is there any potential care money, so to speak, that might come to counties and cities across the country? So um, there is legislative action being contemplated on both uh, uh, from both congressional uh, uh, houses. Um, the House of Representatives is is. Has already adopted something called the Care, uh, the Heroes Act, and the the Senate is contemplating something called the um, Smart uh, Act. So I believe there is a potential, uh, but the reality is until those things are uh, sorted out, uh, we're left in an uncertain space, and there's no guarantees here. Um, thank you. Okay, any additional questions from council? I only have one um, for Shelley regarding housing and community services. I saw the general fund expenditure is only about 200K, but we have 24 employees in that department. I know 10 code enforcement went to PED. Um, could you talk about with 24 employees, is most of the other funding coming from federal sources or could you add, provide a little insight into that? Yes, most of the funding is from the housing authority. The vast majority is the housing authority and there's a small portion for homeless services as well. 
And is that one plus employees, Paul Parkish? For homeless services? Correct. That's a general yeah. fund expenditure. Yes. Yes. It's a one and a half or so. Okay. Great. That makes sense. All right. Let's go back to the slide presentation now. We'll be moving on to the enterprise funds. And there's seven different enterprise funds that we'll be presenting on. And uh, Kim Nadeau from Parking is going to start us off. Hey, Kim, I've enabled your speaking permissions. You should be able to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Uh, we uh, Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. This slide provides a summary of the proposed fiscal year 2021 parking fund budget. Revenue has been revised in light of COVID-19 expected impacts and has been reduced by about $1 million to $3.1 million. The transfers in of $1.2 million from the general fund are for parking enforcement services that reimburses the parking fund for delivery of the parking enforcement services. Enforcement revenue is recorded in the general fund. The operation and maintenance expenditures of 5.6 million are flat from last year. We have a small CIP budget of 120,000 to provide for a retrofit of lighting in the D Street garage to energy efficient lighting. And then there's a transfer out of 115,000, which is the parking fund contribution to the downtown community benefit district, which is resulting in an estimated drawdown of available reserves of 1.5 million. Next slide, please. In looking at the current fiscal year, we estimate a revenue decrease of about 1.2 million due to the temporary waiver of parking fees approved by council on April 15th related to the COVID uh, virus, reduced demand uh, per parking due to the shelter in place and shortened parking meter hours that went into effect in December of 2019. It's estimated that expenditures will exceed revenues by 825,000 Dollars. The estimated unassigned fund reserve balance on June 30th, 2020 is approximately $8 million. In addition, funding has already been, excuse me, has been allocated in the assigned fund balance for capital projects such as garage repairs and equipment replacement. Next slide, please. For next fiscal year, we estimate a revenue reduction of about $1 million or 25% due to uh, COVID impacts and reduced paid parking hours. The revenue estimate assumes paid parking will resume by July 1st with expanded free parking options in the garages. It's estimated that the fiscal year will end with expenditures exceeding revenues by $1.5 million with an estimated available unassigned fund reserve balance of 6.5 million on June 30th, 2021. And the next slide, please. This slide shows revenue expenditures and reserve balances from January, 2020 through January 30th, 2021. The green line shows the parking revenue, which uh, exceeded $400,000 a month in January and then dropped steeply in March down to zero in April and May. The projected revenue recovery is based on data that we've um, received from our parking data consultant who works with clients around the world. They have been analyzing recovery data from other countries and other cities in the United States who are ahead of California in um, returning to more normal operations to estimate what parking revenue recovery would look like. And they've applied those, uh, that, those projections to our prior year revenues in Santa Rosa. The red line uh, shows our O&M costs, which dropped in March due to reduced costs for credit card transactions, processing of coin and cash, and vendors that were under a shelter in place order and therefore didn't provide services. You can see once the new fiscal year starts, we're assuming we'd have more normal operations with our, um, our normal O&M costs. 
the CIP is shown at the bottom, that orange line, which is the, the lighting retrofit project for the garage. And then the reserves are graphed in the blue bars. So the, the left-hand column of, of dollar amounts is correlated to the uh, revenue and expenditures. The right-hand column of dollar amounts is correlated to the reserves. So you can see the available reserve balance dropping through the course of the next fiscal year as expenditures exceed uh, what our projected revenues are. And the next slide, please. This slide provides a summary of the parking fund capital improvement program. The budgeted projects shown on the left-hand side have been approved and appropriated in prior fiscal years and are in various stages of completion. With the exception of the lot repair project of 1.3 million, the lot repairs have been on hold pending further evaluation of the lots as potential opportunity sites for development. The future projects on the uh, right-hand side of about $20 million have been identified in the 10-year uh, asset management plan for parking. The city works with a structural engineering firm that provides condition assessments of the garages and gives us a 10-year projection of costs for the needed repairs. So you can see that's about 10 million over the next 10 years. We coordinate with public works in the assessment of the parking lots asphalt condition and costs to maintain them. So that's where that 7.8 million comes from. And then we have 1.5 million in ADA upgrades uh, that are correlated to the, AD, the city's ADA transition plan. So we've got a total of, of 20.7 million, 20 million in projects that have been identified to be completed in the next 10 years to maintain and extend the life of the parking assets. And we've got uh, a projected 8 million in available reserves as of June 30th, 2020. And we expect that will be um, drawn down by another 1.5 million this year, which would leave us with six and a half million on June 30th of 2021. Um, the parking fund reserve balance will need to be replenished in order to provide the necessary funds to complete these critical capital projects uh, to extend the, the life of the parking assets. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kim. Council, any questions? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, let's use our technology, folks. Go to your participants, <laughs> push the button. There you go. Energies. There, thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Kim, can you let me know um, what the, this has to do with the transfers in of, to, to pay for the costs of parking enforcement um in it in, in looking this looking at this in terms of a of a business if you will or a, a, a profit margin um on our on our enforcement and it, you can get back to me if you don't have if you don't have this number it, is there a percentage of a profit if you will um that you have at your disposal letting us know how much is uh, going into because the because the the parking enforcement um, monies go into the general fund. What are, and there's a $1.2 million cost for that enforcement. Kind of what our profit margin is with, with that program, or is that something you'd have to get back to me about? No, I have that. Historically, the, the program has um, brought in more money in fine revenue than it costs to deliver the program. Um, things are a little bit different right now since the parking enforcement staff have been in shelter in place and they aren't out um, patrolling. But in a normal year, um, like last year, I believe it was about a $350,000 net gain to the general fund. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dad, did you have a question also? My, my question has to do with that project. I think the address of it is one Rose Avenue. And there's some arrangement, but I don't. I'm not clear on it 
between the developer of the project and the city of Santa Rosa, uh, could could one of you, Sean, or somebody else, explain? Is that are those fees? So, so I'm having a difficulty. I'm having difficulty. Uh, coming into the city and is, is that a... but I'm having difficulty hearing the the question uh, council member doubt but but if, it, if it's if, if it's pertaining to one Santa Rosa Avenue I think that's beyond the scope If it's pertaining to one Santa Rosa Avenue, I think there will be a different forum to have that conversation. Uh, I will have to check, but this this is. Uh, uh, Did anybody uh, hear my question? No, barely, barely. I, I Did will. Did anybody I, hear my question? Uh, barely. Could, could you, if it's if it's a question about run one Santa Rosa Avenue and a relationship, I think we're going to have to table that for a future meeting because this is a unless it's a direct parallel to the budget allocations, uh, council member Dowd, I'm not, I'm not seeing the, the correlation to, to the budget and the one Santa Rosa project, but I could follow up with you in our one-on-one -on -one conversation later this week to get more clarity. And then I can provide that to council. If I might just interrupt just briefly, um, Council Member Dowd, uh, are you using your microphone? Because if you just remove the, if you Thank stop you. using your mic and just use the use the mic on your iPad, and that may uh, alleviate your your issue, because it was it was hard to hear you. Right. Okay. Let's go on to Mr. Rogers. You had your hand up. Yeah, just a quick question, uh, Kim. Uh, it specifically calls out in your presentation the First Street Garage uh, elevator project. That's an ADA required project? No, that is not an ADA required project. That is a um, uh, mechanical, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an older garage and the elevator is in need of upgrades. There are some associated ADA improvements that will be associated with the elevator being upgraded, but it that wasn't the initiation of the project. Okay, and is, it, is the uh, elevator currently operating or is it down? Well, the garages are closed, so... Well, the... <laughs> you, you know what I mean, Kim. <laughs> yes, the elevator is operational when the garages are open, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, Council, any additional questions for Kim? Seeing none, thank you, Kim. Next uh, up is for transit, Rachel Eady. Okay, thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm. Uh, I'll wait for the slides to catch up. So next slide, please. So I'd like to begin with an overview of the current operational status of the transit system. Um, as the city council is aware, the transit system has been significantly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, due to the shelter in place order, the essential travel restrictions, and then various safety related operational changes we've made, such as instituting rear door boarding and fare suspension. Um, we've been operating on a Sunday service level uh, for about the last month. Uh, that represents about one quarter of our typical weekday service level. It has a short span from about 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. We are um, supplementing that limited fixed route service with. Um, utilizing the excess capacity on our paratransit system to provide a on-demand uh, dial-a-ride type service uh, in the mornings before 10 a.m. and in the evenings after 5 p.m. so that anyone needing to make essential trips when the fixed route service isn't running are able to do that. Paratransit ridership demand has increased a bit. We're still down about 70 percent. Um, we're able to serve all the trip requests we have and additionally provide that call ahead service through our paratransit contractor. All these services are operating fare free to maintain social distancing and, and we've had that in place since mid-March. Uh, just a quick note that looking forward to um, June, we're anticipating stepping our, our transit service back up to uh, perhaps a Saturday service level in early June, just recognizing that parts of the economy are starting to open up and the limited span of service 
for our current Sunday service is probably not enough to meet the needs in the community going forward. So that's something we'll be updating you on shortly. Next slide, please. This slide, slide 42, provides just a quick snapshot of the three-year ridership trend for city bus uh, with year-over-year -year ridership changes. As you can see in fiscal 1920, the current year as the orange line, we actually started out this year very strong and have sustained year-over-year -year ridership increases in every month except for the months impacted by the Kincaid fire until we get to March. So the purpose of this illustration is just to demonstrate, you know, we, we felt that we had pretty significant ridership impacts from the Tubbs fire and Kincaid fire, but uh, COVID-19 has completely broken the mold for impacts to transit system ridership. So we're at a point of needing to build the system back up. Before I discuss the outlook for fiscal 2021, I just wanted to review uh, the outlook for the current fiscal year. There's actually some good news here. Um, we estimate losing uh, about $2.7 million in grant revenue uh, from the impacts to sales and gas taxes from COVID-19, in addition to the lost fare revenue from uh, our fare suspension beginning in March. We were fortunate to receive $2.5 million in uh, transit emergency relief from the CARES Act through a distribution formula developed by MTC. That's going to be incredibly helpful to fill that gap. And uh, with that assistance from the CARES Act, we anticipate finishing 1920 with expenditures um, uh, within our revenues, maintaining our operating reserve of $2 million, and also uh, it retaining funding that we've set aside for uh, bus replacement and other essential capital activities. Next slide, please. So going forward to fiscal 2021, the outlook is decidedly less rosy, not surprisingly. Um, when we first put these slides together, we uh, estimated a $3.4 million reduction in projected revenues for our operations in, in fiscal 2021. Um, with the governor's budget uh, or may revise, um, that's increased to a $3.7 million gap or reduction in, in anticipated revenues. Um, these are mostly being driven by decreases in sales tax receipts as well as fuel tax receipts that uh, flow through to um, the state transit funding programs. So overall, with these updated numbers, that, that equals about a 25% decrease in our total operating revenues for fiscal 2021. Next slide, please. This chart on slide 45 just shows where we're seeing the COVID-19 uh, revenue impacts. Uh, to the far left of the chart is TDA, Transportation Development Act. Those are state funds that are really the workhorse of our operating budget. Um, we anticipate a decrease of a 27% in those revenues from what we originally budgeted uh, back in January. Um, moving over to the third bar from the left, STA is state transit assistance. We initially estimated uh, those funds being reduced by about 25%. We now anticipate that to be closer to 40% or a decrease of 880,000. Uh, for fair revenue, we've anticipated uh, that we'll receive about 50% of the typical fare revenue um, based both on uh, potential for ongoing suspension of fares combined with a, a recognition that ridership is likely to return rather slowly depending on the economy, depending on schools, and depending on um, public health orders and how they're released over time. And then we're also anticipating a reduction in Measure M sales tax re revenues as well as some smaller impacts to other revenue sources. So all told, these um, together uh, total to the 3.4, now $3.7 million decrease in revenues. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes these impacts. We additionally going into our budget in January had about a half a million dollar gap in um, between our revenues and expenditures that we had anticipated addressing through the fiscal year. So all told, when we initially put these slides together, our, our uh, gap was about 3.8 million um, with the May revise, it's looking closer to 4.2 million or about 28% 20 of our total operating budget. Um, I will indicate we don't have 3.9 or $4.2 million in our reserves. So this um, use of reserves actually overstates our ability to access reserve funds to fill this gap. Next slide, please. So how are we moving forward to close this gap in fiscal 2021? Um, it's going to be a significant challenge. Some of the immediate actions we've taken are, as with the rest of the city, to freeze current vacant positions. We do have five vacant positions currently that uh, will bring us about $500,000 in savings moving into fiscal 2021. We're also realizing some significant savings from the reduced service levels uh, after uh, salary and benefits. Some of our major costs are fuel, 
maintenance of the buses, uh, things like overtime. And then there's a number of, of other smaller costs but uh, we're, we're, that we uh, realize each year that where we're seeing um, savings, including in fare collection and processing costs and um, in our paratransit system with the reduced service level, there are some savings uh, in that program as well. Moving into the next six to 12 months, we need to take um, some bolder action. Uh, the first step is that we've taken is to identify what we think based on what we know today is a sustainable level of revenue hours that we can build back up to in the transit system. Based on what we know today, we think that's about 55,000 revenue hours, which is about 65% of our pre-pandemic annual service hours. Um, we've adopted a set of service restoration principles to guide how we, we will phase in that increased service with an eye towards being strategic and smart and really trying to build a good foundation for a, a strong recovery of the transit system. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about those principles on the next slide. Uh, we've been supporting the increased transit allocation proposed for the uh, proposed Measure M reauthorization. One important note on this is that given the current proposal, those additional revenues would not flow until 2025, so uh, would not necessarily be part of our recovery from COVID-19, but could potentially be there to further improve the transit system um, followed, following the period of recovery. In addition, we're following up on some of the recommendations of the Sonoma County Transit Integration and Efficiency Study that we discussed with Council back in October. This study looked at opportunities to integrate the operations and planning and service delivery of Sonoma County Transit, City Bus, and Petaluma Transit um, with an eye towards one, finding efficiencies, reducing expenditures, and enabling limited resources to go farther and providing mobility in our community and, and also to provide that mobility in a more seamless manner. So this, this crisis the transit, transit industry is in, which is a, a regional as well as a national crisis, I think is really shining a brighter light on opportunities for integration and coordination among transit operators to meet our collective goals of providing the most mobility we possibly can um, within our limited resources. So we'll continue to work, work forward on, on those measures. Um, we will be advocating for additional CARES Act allocation in fiscal 2021. MTC's initial distribu distribution of CARES Act funds for the current fiscal year um, uh, used 60% of the CARES Act transit emergency relief that was awarded to the Bay Area. So there's an additional 40% of those funds left to be distributed. MTC has uh, established a Blue Ribbon Task Force to make a recommendation to the Commission about the distribution formula for those funds. So we will be following those efforts very closely. And this last item is sort of unique. Um, I think one thing we want to discuss further with the Council and we hope to come back for a study session in the next couple of months is uh, how we deal with fair policy going forward. At some point, it will be safe to go back to charging fares or we'll be able to find um, methods to do that with a social distanced approach. Um, but given, given the situation we find ourselves as a transit agency and the community finds itself in, the question is whether there's a benefit, uh, especially given projected lower ridership, to continue fare-free service in some form beyond the time when it's strictly necessitated by social distancing protocols. So as we encourage people to return to transit as it's when it's appropriate, as we um, support the community's economic recovery and especially for the vulnerable members of our community, are there fair policy changes we should be making to potentially extend free or reduced uh, fair services uh, in some way? And we're looking at options that we have to um, potentially restructure some of our grant funds to support that uh, if we can. Next slide, please. So I just want to briefly go through our proposed service restoration principles. And again, we anticipate coming back to the council for a study, study session specifically on transit service restoration and fair policy within the next couple of months for some more detailed discussion. But just to give you an idea of where we're headed, as I discussed, we've identified an initial sustainable ceiling of revenue hours we can begin to build towards to restore transit service. Though that restoration will be tied to key milestones for service restoration, including what happens in the fall with schools, whether the SRJC returns to on-campus learning in the spring of 2021, um, any changes that are made to the shelter in place orders that enable more people to get out and about for more activities. Uh, certainly we have to ensure that any changes we make um, enable us to continue to operate within CDC and public health officer guidelines for the safety of our employees and our riders. And so one protocol we assume will continue in some fashion is uh, social distancing within buses which has a service planning impact because we need to be able to hold vehicles, revenue, 
um, it, it, that, to be able to be distributed um, to routes or trips where we're having overcrowding as people return to transit over time. In terms of how we'll prioritize service restoration, again, we'll look forward to a deeper conversation with council about that, but certainly we wanna make sure that we are uh, reflecting council goals or restoring frequency uh, in places that supports the downtown development vision. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're restoring service with an eye towards any changes to travel patterns as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we will certainly um, do a public outreach process. It's gonna look very different than public outreach processes in the past due to our limitations on interacting with folks, but we're um, making plans for that currently. And then obviously an equity lens is built into everything we do, but I think especially in light of the current situation and impacts to vulnerable people in our community, we need to make sure that as we restore transit service, we're doing it in an equitable way that really meets the needs of, of um, folks that, that, that really may need the services the most going forward. Uh, and then a, a couple other um, key items within this process are to really look at how new service models can be brought into our transit system to meet needs. Um, going back to the new transit system that we put in place in 2017, we've been discussing on-demand or demand responsive services and what role they may have in lower density areas in Santa Rosa. Um, we were planning on engaging with the public and the council on that topic through our short range transit plan process this spring. Um, we're gonna be continuing that process, but if anything, this crisis is accelerating that discussion um, to think about how we can provide mobility in different ways um, given our limited resources. And finally, as I already discussed, we'll be continue to coordinate closely with our partner transit operators, recognizing this is not a go it alone type of situation and we really need to be um, walking forward in an integrated way through this pandemic. Um, I obviously open to council feedback on these principles today uh, and look forward to more discussion in a future study session as well. Next slide, please. I'll just conclude with a quick mention of our capital program approach. We believe it's critical to continue to fund the capital projects that are necessary for the sustainable long-term operation of the transit system, including bus replacement and capital repairs to vehicles and facilities. These are state of good repair items that ultimately do have an impact on our, on our operating budget if we let things fall into disrepair or if we get behind in bus replacement. So our goal as we, we plan our way through this crisis is to continue to try to fund those key capital activities. We also propose to continue with um, grant funded projects that meet city goals, including the purchase of electric buses and the build out of the charging infrastructure to support those buses. Um, you know, those are, those are funds we've received or we're having partnerships with outside entities. And so we feel we can go ahead and continue to move those projects forward. That said, any discretionary capital projects will be placed on hold and likely will be um, deferred for the next several years um, as we recover uh, from this event. Um, so with that, I'll conclude, and I'm happy to take any questions the council may have. Thank you for that presentation, Rachel. Uh, council, any questions? Seeing no hands raised. Rachel, I have one question for you. On uh, slide 45, you talked about the TDA reduction. Can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that source of funding, and is that based on a formula that provides us with that revenue? Yeah, so it's it's all based on sales tax receipts. Um, it's returned to the counties and then we distribute it within Sonoma County based on population uh, with one exception. Uh, there's a longstanding agreement uh, that's several decades old where Golden Gate Transit receives a 25% off the top allocation of the Sonoma County TDA revenue. So that goes off the top to Golden Gate Transit and the remaining revenues are distributed among the three transit operators, uh, Sonoma County, City Bus, and Petaluma Transit based on population. Gotcha. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Rachel, uh, what a great presentation and some can tell that not only a lot of creative but also collaborative approaches that are going on from your department. I was uh, excited to hear about the potential of having no fare ridership and how that could potentially help us meet our bike and pedestrian master plan goals and also reduce costs around, costs around infrastructure long term. I'm curious to know um, if you have anything off the top of your head and it's okay if you don't and want to circle back later around ways that uh, the, the city and the council can support us getting there. and financially and as well as programmatically? Sure, um, you know, there's two different ways to look at um, 
free fair ridership, you know, if, if we were to say we just want to go fare free entirely within the transit system, um, pre-pandemic, we collected about $1.5 million in fares annually. Um, certainly, we expect fare revenue to be much less than that going forward because we think transit ridership will take a while to recover. Um, the, the one thing that is an added piece to that, however, is that um, any if free fares on transit also mean free fares on paratransit. And many communities that have gone completely fare free on their transit systems have seen um, a significant increase in demand in their paratransit systems. So that's an additional cost that could be significant um, that we would need to really understand before moving forward. It, it's not necessarily prohibitive, but it is an additional cost um, beyond just foregoing um, the transit fare revenue. Um, I do think that there are some, some easier opportunities to accomplish fare free uh, transit for some groups. You know, one, one group that, that we've discussed with the council in the past is K through 12 youth. Um, we think there's an opportunity even within this crisis to find a way in partnership to potentially as a COVID-19 recovery strategy, uh, continue fare free operations for certain groups. And certainly this is something we would want council feedback on, we'd want a bigger conversation about. So that's why we plan to come back with a study session. Um, that in the current climate, those types of programs are not going to be very expensive because ultimately we won't be foregoing a lot of revenue, but the opportunity to support the community and to support recovery of the transit system as, as, a, as a choice for people um, could be significant. And it, it could be a time to be a little bold and it seems counterintuitive uh, to sort of think about foregoing some of that revenue, but it also could be an investment in the long-term growth of the transit system. So um, those are those are some initial thoughts. I'm not even sure if I answered your question, but I, I think it's a much bigger no, conversation. It's helpful have. to hear, and I, and I get that this is a longer conversation and I look forward to the study session. I do have um, one more question and then I'll, I'll drop it at that so as to not bog us down. But is it similar to libraries collecting late fees? Because when you say $1.5 million, um, you know, that's a lot for one person, but it doesn't sound like a lot for a whole transit system. Are there costs associated with the collection of that that could be offset in other ways? And we can come back to it in the study session, but that's what I start to wonder when we look at expanding the public commons. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there is a cost of fare collection from printing the fare media to maintaining the fare boxes to uh, replacing clipper and fare box equipment um, to armored car services. I mean, it really does add up into it's probably, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or more that we're investing in fare collection. So there, there is an opportunity to reduce costs within that conversation by um, continuing to suspend fare collection. Thank you very much. And I look forward to having that conversation in more detail in the future. Thanks. All right, council, any other questions for Rachel? Seeing none, thank you so much, Rachel, for that presentation. Um, next on our enterprise fund is golf course and Jason Nutt, our assistant city manager, will be making that presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and council members. Uh, I'm going to walk you through very briefly the uh, golf course enterprise fund. Um, if we could go to slide 51, thank you. Uh, we currently have a revenue of $373,672. Uh, that's broken up into two primary components. Uh, one are fees for renting uh, and golf uh, related to both Legends and the course itself. Um, that's about 320, just under $323,000. Uh, and then on the property, we have a cell tower. Uh, we do collect uh, about $51,000 in annual lease payments uh, relating to the cell tower, and that's what makes up our current revenue. Uh, on the expenditure side, we look at about $814,000 of expenditures with just under $400,000 of annual bond debt for the, um, for the golf course itself. And it used to show up as a transfer in and transfer out. Um, we do use Finley Center as collateral for that bond. Um, in addition, we have about $132,000 of costs relating to insurance, telephone, maintenance, uh, HVAC contracts um, and other components specifically related to providing services at both of those facilities. And then about $288,000 um, of, of general maintenance and repairs on the, on, on the, the site, such as irrigation system repairs, um, improving and managing the water uh, collection system, 
um, re taking down and addressing some of the tree issues in and around the course, as well as the buildings itself. Uh, and so those are the primary uh, components of our expenditure plan. Um, COVID has had a fairly significant impact. Uh, the golf course was closed for uh, about six weeks, uh, as well as Legends and the restaurant continue to stay closed at this point in time. Um, we have been working with both operators in an effort to try to understand their long-term impacts uh, for each of their operations. Um, and we have uh, had communication with them that um, uh, both are very concerned about the long-term outlook of their operations as it currently stands and will be coming to the city looking for relief uh, moving forward. It does appear that the golf course is finding a way to uh, continue to push forward by uh, having a number of uh, folks play golf these days as, a, as an activity to get out of the house. Uh, unfortunately, Legends has come to the point where they've actually asked us to consider the opportunity to get out of their current lease um, early uh, because they're just not finding that they're uh, going to be able to recover from that specific location. Um, that's the discussion relating to the golf course enterprise, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Jen Santos is the project manager or the, the enterprise fund manager for this specific enterprise fund and uh, would have a majority of the detailed uh, answers. Um, she's unfortunately not available at the moment due to a prior commitment, and uh, I'll do my best to answer questions. Um, but I may have to get back to you after having consulted with Jen. All right, thank you, Jason. I, I have a quick question. Uh, what is the reserve balance of this fund? That's a fantastic question that um, we have a, I'm looking at the notes she provided me, so hold, please give me just a moment. So it, it appears we have uh, just about a half a million dollar reserve uh, on this specific fund balance. Um, and uh, I can provide more details and information uh, after having consulted with Jen uh, later on this afternoon. And Jason, is there a specific reserve policy for this fund, certain percentage or what's the status? Uh, I'm not aware of a specific percentage, um, but again, I'll, I'll consult with, with Jen and get back to you. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Sawyer, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, is there a, um, and you may not know this, you may have to check with Jen on this as well, as far as the reserves, are, do you know of any restriction as to how those reserves can be used? Must they be capital or could they be used for other uh, needs? Yeah, based, on the, based on the notes that Jennifer provide, uh, that Jen provided, it does appear that uh, the reserves can go, can extend beyond capital. Okay, thank you. Um, and also the, the, the conversations around the, the, the contract and the, um, the relief that, that, that individuals may be looking for, how soon do you, do you have any guess as to how soon we might be having that conversation? So I know Legends has already submitted a letter and requested that we begin that discussion now. Um, we have had conversations also with the, per, the contract operator for the golf course. Um, they have indicated that that may be a direction that they're going to go. Um, they are asking for rent relief between now and the beginning of the calendar year. Uh, and uh, we have yet to finalize any of those discussions with him. Um, but he has indicated that he's not sure if even with that rent relief, if he'd be able to, to continue through the remaining two years of his contract. Um, but with that said, we are we are actively working with both of those proprietors to try to come up with a resolution that allows us to keep them solvent. Um, we just uh, we're just not at an end product at that point. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Council, any other questions on this item? Jason, one one other question that I would have for maybe the June presentation. I know we added fees to um, different golfing, whether it's nine holes or 18 holes for that maintenance fee. I, I would like to see a breakdown of how that had worked prior to obviously COVID-19, because uh, I know that was a new strategy that uh, we, I think, implemented last year. Yeah, we'll be happy to provide you with the details about uh, the capital fee that we incorporated. Um, there, there has been uh, a lot of conversation between both the city and the golf course operator as to how to utilize those fees. Um, 
and there's there's been uh, a lot of back and forth as to the best approach. Uh, the city feels that it's specifically intended for capital expenditure, um, and the golf course operator, knowing some of his challenges for operations, is looking for us to help utilize that in some of his um, capital operating side of things, such as buying new equipment. Uh, and uh, it's unclear from the capital fee program that was implemented if there's a restriction on which direction that it can be used. So we're happy to come and provide uh, in June more detail about that specific program, what the balance sits at, uh, what we've used it for over the course of the last year, and what we anticipate for the next year. And Jason, and that's another account outside of the reserve fund? Uh, that is uh, incorporated into the revenue and expenditures component of this. We'll just break it out so that it's more clear. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, we'll go on to our next and last enterprise fund. That'd be the water department and Jennifer Burke will be making that presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. I'm here today to give you an overview of the water enterprise budgets. Uh, before I get into the individual uh, funds, I did wanna let the council know that the Board of Public Utilities did consider the water, wastewater and regional uh, budget and did unanimously recommend uh, those three budgets to the council. Also wanted to let the council know that the water and wastewater fund budgets are both based on implementation of the fifth year of our currently approved rate increase. That current rate increase would go into effect July 1st. On the water side, it's a 2.9% increase, which includes the wholesale rate pass-through from the Sonoma County Water Agency. And on the wastewater side, it's a 2.5% rate increase. The impact to customers, the total bill would be a for the typical single family with four residents, a $3.86 rate uh, increase per month. There are a number of reasons why staff continues to recommend that we implement the fifth year of the rate increase as adopted. Uh, the water department has numerous regulatory requirements that we must continue to make sure we are meeting to protect not only the environment, but public health. Our costs are mainly driven by those regulatory requirements and operational needs. One regulatory requirement in particular that's going to affect the wastewater side, the water department needs to implement a, or needs to construct a new UV disinfection system out at the treatment plant. This project is a roughly $70 million project that we have to start at the end of this calendar year per our regulatory requirements. We have been uh, checking in with financial experts and our bond rating agencies to get a sense of what the impacts are to the bond market. And while they are telling us that they don't anticipate any utilities will see an increase in their ratings due to the uncertainty from COVID, they are stating that there is possibility that ratings could drop if utilities are not able to consider planning for stability as well as continuing to implement rate increases as planned. So for example, for this particular potential bond sale, if we were to have a drop in our rating increase, that could be a cost to our rate payers of approximately $2 million of additional debt service. So we think it's important to continue to have our rate increase to ensure our bond rating. We need to continue to provide a reliable and resilient water supply that is prepared not only for issues such as uh, the current pandemic, but for other natural disasters such as fires and earthquakes. So it's really important that we're investing and continuing to maintain our 24 seven operation. And then last, uh, rate stability. Uh, it's not only important for our customers to understand what uh, plan increases are, but we have gone back and, and looked at historically when there have been years when there have been no increases, no rate increases, it has led to significantly larger increases in later years. Uh, for example, in 2002 and 2003, 
uh, we were did not implement a rate increase and that led to six years of 9% rank increases year over year uh, afterwards. So we think it's incredibly important uh, for not only the department, but for our customers to have that rate stability and understand and plan for smaller uh, rate increases that are easier, easier for them to plan for. So with that, I'd like to go over each of the funds if we go to next slide, slide 53, this is the Water Enterprise Fund. The revenue has taken into account the impacts of COVID, and I will talk about that in a future slide, but we have reduced the revenue based on potential impacts. On the O&M expenditures, our water fund is down by 0.5% compared to last fiscal year. Our CIP expenditures are similar to last year, uh, roughly $13 million. Transfers out include uh, costs related to city internal services. Uh, our total expenditures are roughly uh, just under $48 million and our use of reserves is about $2.8 million on the water fund. Next slide, slide 54 on the wastewater fund. Uh, again, the revenues have taken into account impacts from COVID. Um, our O&M expenditures are up 0.1%. Our CIP expenditures are uh, held uh, flat from last year, at roughly $12 million. The transfers out include uh, city internal services as well as the costs for the regional system. The total expenditures are uh, just about $73.5 million, and the use of reserves is looking at a little uh, over $3.6 million. There is fund balance available in both the water and wastewater funds to uh, address the use of these reserves. Next slide, slide 55. On the regional wastewater system, this is uh, the same budget that the council saw uh, at the end of April. Um, revenues have taken into account any potential impacts there might be. Um, our transfers in include money from the sewer, the wastewater fund uh, to pay for the regional system. The O&M expenditures are um, developed such so that it's split among all the five partners in the sub-regional system. They all pay a portion of those expenditures based on the agreement. The CIP expenditures have increased by a million dollars as per agreement with the sub-regional partners to a $7 million CIP for this proposed fiscal year. And um, the regional budget does not have a revenue impact uh, because the Santa Rosa's portion of the budget is paid by the wastewater revenue. So therefore the, uh, the adjustment of the revenue, um, the decreases is, is, is not in the regional budget. And the next slide, slide 56. On the Stormwater Enterprise Fund, the Stormwater Enterprise Fund is funded by assessments that are collected on the, uh, collected through the uh, parcel tax. This assessment was put into place in 1996 and that assessment has not increased uh, since that time even though O&M and regulations have continued to increase. Their revenue is anticipated to be $2.7 million. And we are, not, we are not anticipating any impact to that revenue because uh, the parcel tax has already been collected uh, for this fiscal year. So we are gonna be following that closely for future fiscal years and how that might impact the stormwater fund. The O&M expenditures are roughly $2.6 million, $475 million for CIP for a total of $3.1 million and a use of reserves of approximately $350,000. The next slide, slide 57. As I mentioned, we have taken into account the possible impacts from the COVID pandemic on the water department budget. We did take a look at the Great Recession 
and looked at the single greatest impact uh, during that time frame and determined what the impact to our usage both on the water and wastewater side would be. So we're anticipating a $5.5 million reduction in revenues to the water fund, a $4.1 million reduction to the wastewater fund. The usage is just one portion of our revenues. So that is really what we're anticipating from revenues from usage. Again, we don't anticipate that stormwater will have any impacts this uh, coming fiscal year, but we are looking at potential um, uh, losses later as we see the impacts from COVID. We are continuing to look at our expenditures. Uh, we do have fund balance that's available to address our current expected impacts to our funds. We are looking as the rest of the city at certain positions and seeing uh, about keeping those vacant. We are also considering the possibility of a delay of implementation of the ev switch to evergreen rate. As the council may be aware, the evergreen rate does have the biggest impact on the water department, in particular on the wastewater fund uh, of about a 1% rate impact. So there's possibility that we could consider delay of implementation. And we're also continuing to look at all of our projects, um, in particular our plan projects, uh, and if need be, prioritizing what projects may need to be delayed to address the revenue impacts. Next slide, slide 58. We did want to mention that there are a number of things that we are putting into place for of our customers to assist them during this time. These are a number of things and tools that we have available that we didn't have uh, during the Great Recession. So we do believe that this is providing our customers with some assistance at this time. We continue to analyze the data uh, for any customers that are calling and asking for assistance. Of our roughly 54,000 customers, we've received 150 calls for financial assistance and 130 calls asking for payment arrangements. We are not seeing a very big shift in water use at this time. Uh, it's staying relatively flat. We are doing, we are waiving all delinquent fees for our customers based on the shelter in place order. We have suspended disconnection of uh, accounts due to non-payment and we also re-established connection for all of our customers that had been previously disconnected prior to the shelter in place order due to non-payment. We're continuing to offer uh, payment plans with even more flexibility that we have provided in the past to allow for longer timeframes for our customers to pay. We are continuing to look at the data in response to COVID and seeing if we can offer some type of assistance through our Help to Others or H2O program. We currently have 350 customers that are permanently enrolled in the program and we wanna ensure that any changes we make will not affect them. And we'll continue to have funding available for those 350 customers, uh, but also seeing if there's other opportunities that we might be able to provide some type of one-time help for customers most in need during this time. Um, we will also be uh, taking an item to our board to consider keeping our sewer caps um, the same as they were last year. Uh, which will also provide some relief to our customers with their sewer bill. And we're continuing to monitor federal and state legislation um, for any potential financial assistance to our customers at this time. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Jennifer, for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Rogers, you have a question. Yeah, just more of a clarification for the public, Mr. Mayor that uh, any decision such as the implementation of the evergreen uh, switch uh, is a policy decision that'll come before the council and the public will have a chance to weigh in on. Uh, and we'll... Yes, Council Manager Rogers, thank you for that clarification. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that the council would have to give direction on if they would like us to consider that delay. Correct, because Jennifer, just correct me if I'm wrong, but 
the direction was to implement Evergreen. And so a change in that would have to come before the entire body, correct? That is correct. So we have incorporated the cost for Evergreen in the budget that is before you. Um, and if we are looking for any potential reductions, that could be one consideration that the council may want to give us direction on. But right now we are moving forward with it as directed by the council. Great, thank you. Vice Mayor Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. I, uh, you and Mr. Rogers both said what I was going to say, and I just wanted to echo that sentiment that if, that if uh, we're going to reconsider Evergreen, that it comes before the council. So thank you. Okay, council, any additional questions? All right, Jennifer, thank you for that presentation. So council, we're now at another potential break opportunity. So we are going to take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at 210, feel free to turn off your microphones and your cameras, but reconvening at 210, thank you.
Madam City Clerk, I've got it at 210. Could we do a brief roll call before continuing, please? Yes. Hmm. Councilmember Dowd? Here. Councilmember Olivares? Here. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Councilmember Sawyer? Here. Councilmember Tibbetts? Here. Vice Mayor Fleming? Here. Mayor Schwedhelm? Here. Everyone is present. All right, thank you. For the next portion of the presentation, Mr. City Manager, I believe you've got operational outlook goals and priorities. So um, just uh, for uh, councils uh, and the community's understanding, uh, the next couple of slides are the current council goals and the current council priorities. Unfortunately, this year, uh, due to the COVID a pandemic, uh, we were unable to hold goal setting. So staff has taken a twofold approach uh, based on portfolio or department of responsibility to list what we're foreseeing as operational challenges uh, that will uh, we will be wrestling with as an organization over the next year, or if not longer due to the current uh, uh, situation. And then in addition, um, to give council an update on when we anticipate being able to address uh, some high priority items uh, that were assignments that council has um, uh, directed staff to take on. So we wanted to make sure that we touched upon those two things. Those will be uh, led off by the city attorney. Then after that series of presentations, um, uh, we will go into the CIP program and uh, there will be uh, some input that we're requesting from council um, to consider uh, suspending some projects um, so that we can get more resource uh, devoted to the uh, uh, reserves uh, to help us through the next six to nine months, if not longer. So um, very quickly, if we go to slide 60 uh, for the community and for the council, um, I'm not going to go through each one. This was the, these are the current council set of goals. We switch to 61. These are the tier one priorities. And at this point, I will turn it over to the city attorney to pick up the presentation from here. do touch uh, virtually all of the key programs, policies, and initiatives that come from the council, from the city manager, and from the various departments across the city. Um, so ours, um, as a service uh, department, ours will be a more general review. You'll hear greater details as you uh, next hear from the uh, five portfolios. Um, but I'm hoping that this will also start you with some common themes. And most particularly, I'd emphasize that as we turn to uh, the next slide on challenges, um, the challenges that we face, uh, even in our small department, these are operational challenge that, challenges that are faced by all of our departments. Uh, and I would emphasize, as others have before, that we are in uncertain times. So on the challenges, um, our first challenge is our ability to maintain highest level services in light of the impacts of COVID-19. And this really addresses the availability of our employees. Uh, like all departments, our employees are our most valued and important resource. And like other departments, um, we are facing the challenges of a remote workforce. Almost all of our employees uh, in our office, so attorneys, administrators, uh, paralegals, legal secretaries, all of us um, are, uh, for the most part, working from home. And although we're now all experienced as uh, Zoomers and uh, experienced conference call in conference calls, um, we have lost uh, the advantages of direct contact, of shared resources and of the logistics efficiencies of all being able to work in a single location. Um, all, I, again, I recognize and emphasize that all, virtually all of the departments are facing these same concerns. Uh, remote working 
uh, is also likely to be with us for some time. It could be sooner or later that we'll be able to uh, reopen our offices, uh, but we don't know how long that'll be. Uh, as the health orders begin to relax, we will have to establish protocols for our return to work and we'll have to ensure the safety of our work environment. Um, we are looking at potential staggered schedules, work schedules. Uh, we're looking at relocating some of our employees in order to assure, assure the uh, six foot distances. Uh, and we are looking at enhanced sanitizing routines. Again, citywide uh, uh, efforts. I know these efforts may sound small, but they do affect our, our, our efficiencies and our ability to get work done quickly. Uh, to ensure the um, sustainability of our workforce, we also must honor the, le the leaves of absence that are granted under city uh, policies and also federal statutes. Um, we do anticipate uh, that we and, and other departments may periodically be working with a reduced workforce. Uh, particularly, uh, we may experience re reduced workforces during the summer months when even a virtual school is out of session. Under normal times um, or in usual times, if we were facing some internal restrictions, uh, lack of, uh, of resources, uh, we might turn to outside, to the outside for help. But now we have limitations, uh, financial limitations. You've started to hear uh, some of those uh, in light of the lost revenues, we're not able to turn and, and hire outside counsel or other outside services. Not only financial limitations, though, there is, a, there is uncertain availability of, uh, of our uh, outside consultants. So uncertainty is a theme I think you've already started to hear and you'll continue to hear. We don't know how long the public health restrictions will remain. I know there's discussions of them being uh, begin to be lifted uh, soon, maybe even in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but will we face a second wave uh, in the fall or winter? We don't know. What will fire season bring? Uh, God forbid any significant fire effects hit us at the same time that we're dealing with COVID. What impacts from PSPS? We know the PSPS will be with us again this fall and perhaps even sooner. And then an evolving legal landscape. And I would also note, as you've already heard, an evolving financial landscape. Next slide. To looking at, uh, given even those, uh, those challenges, we uh, are keeping very busy. We are moving forward with projects. Um, we are, like other departments, really uh, stepping up and I've been impressed with uh, with our my own staff, but with uh, the staffs of uh, all of the departments and all the work that's being done uh, despite the difficult conditions. Now, our, we are a service department, so our work will be driven by the work uh, that comes from the council and from the city manager and from the other departments. Um, so going uh, in order of the council priorities, uh, fiscal sustainability, um, we will be continuing to assist departments in their exploration of revenue options, as well as in their exploration of options to reduce expenditures. We will be continuing in our efforts to defend uh, the city against claims and litigation. What we're looking for in that and why I've placed it under fiscal sustainability is we are uh, really looking to avoid liabilities and limit the financial exposure of the city. And fourth, uh, we will be continuing our act actions to ensure receipt and administration of the PG&E settlement. If that settlement is approved by the bankruptcy court um, payment, we would be anticipating that payment may be received in late 2020. But again, we need to stay on top of all of those efforts both to ensure that that approval goes through and that the monies are received and that they're administered properly. Um, that fund obviously will come back to you at a later, if, if the, uh, 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 the, the, the settlement goes through and we do receive those funds, uh, that will be, the use of those funds will be a, a discussion for another day. Under recovery and resilience, when the council first uh, set forth recovery and resilience as a priority, uh, what was, uh, what we were addressing at that time is the 
uh, response uh, to the fires, both um, the 2017 and 2019 fires. Uh, now I would add to that uh, the category of addressing COVID. So we will be continuing to provide guidance on the evolving statutes, regulations, orders, and best practices to address COVID-19. Uh, we will be provide, continuing to provide legal support for the development and implementation of uh, measures for economic recovery from COVID-19. We would anticipate that's going to be both short and long-term measures. Um, with respect to the fires, we'll be continuing participation in CPUC proceedings for enhanced wildfire mitigation and improved PSPS procedures. Next page, please. And uh, finally, we will be uh, continuing to provide procurement support for our fire recovery projects uh, going forward. There are a number that are still uh, in the works and to be done. Under comprehensive housing strategy, uh, we have and will continue to provide legal support for the development and adoption of the downtown station area specific plan, as well as the general plan update. Uh, we will be, we have and will continue to provide streamlined housing project review through our office. So that's review of project requirements, review of CEQA, uh, and, and review of other opportunities. Um, and this will relate to both specific projects and to any additional uh, policies that are developed uh, through PED or through other departments. Um, and finally, on comprehensive housing strategy, we will continue to provide our legal support for affordable housing uh, projects and affordable housing financing through the Housing Authority and Housing Trust. On homelessness, um, we have uh, very much and will continue to be integrated, continue to provide integrated support for the programs and initiatives uh, from the Homeless Action Team and the Homeless Encampment Team. Homeless Encampment Assistance Program. Next page. On uh, homelessness still, we will be providing uh, legal support and collaboration for regional efforts to address homelessness. We are uh, continuing to, to work with the county and with other cities and looking at options uh, for uh, better uh, working relationships and better collaborative projects. And finally, we'll be continuing to manage the ongoing and anticipated litigation regarding the city and regional responses to homelessness um, but the legal field uh, regarding homelessness is evolving and evolving quickly. Uh, we will, we are on top of that and will be continuing to work, uh, work uh, in that arena. And finally, on the climate action plan, uh, in partnership with the departments, um, we are and will continue to work in preparation of the updated climate action plan that will be incorporated into the new general plan. Um, and uh, uh, the, the ultimate general plan is looking for adoption uh, in about three years, but that work has begun and will be continuing. And then finally, on climate action plan, we'll be providing uh, ongoing legal support for the council, the council subcommittee, and the department uh, climate ac action initiatives. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sue, for that presentation. Council, any questions? See no hands raised. Thank you very much for that presentation. Okay. Next up is Community Development Engagement Assistant City Manager David Gillen to be doing the presentation. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Council. So I'll start off, and the, the presentation that I'm going to be giving an overview is the community engagement. Um, portfolio that includes planning, building, development services, economic development, housing, homelessness, recreation, and community engagement. So those are the areas that um, I'm, I'm going to touch on. And we'll start off similar to what the city attorney just did, is give an overview of some of the challenges that we're facing and we see coming down the road. And then talk a little bit about how we're moving forward on some of the priorities that the council set forth last year. So next slide, please. So the challenges we are seeing are very similar. Um, they fall into two basic categories, uh, primarily resources, uh, resources available to support uh, some of the goals, uh, but also the uh, impacts of COVID-19 and how we move forward. So re with regards to COVID-19 and how those impact um, what we're looking at, some of the key things that jump to the top of our list in terms of what we're keeping an eye on and working through right now um, regard uh, fall into the categories of, of maintaining service delivery. So specifically for housing and business development. So we are seeing um, a fairly 
heavy load come in, which is um, a good a good problem to have. You know, er early on in the process, we weren't sure if people were going to pull off projects and and stop doing things and building housing, but that's not the case. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a large demand for that type of service. So how do we maintain that delivery or service performance that uh, the, the community is used to with uh, the resource reductions, but also the new, how we operate within this uh, post COVID world. Uh, the other thing that um, we are facing obviously is that we, we had a housing crisis before this that hasn't gone away. Um, if anything, that's been uh, elevated to the point where uh, we have to identify ways to produce this, the, the amount of housing we need as we are falling behind in our arena, arena goals. Uh, so we're looking at policy items, legislative items, uh, more work towards what we can put in place. And I'll talk about a few of those in the, in the um, uh, priorities coming up next. Uh, but we also do have the arena allocation that is coming down the road over the next uh, six to 12 months. And so that's something we're staying active in. That's been, that process has been delayed slightly, but we're still active in that process to make sure that we're, we have a voice at the table in the arena allocation uh, number. Uh, you heard earlier in the presentation about half the, the general, general fund revenue comes from property tax and sales tax. So that is a priority for us to make sure that we are doing our part to make uh, move projects through, get housing built, get uh, businesses back up and running. We do anticipate that uh, post COVID, we're gonna see a lot of turnover in our, our commercial real estate uh, uh, properties. And so coming up with a process to help that transition quickly, um, help people get back up on their feet as quick as possible, or get um, storefronts activated as quickly as possible is gonna be key as we move forward uh, post COVID. The other thing that a challenge that we're seeing obviously is um, when we are large group gatherings. So uh, our, our revenue producing, uh, pr programs such as recreation, community engagement, um, and making sure we're engaging the community in a, in a, in a, in a valid way, um, but also events, you know, holding things like Ironman. So how do we manage those? So we'll be looking at those programs over the next uh, six to 12 months as well, um, and how we look at things differently. And then the rebuild, obviously we've got about 1,200 homes in the process, about um, 1,200 are complete, about another uh, thousand are under construction today. So we're moving fairly quickly on the rebuild that did not slow down during this pandemic. Uh, so we're gonna make sure that we uh, can maintain that service delivery until the last person gets home. And then um, one of the things that's gonna come out of the economic recovery task force and through the process of input from the council and the community itself is identifying resources to support that recovery and what that looks like through staffing, through resources, through money, through other uh, uh, partnerships, that's gonna be key. And the climate action uh, implementation is a really interesting one. That's one where we've seen uh, certain things slip back, almost backwards in time, the reliance on drive throughs the reliance on single-use bags. But there isn't, uh, the flip side of that is there's an opportunity to, as we rebuild, as we rethink operations, as we rethink programs, to integrate uh, uh, climate action implementation elements into those new ways of doing business. So that's something that's, it's a challenge, but it's gonna be an opportunity for us as well as we move forward. And then finally, uh, homelessness, we've talked uh, quite a bit about, which is how that's changed the world in terms of what space do we need? How do we manage our, home, our homeless population in terms of uh, providing the, the, the social distancing, what, what new sheltering looks like, um, and then obviously the long-term housing. The next slide, please. So moving into the uh, council priorities, uh, we've uh, got it broken down into the, the top, top five tiers, uh, top five priorities, the fiscal sustainability, um, a lot of this revolves around what's going to be coming out of the Economic Recovery Task Force. A lot of focus has been redirected towards that. Um, business attraction, downtown vitality, and spending time working on what that looks like as we start to see businesses potentially uh, fail over the next uh, three to six months. What can we do to help one, keep them up, keep them afloat, but also get those uh, sites reactivated as quickly as possible. The recreation, I talked about that already, looking at uh, creative ways and what, what people are doing best practices for reactivating recreation programs such as uh, swimming and uh, softball leagues and other things as the health order starts to allow, are we ready for that? And what does that look like? And are we in, in prepared for that? Um, we're also looking at um, one of the things that came up for a, um, an economic recovery and sustainability for businesses is fiber. So fiber both for business, but also uh, for our community. Um, so we're looking at um, working with the EDB and a, a regional approach to fiber and how that could be implemented uh, with grants coming from the EDA and other sources. So we're evaluating that as well. And then um, I talked about the recreation programs from a revenue standpoint. So next slide, please. A lot of the work right now is again, focused on housing. Um, you heard a little bit about that from the city attorney. Um, you'll see one item today, uh, the, the uh, rental assistance program that's uh, being brought forward. 
the downtown specific plan, we're hoping to get the EIR on the street uh, in June and hopefully bring that to you for adoption in the fall. We are continuing to work on enhanced infrastructure financing districts to make sure we they capture that increment um, as development starts to happen downtown, that we have that in place to start to reinvest back into the community for housing and other infrastructure needs. We kicked off the general plan and health of city, cities initiative. So that starts uh, already underway. You'll, you'll see a community engagement plan come to the city council uh, in June uh, to uh, rethink how we're gonna engage a community in this new world with both uh, some physical where we can, but also a lot more digital connection um, so you'll see that uh, and, and be able to provide input on that process. Uh, we'll be looking, we have started a process looking at missing middle. Again, how do we identify where we can see den additional density within our community that makes sense. Um, and then some downtown housing projects you've heard about, one Santa Rosa Avenue. We have the smart site coming, 420 Mendocino and a few others uh, that are moving through the system that are, we're hoping to see come, uh, come, come to fruition over the next year or so. And as part of the general plan, we'll have to update our growth management ordinance. And so you'll be seeing that uh, at the end of next year as well. So next slide. Uh, more housing, um, to a historic survey. Again, that's to help identify historic structures in the downtown specifically to clear those hurdles and address those issues ahead of development to try to reduce time, but also add certainty to the development process. We've also identified a grant source to uh, focus um, take a look at the Mendocino Avenue uh, through a specific planning process with uh, the, the JC looking at housing on their site with that being a, a transit corridor and people being interested in adding housing along Mendocino. Uh, that would be an opportunity to look at that and bring us, uh, uh, conduct a specific plan for that area uh, with, the, with to get input from the public. Uh, that'll be coming to you later um, to decide if that's how you want to move forward. Um, and then we're also looking at um, affordable housing projects and funding uh, tax credits, identifying additional tax credits and policies to help uh, get affordable housing built. Now on the homeless side, uh, really the kind of three things are the immediate, which is social justice for shelter in terms of the interim encampments that we've identified, um, looking at the in intermediate expansion opportunities that we have, and obviously the long-term identifying housing solutions um, and through the housing first model um, over time. So next slide. And this is the final slide it is uh, primarily the climate action plan. Uh, the city attorney mentioned this. We are updating the climate action plan that will be rolled into the, the, the general plan process. Um, so we can leverage uh, those two documents together and make sure there, there's, there's some synergy between the two as we move forward. Uh, the climate implementation, we're not gonna stop um, implementing the climate action elements. And so we'll be hopefully at some point bringing back the climate action subcommittee so we can prioritize those elements. Um, and then on the recovery resilience side, obviously uh, continuing to rebuild and, and move forward on the uh, uh, homes that were lost in 2017. Uh, we're moved over to a full virtual plan check inspection process. Uh, that's something that um, we did it by brute force over the last uh, couple of months, but uh, we're implementing a process now that's gonna be tied in with the county system so that there'll be some commonalities in the, in the region on how plans are processed electronically and we'll continue that through once COVID is lifted, that we can continue that electronic approach to uh, um, doing building plan checks. And then finally, um, what's most important through for a resilience standpoint is uh, making sure we have a, a good, a, a strong strategic community engagement plan uh, of, in place so that we can make sure we're hearing from the community, understanding what the needs are from the community and, and plan, adding that into as, uh, policy development and actions taken by the city council. <clears throat> That's all I've got. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation, David. Uh, Council, any questions on Mr. Goins' presentation? Not seeing any hands raised. Um, David, I did have a couple. Regarding, uh, you mentioned the housing at the JC. What impact, if any, have you heard of COVID-19 has on that project? I haven't heard any impact on that yet. I, I would be happy to reach out to them and see where they are. Um, unfortunately, I, have, I haven't had a chance to talk with them, but I can get back to you on that. Yeah, not, not a big priority. And then the other one was, I know we had been talking about with the recovery and resilience, the um, Veritas, you know, balancing um, the consulting along with the building and the inspection. What impact has this COVID-19 had on your plans for that transition? Actually, is going very smoothly. We uh, did not see any slowdown on the, uh, you're talking specifically the rebuild through the Bureau of Veritas contract. 
Correct. Uh, that, yeah, we, we actually hit our peak um, number of inspections during actually two weeks after the shelter in place went into place, we were seeing 188 inspections a day out on the rebuild. Uh, so that we were able to keep that up and running. Uh, we're working remotely. Inspectors are leaving straight from their house. We've got protocols in place. So that transition is well, uh, is, is working smoothly. Uh, we're starting to decrease the number of, of consultant staff. And at some point, we're not there yet. We still have over a thousand units on construction today. Um, at some point, we're going to transition that in-house when we're down into the 100 or 200 uh, unit range. Great. Thanks for that update. Uh, Mr. Tibbetts, you have your hand raised? Thank you, Mayor. Um, David, uh, appreciate that presentation. I was curious, though, on, particularly of interest to me is some of the economic development policies getting developed um, right now in light of COVID. Is there a time at which the council is going to be able to see everything that's that's working on that's being worked on, or or that we'll get an update um, from you or from Raisa on on all those policies? And I'm thinking more for the public's benefit than the council's. Yeah, that's a great question. And an email has uh, we're trying to send email updates about what's happening in the task force. Uh, I think there was an email that went out on Friday, but we also um, will be working with the city manager to. Um, uh, find additional ways to get information about what's happening in some of the task force. Um, we also re we'll also reach out to the chamber and other business groups to make sure that they're aware of the efforts going on in the task force on regular weekly calls so that they can help get the word out as well on the policies that are being worked on and, and help prioritize that. Because uh, we are, we want to make sure people understand what the task force is working on so that if we're missing something, we want to hear it so we can bring that to the task force and, and discuss that. Okay, Council, any additional questions for Mr. Gillen? All righty, thank you. Oh, Mr. Dowd, you've got your hand up. Uh, Mr. Gillen, on slide 71, you say Mendocino Avenue specific plan. Could you define roughly what the limits of that are? You know, is it 4th Street to college or whatever? That's a great question. At this point, what we've identified is the need for that corridor. We do have a corridor plan that I believe goes up to Bicentennial. Um, what we will be doing over the next uh, month or so is to look at what that scope could be. Uh, we want to get input from the community and residents as well um, through that process. And then that'll determine the, the size of the grant that we go after with uh, uh, that, we, that we're lining up. So unfortunately, I don't have the exact scope listed out for you. I just wanted to make sure the council knew that that was on the plate and we're evaluating that stretch of road. Um, and we'll be looking for input, um, both from the council, but also from the public. Thank you. Okay, not seeing anyone else with any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Gowen. Up next on our presentation is operations and transportation with Assistant City Manager Jason Nett. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, the operation and transportation's portfolio is comprised of the Water Department as well as Transportation and Public Works. Uh, during the course of this COVID event, uh, a number of our staff members um, were uh, idle. Uh, during the while we evaluated what essential services were, and that's reflected in part of the presentation that we're going to be discussing about now. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So from a challenges standpoint, uh, really, as as uh, Assistant City Manager Gwen said, it's the some of the primary issues that we're dealing with relate to the financial crisis, uh, the and the resulting impacts of the COVID nineteen. Um, both from the standpoint of those time, that, the time that uh, our staff was spent uh, staying safe uh, at a shelter in place at home while we evaluated essential services, but also looking forward and what might become or what's part of the hiring freeze. Um, looking at all of these components, uh, we have a number of different key things that we wanted to identify, uh, such as uh, there's concern relating to an upcoming bond sale. Uh, you heard from Director uh, from Director Burke uh, earlier today that one of the largest projects that they're moving forward is with the UV replacement project at the, at the Laguna treatment plant. Um, there are a number of components relating to that bond sale that uh, could be impacted by actions that are taken um, in the course of handling uh, or our response to, to COVID and the economic crisis that's, that's resulted from it. And so trying to keep track of um, what's going on there so that we can continue to ensure that that project is able to move forward 
it's a great bond market. And so we want to make sure, so we're, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to get some great prices. Um, but our ability to be able to uh, uh, proceed with that project is, is one of those that we're, we're keeping a, a, an eye on and could become a challenge. Um, along with that, one of the keys is to ensure that we continue to maintain uh, a proper rate structure for our water services. Um, uh, as many of you know, we're in implementing a process to look at a new five-year rate structure uh, moving forward that would be uh, in place beginning fiscal year 21-22. Uh, and so trying to set that program up in the wake of this financial situation is one that has um, the operation uh, uh, nervous, um, but eager to get going so that we can have those uh, upfront conversations with BPU and council members uh, and then the public as well to try to understand what those rates might look like moving forward. During the course of having individ uh, our maintenance staff um, away from the office for a period of about eight weeks did result in a substantial amount of debris that has accumulated in and around our community, um, both in roads, parks, and creeks. Uh, we're now starting to staff up at a limited, in a, in a limited format. Um, all of those maintenance services are about 50% capacity at this point in time in an effort to ensure that all of our staff is remaining safe by social distancing. Uh, and we've developed a series of protocol and practices to help our staff identify what constitutes good program uh, it, as we begin to look at returning to those services. The backlog of that work is something that's that's taking us quite a bit of time to, uh, to figure out a method forward. Uh, it's also forcing us as we get into fire season to, to look at prioritizing not only the work that we may have not done over the last eight weeks, but the work that we would be doing uh, moving forward. Um, with fire season, obviously fire suppression cutting um, in all of our areas is a major issue. Uh, but we're finding that this um, combined with the hiring freeze that's resulting from the fiscal situation is one that could further impact our ability to respond the way we have in the past. Uh, and so we're looking at how we're going to be able to continue to provide those services in a, in a meaningful way uh, as we move into this next fiscal year. And then the last bullet you'll hear, you see, uh, really is just tying together some of the comments you heard from um, from this Eid about transit, um, with the significant changes uh, in the service, in our ability to provide service relating to our fiscal and our ridership. Uh, we really are concerned um, that the system's not going to look the same. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, this is both uh, a concern, but it's also an exciting opportunity to rebuild it in a format that we might be. Um, that might be more sustainable into the future and be able to hit on more of the goals uh, and priorities that the council has established uh, and make it look like a really um, uh, excited and forward thinking system. We have started to see an increase in the number of claims that have come forward on construction projects and other activities. Um, this is due to uh, the city forcing contractors to shelter in place. Um, to wait for the public health officer to identify what proper guidelines were to return to all construction activities. Um, in general, what we identified as essential construction uh, was uh, projects that were either very near completion um, and had an essential service to them or projects that were critical in nature. Uh, one of the ones that uh, we worked substantially hard on was a failure of a uh, main sewer trunk line that fed the Laguna treatment plant. And so we needed to make sure that we activated and got that repaired. Uh, and that became one of our essential projects. Uh, but now that we're starting to see contractors go back to work on the public construction side, um, we are starting to hear more and more grumblings about um, the delay uh, that was caused by our putting contractors in stand down mode. And then as the public health officer has instituted new rules on how those contractors come back, um, they're contemplating additional change orders relating to instituting the new site safety specific, uh, site specific safety programs uh, and what that means for their, in their uh, ongoing construction work. Through the whole program here, uh, we are continuing to see um, regulators impose additional and new regulations uh, that are going to have an impact on how we provide services. 
the one that I specifically identified here on the slide relates to the NPDES permits uh, and um, on how we deal with our stormwater. Uh, and this is potentially a substantial concern for us. Other ones such as the implementation of SB 1383, which is a mandatory composting program. Um, these are significant impacts uh, that will result in the need for additional services and programs uh, in order to make sure that these, uh, that we're able to maintain um, the type of services required under these new regulations. Uh, and with the hiring freeze, with the economic situation, we are concerned that some of these are going to be even more of a challenge than they were previously laid out to be. Um, and so we'll be continuing to track these coming forward. Uh, some of these will be uh, dealt with at the uh, Climate Action Subcommittee. We'll be discussing in more detail what some of those programs might look like coming forward uh, and the concerns and, and opportunities that we might have to, to try to continue to deliver on those. Next slide. The team is actively, however, working on how we're going to be able to continue to deliver on the council priorities. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're in a supporting role to planning uh, to the community development um, portfolio. Um, they're producing an awful lot of, of great products uh, out into both the homeless and housing uh, uh, and fiscal sustainability um, priorities. And our staff is, is supporting them in, in many different ways. Um, one of the things that we're working on is implementing a city works uh, maintenance management system. Uh, this is this is something that we believe will be a fiscal benefit for the organization. Um, it's going to provide our maintenance teams with a greater ability to be able to manage uh, the program of providing services into the community um, so that we can track the services so we can actively manage and maintain, uh, actively manage the, the cost of, of those services and be able to continue to do more efficient work moving forward. Um, on a recovery and resilience, uh, from similar to what you heard from, from the community development portfolio, this is really focusing in on trying to make sure that we're recovering uh, from the Tubbs fire. Uh, we have 28 projects that we're actively working through right now uh, in an effort to try to um, rebuild the public infrastructure that was damaged as a result of that disaster. Uh, and you'll hear more about that as we get into the capital improvement program. We are continuing to support the downtown stationary plan and general plan updates. Um, on a homeless side, we're going to be looking at trying to redesign our field services teams in order to be more responsive to homeless service requests. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time with housing community services and police department and looking at all alternative delivery options. And uh, we've come up with some proposed guy, uh, proposed ideas that we're going to be floating uh, over the course of the next few months in an effort to try to provide uh, a better response a team that can uh, help in the encampment situations by um, being um, having, having less individuals ad address a specific issue. Uh, on the climate action front, uh, this is predominantly where, where our organization is, is really uh, providing detailed um, detailed activities. Uh, we are going to be ordering four electric buses, um, and we're going to continue to switch over our light duty fleet to electric or or uh, battery or uh, electric hybrid type of vehicles. Um, we are going to be looking at adopting a number of components of those zero waste plan. Uh, uh, the reusable and compostable foodware ordinance is, is more or less uh, complete. Uh, we're looking, uh, we're working currently with planning and economic development staff to evaluate the draft document that we'd like to try to bring forward to the climate action subcommittee here very soon with an idea that we'd be able to adopt that before the winter. Uh, and then a few other programs that we're hoping over the course of the next year to be able to put into place should put us in a very good position um, to be able to respond to a number of the state uh, the state bills that are starting to move forward. Next slide. Again, continuing down with climate action, um, we've got a number of water use efficiency uh, items that we want to continue to move forward with, as well as creek restoration and stewardships. Um, we are going to be looking. Uh, to council's guidance on how we want to move forward with clean, uh, moving from clean start to evergreen. Um, 
We, we know that uh, on the water side, the direction is to continue to move forward. On the uh, general fund side, if council makes a decision to delay that, we would look to uh, come forward by uh, the beginning of next fiscal year to implement that program. Again, it's up for council discussion. Uh, there are some additional energy uh, items that are sitting out there, predominantly on the water side relating to time of use charges uh, and looking at a different way of calculating how some of the um, uh, electrical costs are being calculated by, by our service providers. Um, as we discussed recently, uh, it's our intention from the facility standpoint to hire a company to come in and do a comprehensive energy audit of all of our general fund facilities. Um, Santa Rosa Water has already completed that type of approach and begun to implement actions that were identified in that plan. Uh, we think as we start looking at climate action and how we should best invest funds that the city has, uh, we want to make sure that we understand the best plan for that. And by doing an energy audit, that gives us the most appropriate path forward to, uh, to making sure that we're implementing in a conscientious way. Uh, and then lastly, really looking back again at transit is, is trying to do more with the transit system that we have, given the fact that we have, we have, we're going to have far less revenue. Um, so coordinating with our partners in the region, trying to come up with different and uh, newer strategies on how to provide services, um, looking at different fare policies, everything that you heard Rachel talk about, those are all items that we think will provide substantial benefit in climate action by creating a stronger, more vibrant, uh, more user-friendly transit system that will get more riders in the future and less single occupant vehicles. Uh, and so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation, Jason. Council, any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Jason. Moving on to our fire department, we'll welcome Chief Tony Gosner to our meeting. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. So yes, Tony Gosner, uh, Fire Chief of the Santa Rosa Fire Department. Uh, I'm going to talk to you. I got four slides for the Fire Department moving forward. So if I can have the next slide, please. So yeah, the, this is our one of our challenge slides. Uh, really, what we're discussing here is is uh, talking about the uh, the ability to maintain services in our operations bureau and our prevention bureau and our admin. So. Uh, it's the department-wide uh, as we look forward or to this financial crisis coming up and the associated hire and freeze caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, first and foremost, we're, we're here to respond to public emergencies. That's all types of emergencies, fires, EMS, hazmats, PSPSs. Um, lately, uh, it's been the pandemic, right? So the last few months we've been uh, planning and preparing, and uh, the last two months, we've actually been uh, using our systems uh, for the pandemic in in a multiple in multiple ways. Uh, we have staffed a pandemic response unit to help with the call volume in the city. Uh, our call volume has dropped a little bit uh, based on the pandemic, but it's it's only about ten to fifteen percent. Uh, we generally run about thirty, just under thirty thousand calls a year for service. Um, so really, it, it, it is that responding to the emergencies. And we're coming into the wildland season, right? So we got summer, uh, which is going to bring our PSPSs with pg and &E. It's going to bring our red flag warnings. Uh, last year, we had 12 red, red flag warnings that we have staff for uh, in Santa Rosa and throughout the county. Uh, and that, that leads to the large-scale events that we've seen in 2017, uh, 2019 with the Kincaid, and then uh, the pandemic is a large scale event that's going to last for the next uh, year or so, depending on who you're listening to. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to, one of the things that we're looking for with the COVID-19 or one of the things that we're expecting is we're expecting this thing to spike. And what that's going to cause for us is it's going to happen in the fall. When it happens in the fall, that's the most dangerous time of uh, year for Santa Rosa and wildland fire seasons. So we're really looking at staffing uh, shortages. If it, we do have a, a spike in, in the department, we're looking at really uh, choking that down to keep it as minimal as possible. Uh, we're looking at multiple retirements. Uh, so with all of that, as we move out and wildland fire season and the pandemic response, 
the calls for service are going to be very critical uh, to how we we uh, use use our resources uh, moving forward. Mutual aid for large scale events. It's going to be difficult to if if what I talked about the spike happening. It's going to be very difficult to provide mutual aid because we are going to be here protecting the home front. We're not going to have people to send out. Conversely, it's going to be statewide and there's not going to be a lot of resources coming in. So there's, <clears throat> this is a concerning wildland fire season with the pandemic on top of it. Uh, with that, we have overtime costs that we're really trying to pay attention to and minimize. We're always paying attention to it, but the non-reimbursable uh, Overtime is our is what we get from the state, so it's actually reimbursable. That's a typo. Anytime we participate with the state, most of that's reimbursable. And then our regular overtime costs for the department. I will share that last year that uh, we had many injuries that stemmed from the last two years of service not being able to hire enough folks, and we just it's, it was difficult on the department. So you start running through your people with injuries, and, and it takes a while for the department to get back to normal. Uh, some of the challenges, again, uh, we did a study of standards of coverage. We did a staffing study. All of those are going to be put on hold at this at this point uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, recruitment of sworn and civilian positions. So we have uh, nine positions open right now. It looks like it, it does take six to nine months to hire. Uh, safety positions with that we we have an academy that we put on the city of Santa Rosa uh, we're looking at a couple different hiring strategies that when we hire laterals we can shorten the academy because they have some experience that's not always going to be the case and, and we have several anticipated retirements this year um, challenges development of vegetation management program this is something that we need to to do we have not been able uh, to to get this off the ground we've attempted uh, two or three different grants, uh, been denied on all grants. I, I believe we're still waiting on word for, for one grant. Uh, but the long story short is none of the grants have come through and this is gonna fall on us uh, moving forward. Uh, supporting fire recovery rebuild effort, efforts and plan reviews and inspections. So like you heard from uh, Director Gillen, uh, we have our inspectors going out for the rebuild process and new construction. Uh, we don't have crews in the office like we normally do, so we stagger our units or our inspectors and we get them out uh, so we're not spending a lot of time in the office with, with each other, uh, so out there doing inspections. But depending on how this uh, pandemic uh, plays out, might impact that. And then the, the ability to provide meaningful community engagement. We have a new position that uh, has been, been working with uh, Adrian's team, <clears throat> doing a great job. We're going to use this position uh, to really help do some community outreach. And depending on how this summer, fall, and and winter go with the pandemic, it's going to be very difficult uh, to get anything done, knowing that we're going to be dealing with PSPSs, uh, possible fires, pandemics, uh, and the like. Next slide, please. So, council priorities: rebuild Station Five. This is our number one priority. It's been two and a half years, uh, and we're still in play right so um this is a one of those things that we're really focusing on a lot of good work happening on it it's just a slow process uh as when you're dealing with fema and some of the uh, strategies we're using uh continued support support for COVID 19 uh response this is something that we're going to continue to do this is going to be with us for a while um and it's it's not going away so that's just something we have to plan for under fiscal uh, sustainability, we're downstaffing the PRU. So we had uh, went into service April 14th, I believe, and it's coming down on uh, May 20th. We're doing this because we're seeing the fever calls come down. So this is a specialized unit just for pan the pandemic. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna pull back and try to save some money uh, in case we have to upstaff this unit again. It will be ready to go if it's needed. Uh, but right now, uh, it's going to be on hold as of March 20th. And then also with fiscal sustainability, we have a lot of stations that we either need to build or we need to uh, move or add. And so we need to move station eight and we need to add station nine as well as move station six and add station 12 
all those are on hold. Uh, there's no way we can move forward uh, knowing what the financial uh, outlook really is. But that's all going to happen in the future for us, but we just we just don't know what it looks like. And then implementing any kind of standards of coverage, that's where the stations come in. The staffing study recommendations, that's where the second battalion comes in, the additional engines. Uh, so it's all of that for the fire department in the city is on hold until further notice. Next slide, please. Under fiscal sustainability again, uh, implement community welfare protection plan. So our CWPP, we're in the final throes of that plan. Uh, we're supposed to deliver it by the end of June um, and we're working feverishly to get that out. But again, once it's out, it'll be a plan that we're not gonna be able to implement until we know where the funding is gonna come from. Uh, under recovery and resilience, we have some uh, updated or uh, <clears throat> outdated equipment that we need to upgrade for the radios uh, for the Santa Rosa Fire Department. When we went to Redcom, we had one radio channel. It was the old yellow net. It's called Control 3. It is very uh, fragile, if you will. When the PSPS happened last year, we lost Control 3 a number of times, and we, we tracked it down to an AT&T phone line. Bottom line is it's very old uh, equipment, and it needs to be replaced. And uh, so we're working with Redcom right now to come up with a plan to make it a more robust system that will not only be better for Santa Rosa, but be better for the region as well. And then back to fis fiscal sustainability, uh, ongoing funding and replacement at, uh, aging apparatus. You know, fire engine cost $640,000 the last about 12 years um, in frontline service. We use them for another five as reserve, <clears throat> but they're... The equipment, the, the technology is changing at such a great pace that it's hard to, to fix some of the older apparatus. So we, we really need to change these out at 12 years, ladder truck at 15 years, uh, ladder truck is in play and, and that's uh, gonna be great for us down the road. And then again, I'll just touch on the vegetation management uh, program that includes education and inspection program in our wildland urban interface. 30% uh, of our city is in wildland urban interface is something we absolutely need to do, and we've been trying to do it through grants, but we're coming to the point where uh, that, that is not working for us, uh, for the fire department or the city. Next slide, please. And with that, I can, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Gosner. Mr. Rogers. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think this is actually a, a question for you, Sean. Um, when the state reimburses us for overtime or when we respond back to mutual aid uh, and receive funding for that, where is that reflected in the budget? Where is it? It goes, I mean, it's, it, again, if it's a reimbursement, it comes back, um, and Alan could correct me if I'm wrong, it comes back and posted in general fund reserves. That is correct. So does that then come back to us from a, from a budgeting standpoint? Would that be considered turn back? Uh, at that no, point because no, it's, it's not. Happens. It's not considered turn back. It's reimbursement for expenditures. That's why, and a lot of times those expenditures came out of. Um, sometimes they were, you know, overtime is budgeted in the public safety units, so there is right. some overtime budgeting. But in, in other units, it would have been un, unanticipated expenses. So, right. So specifically for fire, if we have some budgeted overtime and then we end up getting reimbursed for it, we've budgeted for the expenditure of it when does when do we actually see what it comes back it, it depends on how quickly the reimbursement happens so it's going to depend on the avenue through which it is and that is then booked into uh, uh the the reserves okay so how much uh in typical years and, and understanding that this is not even remotely a typical year yeah. how much do we usually realize in terms of uh returned funding from either reimbursements uh due to overtime or from providing mutual aid why don't we why don't we take it and give you give council a um, i'll ask the team to give council a five-year snapshot of that process that'd be great thank you all right council any other questions for chief gosner chief i have one question for you you talked about one of your early slides about the mutual aid during large-scale events 
uh, both providing and receiving what some of the challenges that may present. <clears throat> Recently uh, received a notice of a local ambulance company um, laying off many of their employees, not directly in Santa Rosa area, I'm thinking more mutual aid. And we also heard from the governor's potential budget about um, maybe having some impacts on Cal Fire. How do you see that impacting our next fire season? Uh, it's going to impact us. I'll tell you, Cal Fire, they're actually adding engines and people to their to their workforce in light of the pandemic. Uh, Cal Fire is largely uh, a wildland firefighting uh, department, right? So they do have some summertime work. Uh, and they do they do hire year round, but the the increases that they're going to see are likely seasonal forces, and they're I think they're going to uh, be able to upstaff an additional 16 engines uh, that they lost in previous budgets. So that'll help. Uh, the problem with Cal Fire is it's, it's the state, right? So it's a large large body, and um, depending on what is going on in the state and where the fire that impacts us is and the resource around it. That's, we got bit in 2017 uh, with the multiple fires and the lack of resources. The Kincaid was the exact opposite. We were the only fire in the state and we had all the resources we needed and we were able to keep it out of Hillsburg, Windsor and ultimately Santa Rosa and West County. So it, it just depends. This year is gonna be tough. We got late rains, which means uh, grass is gonna grow yet again even though it's been cut. So there's gonna be two or three cuttings that we need to do, the, the grass is thicker. And when the winds show up, it's, it's just gonna be uh, that much more difficult. Uh, as far as the ambulance, I, I believe that's probably West County Occidental. Uh, they were unable to provide the service out there. You know, so that becomes something that the county uh, LEMSA looks at in terms of service and how that's gonna be provided. I think Bodega Bay Fire, and Russian River Fire are looking at providing support for that area. They both have ambulances and they, are, they may be able uh, to do that. But as far as mutual aid, they would come in for, if a hospital was needed to be evacuated or what have you, then they would, those resources come into the city or wherever they're needed uh, to transport victims out. So that ambulance out of the Occidental area, them going out of business won't have a negative impact uh, on service delivery for the Santa Rosa Police Department, mainly from a mutual aid perspective, responding to medical aid calls? Not necessarily. So that am, you know, that ambulance, when we're at a level zero, which means we have no ambulances in the city, which happens almost every day, then ambulances from Petaluma, Sonoma Valley, the West County will come in uh, and, and Hillsburg area will come in to fill that void. And it, it expands and contracts, right? When they have, say, uh, Petaluma is having issues, we will send ambulances down there uh, to help them. So the system works in that regard. Uh, so I can't say there won't be an impact, but it, it'll, it'll be minimal at this point. All right. but, Thank you. but that's Chief, it's not going to be minimal for West County. It's going to be a big deal for West County. Chief, you need, you used an acronym. Can you define what LIMSA is? Uh, local uh, Emergency Medical Association. So it's the, uh, it's uh, the county governing body for uh, emergency medical services. Sorry about that. Great. All right, Council, any other questions for Chief Gosner? Any pop quizzes you want to throw him his way? <laughs> Seeing no takers. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Next up is Police Department Chief Navarro. Good afternoon, I'm Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the City Council, Rainer Navarro, Chief of Police. Uh, I have four slides for you and uh, similar to the other presenters, uh, the slides really touch on uh, some of the issues and the challenges that we're going to be dealing with over the next year as we are um, uh, still addressing the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, uh, other potential issues that might be coming up in the future um, and then with the, uh, all the, the budget issues. Um, for us, public emergencies, you know, what we're seeing right now is they're becoming seasonal, uh, not no longer an outlier event. And uh, we don't know when these are occurring, so are going to occur. So uh, for us, it's going to be a challenge to maintain the ability to respond to public emergencies like the fires, uh, PSPFs events, 
and uh, public health emergencies that we are in right now, and also large scale events such as um, the uh, the contracted events that we're that we're going to be dealing with uh, um, in the fall, and that usually uh, impact our staffing uh, during the summer months. Uh, we're very concerned about uh, how we're going to be addressing uh, service levels. Uh, if we do have another spike with COVID-19, um, it's important for us to uh, be able to uh, try to address these staffing changes, uh, keep our employees and the community uh, healthy and safe uh, when we are uh, when we are going through these uh, through these spikes. And so uh, we are we are strategizing to see what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be impacting or how it's going to impact us uh, if we have another um, uh, uh, spike in the uh, in the pandemic. And uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, if there's any blessings in disguise, uh, we uh, have been able to use the last couple of months to really uh, shore up our safety uh, mechanisms and procedures uh, to make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to make sure that uh, we're providing a, a safe and uh, uh, a safe service. Uh, we're, we're also uh, going to be uh, needing to continue to compl um, uh, maintain compliance and enforcement of, our, of the health order. Um, and uh, also if there's uh, additional fires uh, P or PSPS orders uh, that would require evacuation of communities. So we're in charge of that and staffing is going to be uh, one of those uh, uh, issues that we're going to need um, in order to, in order to uh, uh, maintain safety and to uh, get people out of areas in a safe manner. Uh, our primary responsibility is to provide a uh, timely response to emergency calls. Uh, and so uh, we are doing that. Uh, one of the things that we are going to be continuing to evaluate and address is how do we deal with uh, lower priority calls for service uh, that uh, right now we've uh, uh, made some changes to get through the, the, the pandemic. Uh, but as we go back to a, uh, a, a normal schedule, uh, bringing up uh, those lower calls for service and, and actually responding to those, uh, but being able to keep that up with uh, uh, with uh, the number of staff that we have. Uh, over, overtime costs are always a concern. I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns that we have because we do have, we're, we're basically a responsive department. You know, we respond to uh, crisis calls. Uh, we try to uh, forecast issues as much as we can by looking at trends and uh, 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 and the population uh, that is uh, in our community, but uh, we can't always uh, we, we can't always uh, plan for an emergency situation. So uh, overtime costs uh, are impacted by the um, the adequate staffing or inadequate staffing uh, when we uh, address an emergency or, or significant investigations. Uh, you know, we, we want to uh, continue to uh, support the recovery and rebuild efforts uh, with uh, ongoing patrols and dedicated beat projects uh, in our burn areas. Uh, we've uh, been able to do that over the past year, uh, as, uh, past couple years, uh, by go going to uh, uh, community engagement uh, uh, meetings that have been uh, put on both by the city and county, um, having dedicated beat projects and uh, investigating property crimes and environmental crimes when they uh, when they arise. Uh, our our uh, environmental team, uh, crimes team, they, they, they uh, take on a, uh, a huge load when we are uh, working with code enforcement, uh, when they are during, in the rebuilds to make sure things are done safely. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we are going to be challenged with is the capacity to conduct community engagement. Uh, we uh, are, again, uh, a blessing is that we're learning how to do uh, remote uh, meetings now. And so this is something that we're going to uh, try to be using uh, in the near future. But uh, as we do that, it does, uh, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we maintain the equipment? How do we, uh, do we have the adequate staffing to be able to do this? Um, and then also uh, trying to address community engagement as our uh, communications team for the city is largely involved with the, um, the health order emergency and um, uh, dealing with those notifications. So how do we get back to our normal course of uh, community engagements uh, as um, you know, um, in, in each of our communities? 
And then also we're going to be addressing, continuing to, to need to address uh, compliance of mandated laws such as SB 1421 and AB 748. Uh, those are the uh, uh, requirements that have uh, come to light to uh, make sure that uh, we are um, transparent as or as transparent as possible uh, and um, uh, making sure that we're getting information when we have a significant use of force or a uh, significant investigation that needs to go out to the public. Um, and then also we have a, a new law coming up. Uh, it's a Racial Identity and Profiling Act. Uh, it's a law from 2015, but it actually is going to impact us in 2022. And so we are uh, currently trying to uh, find how we can uh, properly uh, collect the information that we're going to need to collect. And so some of that's going to be uh, through uh, technology, uh, but also uh, it's going to take some staff hours to be able to make sure that we're doing that correctly and um, addressing any audits that we might have. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, we are largely dependent on our staff. And as the city attorney said, you know, that's our, our staff is our most valuable resource. Uh, and as we go through this, uh, especially this next year, is uh, we're going to be looking at um, our recruitment. And uh, battling attrition is uh, largely determined on how quickly we, we can recruit, uh, both in our sworn and civilian positions. For officers, it takes about six months of, uh, for recruitment, and there's an extended training program that they have to go through before they're actually uh, uh, ready for solo duty and uh, be able to provide that level of service for patrol. Uh, we currently have several vacancies in the department, and we anticipate several more retirements, uh, both in our sworn and civilian ranks, throughout the next year. Uh, adequate staffing allows us to have assignments in special services, uh, which directly uh, impact our ability to solve crimes. Uh, it uh, helps us be more proactive in, uh, in, in several areas, such as uh, uh, combating the, uh, the issues of uh, drugs, uh, specifically fentanyl, which is a huge issue right now, gangs, uh, domestic violence, and sexual assaults, which are all, all uh, uh, you know, very significant uh, issues that are going on. Uh, it also, um, we don't, uh, adequate staffing to have these assignments also helps us uh, continue community education uh, in, in several of these areas. It allows us to uh, uh, put on special programs such as the, uh, the GREAT program in elementary schools. Um, it allows us again to follow up on cases and it improves our clearance rates on our crimes. Uh, the uh, assignments uh, in traffic uh, will um, are are could be delayed if uh, we don't have adequate staffing. Uh, our traffic unit uh, or traffic bureau is uh, the one uh, main team that allows us to address traffic complaints, uh, traffic uh, compliance of traffic and safety grants, and allows us to work with the schools on traffic safety programs. So our grant. Uh, uh, mandates with our grants are largely carried out by this particular team. Uh, we have a, you know, we want to continue to uh, staff our um, downtown enforcement team. And so uh, as we look at that, uh, our staffing within patrol allows us to have the staffing that we have uh, right now within that team. Uh, and that team supports uh, several of our other uh, departments, uh, especially uh, the housing and community services. And uh, we work with businesses and the downtown, um, uh, downtown projects. Uh, we work on uh, several complaints uh, and um, we have a, the team that we have right now uh, is um, it's important to have that team because we have several, as you know, evolving laws and uh, uh, the injunction, uh, which impacts how we address uh, the, uh, the growing hom homeless population, uh, which is already taxing to our community. And uh, again, we, uh, uh, the, the, the staff that we have within the DET allows us to um, be directly involved in the homeless programs that are being put on by other, our, our uh, nonprofit partners and also uh, the other city departments. And then our uh, school resource officers, uh, we, the challenges that, uh, that we have right now is, uh, you know, we currently have four uh, school resource officers. We hope to uh, put uh, another SRO uh, on the team before the next school year comes around. Uh, and then that way we would have uh, the ability to, um, 
to staff for the, the five Santa Rosa school district high schools and their feeder schools. Uh, the other thing that we are continuing to uh, try to address is how do we uh, uh, provide equity uh, within the school system. And uh, so uh, what we are trying to do is look how look on how we can uh, better uh, serve the uh, Rosen School District and also our continuation schools um, and, and actually uh, provide better, uh, uh, continue to provide better training with active shooter and uh, work in partnership with our school system. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, I broke up the next two slides, uh, uh, similar to the other presenters uh, on your uh, top tiered goals. Uh, you know, from a fiscal sustainability standpoint, again, we are largely uh, one of the things that we uh, that can that helps us dramatically is our. Um, our ability to have adequate staffing. Uh, when we don't have adequate staffing, we have uh, we, we we tend to uh, run uh, uh, a huge a huge overtime. So um, our objective is to reduce the overtime and decrease response times through uh, adequate staffing. And again, our officers it takes up to six months to recruit, and then it also takes up to 12, um, 12 months to actually get them ready for solo uh, solo work uh, to be out on the streets. Um, for uh, again, our dedicated teams, uh, our dedicated teams help us reduce our overtime, um, and uh, again, they're critical when uh, we have uh, significant events such as uh, officer ball shootings or other critical violent crimes uh, that come up. Uh, we have, uh, again, our traffic unit, uh, they, they largely uh, address the uh, grant mandates that we have and traffic issues throughout the city. And, um, and then uh, we are constantly dealing with the evolving laws that are going on um, and coming up with uh, issues such as homelessness and uh, other mandates that we have to address with uh, domestic violence and sexual assault investigations. Uh, with uh, also with uh, our civilian ranks, uh, we have uh, we our goal is to reduce overtime and decrease response time uh, by maintaining uh, the inadequate number of dispatchers. Again, dispatchers uh, takes up to six months to do a recruitment and background, and then uh, they have a very lengthy training program which can take up to fourteen months. So, uh, from the moment we hire somebody to the moment they are available to work solo, um, takes a significant amount of time, a year and a half to two years sometimes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, recovery and resilience, again, uh, just to reiterate some of the things that we do there uh, to, uh, you know, our goal is to continue to uh, support fire recovery efforts through uh, our patrol staffing to maintain our uh, uh, officers in each beat and to uh, address community meetings and thefts and um, other special projects that are going on in the burn areas. Uh, we uh, uh, we need uh, we need the capacity to um, support the COVID nineteen response in our recovery efforts through this. Again, we um, we took a uh, uh, we we did a we did a dramatic change to uh, change to a, a new staffing model over the last couple months, and so we are going to be going back to our regular staffing uh, model here uh, next week. But uh, in the event that uh, another spike happens, we may have to return to this particular model. Uh, but the model uh, basically takes all of our investigative uh, teams uh, back to patrol. And uh, it's important to have adequate staffing, especially if we go through another um, uh, another impact that we had early on when we had uh, nine cases uh, here within the department. So it's important to have adequate staffing to make sure that we are uh, ready for any potential spikes, uh, both in the community and within in our department. Uh, our housing strategy, we support our housing strategy um, and we will continue to uh, work on that uh, with uh, our nonprofit uh, partners such as HOST and also the Housing and Community Services. Uh, we, we, our team has been responsible for many who have uh, chosen uh, many of the shelter options, you know, because we are, uh, uh, the, we are the first ones out there. We're having the initial contacts with them. And so we are working very closely with our teams uh, to, uh, to try to get people into our shelter. 
Uh, and then homelessness, uh, we are uh, addressing that and we will continue to address that uh, specifically with our downtown enforcement team, but also uh, with our uh, patrol and beat projects that we have. Uh, work, we work closely with, uh, again, our city departments, both the county uh, of uh, Sonoma and also our CBOs and our neighborhood uh, organizations as we address these uh, complaints that come up. And uh, one of the other things that we'll continue to do uh, pending funding is uh, maintain our downtown enforcement team. Uh, again, um, all of our dedicated teams are um, reliant on uh, or rely heavily on the ability to staff uh, our, uh, our normal patrol teams to address emergency calls for service. Uh, so that is, uh, with that, that, that does conclude my portion of the present presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Chief. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, you have a question. Uh, oh, I didn't realize that I was not um, unmuted. Okay. Um, thank you, Chief, for uh, a really comprehensive and holistic outlook on what it is you guys do. I'm always completely impressed by the the scope of what our police department does. I'm curious to know, has there, um, you touched on schools and equity, and I'm wondering, has there ever been a council school board liaison that interfaces with the police department? Uh, we uh, we work closely with the uh, superintendents and the uh, the the or the um, assistant superintendents, and uh, we uh, I don't I don't think we have an actual uh, liaison with the school board, but we do speak with them uh, when when certain things come up, and we have a sergeant and a, and a lieutenant who um, have maintained those uh, relationships with both the superintendents and school board members uh, if, they, uh, if they need any questions. But we can definitely look into a more formal approach to um, how we, uh, how we uh, uh, strengthen those relationships with, with the school boards. Okay, well, my thought would be that um, only if it adds support to the schools and the department in the city to, to have some sort of um, additional supports going back and forth between the board and the council on that count. And I'm also curious to know what other cities do in terms of creating and facilitating those connections, uh, but not looking to add more to your plate, looking to be supportive if that's something that your team decides might be useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, and the, uh, you know, the, the joint meeting that uh, council and the school board have uh, when they do have it is uh, very important to us. It's uh, we get a lot out of it um, as, as a department. And, uh, you know, we work for again, we work very closely with uh, the, uh, the, the schools, both Roseland Unified and uh, Santa Rosa and the other uh, school districts within Santa Rosa. Yeah, I think this is one of the um, ways, um, you know, in addition to housing and homelessness, one of the ways that the city is most able to offer social services that are within the scope of, of our charter to our residents. So um, that those just are my thoughts. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, council, any other questions for the chief? Chief, I have one regarding um, training, because unlike I know the fire department has in-house training, my understanding is you have some recruits that have not been to the regional training academy since that was stopped. Can you give us an update on that? And what impact might that have on your ability to bring in new police officers to address the staffing issues you uh, shared with us? Uh, that's a good question, Mayor. So we currently have 13 uh, cadets who are assigned to the uh, the training center uh, because of the because of the pandemic. They they uh, shut the training academy down, and so we've had them here uh, helping us with our cleaning protocols. Uh, but they are going to be going back to the training center in June. Uh, the first uh, the first group. There's going to be five that are going to. Um, they're going to graduate in August uh, with the training program. They are probably not, not going to be solo until the first, uh, probably January of 2021 at the earliest. Uh, the next uh, next uh, uh, group of cadets, uh, they're going to be going and starting the academy in June, and they probably won't be ready for solo status until uh, late spring to early summer of 2021. Uh, so there's 13 of those that aren't going to help us with our staffing until uh, until 2021. 
Uh, we currently have, um, I think, uh, six uh, uh, sworn vacancies. Uh, and um, uh, th so those are, and we anticipate uh, additional vacancies uh, in 2020. So uh, that's how, th I mean, basically, we're going to, we're not going to see those 13 positions, although they're on the books, we're not going to see them in solo status until 2021. Okay, it, it is the regional academy or post itself making any adjustments for distance learning? Because I'm also thinking about some of the ongoing training with some of the specialties. How are they going to address this um, shelter in place situation we find ourselves in? So they've been authorized uh, to uh, return to uh, their return to uh, class in June. Uh, they are gonna be practicing social distancing. They do have mechanisms and procedures in place. Uh, they've already gone over that with um, all of the recruit training officers that are up there. Uh, our, training, uh, our training team has been up there to visit to make sure that uh, they're gonna be in compliance and we're comfortable with uh, the safety protocols that they have. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, we can get some information specifically as to what they're gonna be doing if there's any remote learning. But uh, they're, they, are, um, they are working on the fly as everybody else is to uh, do the best they can. But uh, we do anticipate that uh, we will be able to get five people graduated in August. Um, and then the other ones hopefully will be, um, if, if we have another spike, we'll be working on that. But uh, the, the things, when, when they do take, when they, do, when they are suspended from the training program, we are bringing them back here. Um, and part of, the, uh, part of their program here has been to go through our field training books. And so that gives them a head start when they do get here at the end of their academy. So it's, it's, we're, trying to, we're trying to reduce the time uh, after they're done with the academy uh, by giving them adequate training um, you know, while they're suspended from the academy right now. Great, thank you. So, sorry, you have a question? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, Chief, the, uh, regarding the downtown enforcement team, um, this is, a, this is the, the one that was, oh, how long is it going to last? How long will it go through now? I mean, just a few, what, a couple of meetings ago of the downtown um, subcommittee, we heard that it had been uh, funded, uh, but that was probably just through the end of this year. Is, are, is it currently up and running and will run through June or has that already been suspended? Uh, the downtown enforcement team? Yeah. yeah I, so I, 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 go ahead. We have six officers and one sergeant assigned to the downtown enforcement team right now. Uh, what we had to do was uh, we did have to borrow uh, from other special assignments. And so, uh, so currently we have, uh, because homelessness uh, is uh, such a, uh, a massive undertaking right now, uh, we, we're, we're putting as many resources as possible there. Um, however, uh, we have had to uh, reduce the number of uh, staff and in other uh, investigative teams and um, um, including the gang unit and the gang unit uh, currently uh, we have two detectives from the gang unit who are working in violent crimes. And so we don't have the ability to be uh, as proactive uh, or to be proactive in the area of gangs because uh, we've taken uh, a, a huge resource from them and uh, addressed in, are currently addressing homelessness uh, and also keeping staffing uh, in violent crimes to address uh, uh, major incidents that come up. Okay, thank you. All right, Council, any additional questions for Chief Navarro? Seeing none, thank you very much, Chief. And next on the presentation schedule is internal services, Mr. Alan Alton. Mayor Swedhelm and members of the Council, the internal services portfolio is uh, made up of the Finance Department, Communications and Intergovernmental Relations Office, Human Resources and Risk Management, and information technology. And these are all support departments that help, um, that, that do reach out into the, uh, into the community, especially with communications and intergovernmental relations. But for the most part, we support the, um, uh, um, internally the operations of the city. And we have some significant challenges and on slide 88, we get into those. Um, 
Most of our uh, goals relate to, or at least for the council goals that relate to our group is goes around um, uh, fiscal su um, sustainability. And so that is the, the bulk of what we have here. And, and as you've seen uh, earlier, when we've done the, the long range financial forecast, we run into um, a significant challenge in being able to plan for fiscal impacts due to whatever incident could come up, whether it's, it's the current pandemic or if it's uh, future PSPS events or wild, wildfire events. Um, we also know that, that we are in the middle of a recession, but we don't know the depth or duration of that. Um, so these are things that uh, uh, where the challenge comes is that we need to be able to provide uh, solid information to the council and to exec staff uh, in, a, in a timely way when a lot of those, those that information just isn't available. Um, we, we continue to try to be resourceful in, in uh, um, uh, seeking out information either from consultants or from wherever we can find it to try to provide the best information that we can, but this is a, uh, uh, it does present a challenge to us. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier about PSPS and future budgeting to that, and I would, I would say that in, if, if the world was perfect and we weren't going through the pandemic right now, I think you would have seen some things in the budget that we would have discussed because we, we know that PSPS events will most likely happen on an annual basis. It just seems to where that's, that's where our weather patterns are heading. And, and, and so obviously, yes, we are cognizant of that. Unfortunately, this event happened and, and it took us down a whole new course. So, and part of that course and what we've had to deal with is, is a shrinking of reserves. Um, unfortunately, I've been through this a couple of times and to watch our, our reserves that we try to keep at a, at a, at a reasonable level and, and um, we're trying to grow to a larger level, but they get taxed uh, considerably during events like this. So um, obviously what we need to try to do is to replenish those to give us flexibility. We, we've discussed already through this, op, uh, through this presentation some, um, some ways to do that. Hiring freeze is one of them. But the challenge with that is that you need to balance the, the ability to uh, meet the operational needs of the city. And you do that through personnel but also to hold back that personnel in order to build your resources. Um, we know that we have uh, three sales tax measures. Uh, two of them are general tax measures and one's a special tax measure that will, um, uh, that will expire uh, in the near term. Um, ironically, they'll probably, or coincidentally, they'll probably expire right, or, or due to expire right around the time where we believe the recession will probably end. So it'll be, uh, uh, it, it's just an ongoing snowball effect with this, but we are looking out into the future and seeing that that is a, uh, that's gonna be a significant challenge if those are not uh, um, renewed. Um, and there's no guarantee that they would be. We are doing steps, uh, uh, the long-term financial uh, policy committee uh, gave us the, the go ahead to, to uh, start doing some polling and we've gone, uh, we're, we're moving toward that. Um, so we can report back to the council with, with that to make some decisions on putting it on the ballot or, or, or not, whatever comes from there. And we also are looking uh, down the future and we see that we have PERS rates that will be impacted by, by this event. Um, to the how much, we, we don't know yet. We are trying to get that information uh, uh, um, through PERS and to see, but it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty much a certainty that the, the, the losses that they took uh, um, from the downturn in the stock market, while they built a lot of that back, I believe, um, 
uh, it, it is still going to have an effect and that they're not going to meet the um, the inspected uh, investment rates or investment returns that they were um, hoping for. And that uh, will will result in increased rates to us. So, uh, but we uh, we also have other uh, other departments within the portfolio, and they are also challenged through this. Even if it doesn't directly relate to, to council goals, um, our our uh, communications and intergovernmental relations group um, they uh, they are trying to. Um, manage the pace and the demand of public information needs that go through prolonged events like this. And, and really through any event, we, we find this, they have a, uh, they have normal communications uh, that's needed within the city and, and, the, and the community, but we'll have an event like this and it's pretty much all hands on deck to, um, uh, uh, to tend to that incident. So to find that balance is, is, is definitely a difficulty and something that will uh, undoubtedly continue to move forward as we go along. Um, we need to uh, expand uh, our IT services uh, and support to respond to the new demands of virtual meeting spaces and effective work home technology. Um, We've noticed this uh, before, but this particular incident and given its duration has really spotlighted how much we need uh, uh, to advance in our technology. Uh, we're doing so as well as we can with Zoom meetings and, and that, and that's been mentioned before, but you'll, you'll also uh, recall that many departments have talked about the need for, uh, uh, for new technologies to be able to um, meet these ever-changing times. Uh, we do find a lot of our staff still working from home, especially office staff, and that presents its own challenges, um, not only from just a technology standpoint, but even from uh, probably a risk management standpoint as well, um, in that uh, office environments are not necessarily set up the same as our uh, or our home offices are not as the same as our regular offices. And finally, uh, the HR department, um, uh, they respond to the changing regulations and compliance uh, related to these recent emergencies. They develop procedures and policy uh, around employee safety and wellness. Um, and they need to keep an eye on, on complying with uh, local and state and federal requirements. Um, this is, uh, I, I think, where they, the, what they need to do is to try to be as nimble as possible when these things happen. So we've seen this in a couple of, of the recent um, emergencies that we have, especially when we needed to send employees home. So that just, um, uh, creates a whole set of issues um, in terms of, of developing employee policies and procedures that go along with that. Just in this one alone, we've been developing policies uh, for uh, wearing masks and, and social distancing when employees are in the office. Um, there's the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. Um, that's dealing with expanded uh, family and medical leave. Uh, we've had to create procedures around that. Uh, there's employees returning to work policies. There's all these types of things that we need to um, kind of start the, the, our, our engine going to turn around uh, and support our workforce through these types of, of policies and procedures as quick as possible. And it's a difficult task. So on to the next slide. Uh, we have our, our council priorities and, and, and really while the other departments uh, clearly have projects and, um, and uh, um, the things that they're working on, I, I think for, for our group, um, the main thing we need to do is be able to, to uh, uh, look toward our September 15th um, item to the council that will give the review of the, the year in um, general fund condition. 
So basically, as, as we uh, pass the budget this year, um, we'll, we'll start right away developing that presentation. And, and um, as we move through our year and close process, um, unfortunately, uh, the, the way we close out um, our fiscal year, uh, we don't have the information that we would need, the, the actual information that we would need until the September timeframe. That's why we have a September 15th um, meeting date. But in that, we'll be able to uh, to give you an accurate picture of how we ended the year. Um, we'll, we'll have three months of data to figure out uh, how the recession is uh is is going if it's a v shape or if it's a u shape or uh or l um and how we can go and um and provide that guidance for you to move forward uh we'll also have information back uh relative to um sales tax polling in fact actually we would have already have made a decision on putting that on the ballot before then but these are all the types of things that will go into that meeting to be able to provide you with the framework uh, to guide your uh, your fiscal policy going forward through the end of, of that fiscal year and the next fiscal years to come. And with that, uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'm here to answer. Thank you for that presentation, Alan. Council, any questions over Alan's presentation? Seeing no hands raised virtually or otherwise. Thank you for that presentation, Alan. Okay, we're gonna take another 10 minute break. Uh, 10 minute break, so I've got it at, let's say 345. So at 355, we will reconvene the presentations. Thank you.
Dig in the stash, Jack. How are you and Sarah doing? I don't know what happened. My, my visual disappeared for a while. Okay, hey, Madam City Clerk, I have us at 1555 hours. Can we do another roll call, please? Yes. Council Member Dowd? Here. Council Member Oliveras? Here. Council Member Rogers? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Council Member Sawyer? Council Member Tibbetts? Here. Vice Mayor Fleming? Here. Mayor Schwedhelm? Here. And Council Member Sawyer, have you joined us? Council Member Sawyer? I see him. I see him too. John, you there? Um, here. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. You thank me. A few te technical difficulties. Okay. I'm sorry, Madam State Clerk, was that everyone? That is everyone is present. Great. Thank you. Okay, next on the presentation is the fiscal year 2020-2021 CIP budget. And Assistant City Manager Jason Nutt will be our presenter. Uh, good afternoon once again, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about the 2021 proposed Capital Improvement Program budget. Uh, if you could please go to slide 92. Uh, this slide, as we typically show, just gives you an example of some of the $5 billion worth of assets that the city owns and maintains. Um, it's our responsibility uh, in the 
field service and, and water divisions, as well as uh, parks and uh, the garage to, uh, or uh, parking to uh, manage, operate, maintain uh, all of these facilities uh, within our, within our, uh, within our span of control. And so, as I mentioned, it's, it's about a $5 million portfolio uh, that we manage and maintain. And uh, we're going to walk through some of the projects that we're going to be doing in this upcoming year uh, to try to further that exercise. If you could please move to the next slide. Part of the question that we usually get is where do capital projects come from? There are a number of places that we receive information, both in feedback from the community members as well as, uh, as, well as public uh, directed public response and communication um, from council discussions uh, in the form of master plans, area plans. Um, there's a number of places where capital projects are identified uh, and, uh, and designed in essence uh, in, a, in a plan format and that we move forward into more detailed design and construction activities. The next slide, please. So this fiscal year, we're looking at about a $62 million capital improvement program. Um, we expanded the slide a little bit uh, to provide more detail. Uh, in prior years, what we've done is we've, we've combined a number of these sources uh, under a TPW heading in an effort to demonstrate what our capital, what our capital projects team does on behalf of uh, some of the smaller funds. Um, in this particular case, it seemed appropriate because uh, we're going to walk through each of these individual funds to kind of talk about um, some of the specifics. And this gives you a visual of how each of those funds uh, is combined to fit in within this $62 million total. Uh, and the next slide. So for uh, fiscal year 2021, uh, there is a request of $2.2 million of general fund money uh, to further uh, work under the ADA uh, program. Uh, the ADA program is a legacy piece that comes from a federal lawsuit that we entered into a settlement of um, to address some of our ADA compliance issues. Uh, as a result of that lawsuit, we did create and implement a transition plan. And within that, within that transition plan, it, it establishes a timeline with which and a prioritization with which we will deliver projects uh, to conform with current ADA standards. Uh, we typically ask as an annual allotment of $1.2 million. For this upcoming fiscal year, you can see the six projects that we're proposing to deliver with that $1.2 million and how that breaks out. Uh, now that these projects have been identified, as I said, through the transition plan, but also uh, through community response and complaints relating to specific, uh, specifically identified barriers uh, for um, members of our community that require additional additional support. Uh, also with this, we do every year ask for about uh, approximately $50,000 to support uh, internal project development. Um, the way our capital improvement program is delivered through our capital projects engineering team uh, is it's a 100% reimbursable program for each of those individual staff members who provide services. Uh, each of those staff members dir directly bill to a project. Uh, and within that, um, we also collect and apply general, fu general government overhead uh, to each of those projects. Um, as an incremental cost that's not um, specifically directly associated with that individual staff member who's providing that hourly service, um, it is something that becomes a little bit of a burden for internal service departments uh, to, to have that general government overhead. And so what we've typically done is we've used this $50,000 to provide, um, in essence, a free service uh, or a limited service uh, as we develop smaller projects for those uh, internal department requests. Um, and that has been a way that we've been able to mitigate the, the cost of, of our internal service uh, for design and, and delivery. Um, in the, over the last several years, we've been working on a program of replacing our high pressure sodium street lights with LEDs. Uh, we believe with the current allocation of funds, we have the amount to be able to uh, complete that program. Um, with that said, over the last uh, couple of decades, we've been 
dealing with a number of wood pole failures. Um, within our community, uh, we had a, a number of wood poles installed as a part of development projects. Um, they were uh, done at a time when, when you, the utilization of wood poles for streetlight technology was somewhat in vogue. Um, unfortunately, we're at a stage in their life where many of those poles are starting to fail. Uh, we've already had to go out and replace those poles um, where we can. And in other places, the poles simply weren't, weren't put back. And so uh, we're looking to repurpose some of the funds that we've typically had for streetlight conversion to wood pole replacement. Um, wanted to allow us to catch up on a backlog. Uh, we believe we've got a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of backlog uh, sitting in um, maintenance, but then it will allow us to start to work a little more proactively on addressing poles that may be coming uh, to the end of their life. And then last but not least uh, on this, uh, we do receive $662,000 annually from the, from the county uh, as part of the Roseland Annexation Agreement to improve streets within the Roseland Annexation area. Uh, and we're looking to program those funds. Next slide. As I mentioned, in looking at that large pie chart, we wanted to divide things up in, in, in a little bit more uh, distinctive way to be able to demonstrate where each of those funding sources uh, are. Uh, in this particular case, I'm showing you a slide that uh, demonstrates the capital facilities fees program. Um, as you heard from Shelley, this is one of those areas because development has been working, uh, has been so um, busy, we are collecting additional capital facilities fees. Uh, and we wanted to demonstrate all of the different projects that capital facilities fees are being utilized to pay for. We've got about $1.8 million uh, of funds that we're trying to program. And you can see on the right, the different areas that that $1.8 million is being delegated to. Um, next slide, please. In addition, because development is working so, so hard right now, uh, we are receiving additional park development fees. Uh, every year we do our best to try to delegate these into each of the individual zones. As you recall, there are four zones um, that we uh, collect fees for, and we then utilize those fees within that zone. Um, the zone is traditionally set up um, with 101 being the north-south barrier and Highway 12 being the east-west barrier. So you have a northwest and northeast, southwest and southeast quadrant that receive those funds. As we're looking at, at developing projects for this upcoming year, um, these are the projects that we're looking to fund with project uh, with park development fees, uh, totaling just under $3.2 million for this upcoming year. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time for park to, for park programs. Uh, we believe we're going to be able to actually uh, begin to invest some of those funds that, that we've, we've um, had difficulty investing in the past. Uh, so uh, now that the funds are, the fund amounts are uh, high enough where we can actually begin to deliver substantial projects. Uh, next slide, please. There are two other funds that we wanted to highlight. One is the parking fund, where we've got $120,000 uh, that Kim uh, Nadeau mentioned earlier, uh, and then the Stormwater Enterprise. And we're looking to invest about $555,000 uh, in the Stormwater Enterprise. And you can see those projects, a majority of them relates to uh, creek restorations um, so that we can do environmental enhancements. Uh, next slide. The next three slides are going to relate to the Santa Rosa Water Department. Um, this slide in particular shows the local water system and how we're going to utilize the $3.4 million of, of investment that they're putting into the 2021 year. A uh, majority of that is going to be in mains and services, but you can also see there's about $2 million going towards pump stations uh, and about $1.4 million going toward master plans and studies. Um, this is a, uh, an effort to start to uh, begin investing in some of those uh, areas where we haven't been able to do in the past. Next slide. On the wastewater side, slightly less uh, amount with about $12.4 million of investment and with a majority of those going into the, to the rehabilitation of sewer trunk lines uh, and sewer mains. Um, that's where the primary focus is. Uh, all of the assets that we're looking at doing rehabilitation on were based on a on an asset management system that we are currently utilizing. And uh, these all are the highest priorities at this point in time. 
uh, to move forward with, with the rehab. And the next slide. And then another $7 million that we're proposing into the sub-regional um, with uh, 4.5 going into the plant infrastructure and another 2.4 going uh, up towards our geysers improvements. Um, there's this, there, there's a, a lot of work uh, that we'll be doing here in the near future on the sub-regional side. Um, we've told you a couple of times about the UV system. That's not necessarily captured here, but that's something that you're likely gonna see in future capital programs. Next slide. So that's the 2021 uh, fiscal um, capital improvement program. That's the things that we're looking to invest in this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, but we also wanted to take a few minutes and kind of walk through and look at funds that are currently existing in the capital improvement program. We're gonna focus specifically on general fund projects uh, and how each of those uh, fund balances for those projects look at this point in time. Um, as you saw in the long-term uh, financial outlook that you heard a, a few weeks ago, um, there are funds that have been set aside that are in the process of working. They're doing great things, trying to help us deliver projects. Um, but uh, in many cases, it's all about reimbursement. As Sean mentioned earlier today, uh, it does take time for us to see reimbursement from our federal partners. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Jason, can I interrupt you real quick here? Just check for questions before you go on. Please. The I know we still have quite a few more slides. Um, does anyone else have any questions over the first part of that presentation? I have a couple questions. Um, Please. Between, uh, slide 95. You have the Rankin Valley and Cottingtown Library 200K. What is that for? And have we worked out the agreements as to which entity is responsible for which improvements of the facilities? Uh, so uh, on slide 95, these are accessibility improvements. Um, and uh, these are things specifically uh, because we own the building that we're responsible for making improvements on. And so, yeah, we're, we're very clear as to what our level of responsibility is at these locations. Okay, great. And then on the um, replacing the wood street pole ice, you, you, you talk about the need for that. Are they being replaced with um, wood street light poles or metal ones? Uh, Mayor, that's been one of the challenges that we have is, is we currently have a, uh, a standard uh, in, our, in our program that calls for a post-top type of decorative pole. Um, and where most of these wood poles have been installed, some in Fountain Grove, some out in Bennett Valley, um, the post top is actually not necessarily the same aesthetic. Um, as you've seen us look at replacing uh, poles up on St. Andrews or in the Fir Ridge area, um, we've done our best to try to identify poles that had a similar aesthetic to the ones that were damaged during the Tubbs fire. Um, and those are carriage style fixtures. Uh, so. Um, we don't really have a standard replacement uh, because the wood poles are all unique in each of the locations throughout town. Uh, with that said, it's our intention at this point to replace them with a, uh, with a steel or durable alternative to the wood pole. Um, we do not want to go and replace wood pole with wood pole simply because uh, of the potential fire danger and the fact that it does have a much shorter life than the, than the durable steel alternatives. Thank you. Yeah, that's where I was going, uh, length of life. Um, and then on slide 97, when we were talking about some of the CIP projects for the parks, is Measure M, the county parks initiative, is that providing any funding for CIP projects that would be included somewhere in here? So at the current moment, uh, we've, we've received feedback from council to utilize years one and years two of Measure M in an effort to um, you, in an effort to recover from the Tubbs fire for those areas that we have gaps in our financing. Uh, the other is, is to develop a, uh, an outreach program um, to the community to try to understand what sort of amenities the community would like to see us invest in the future moving forward. Uh, and then thirdly was to uh, do a, um, an assessment of all of our deferred maintenance within each of the parks to try to, similar to what we did with our uh, with our building facilities to come up with a plan on how we might be able to address moving forward. Um, we were holding off doing any additional uh, requests or expenditure plans until we had all of those pieces in place. So right now, there's nothing in this sheet that, there's, there's nothing in this proposal outside of those three items 
that uh, that we've asked to program. Great, thank you so much for that. Council, any additional questions? Seeing then, okay, Jason, continue. Thank you, uh, we are on slide 103. So as I was mentioning, we are working through and wanting to provide you with some information about existing fund balances for projects that uh, are currently underway. Um, we've part, we've uh, divided these up into four tiers. Uh, tier one being projects that, that staff has determined are, um, the funds are, are necessary to proceed. Uh, at, or they are designated in such a way that they can't be repurposed in another uh, for another um, project. Uh, moving down toward tier four, where we've identified projects that uh, are either idle or they're no longer necessary and funds could be recovered uh, to benefit other portions of our budget. Um, so with that, looking at this first slide in 103, um, which is tier one projects for FEMA, uh, there are, I believe, three FEMA slides, and these will walk through each of the, the projects that we are actively working on as a capital uh, program. Um, it will give you the fund balance. Uh, so these are general fund dollars that have been assigned or appropriated to that specific project and the status that that project is in. Um, you can see some of the larger ones. Coffee Park is the largest of those. Um, that specifically relates to the debris removal and soil remediation. Um, as Sean mentioned early on, we needed the capital outlay utilizing general funds uh, to get the project in, pro in process. Um, we are able to try to pull back some funds during the course of the project, meaning we're able to submit a request for reimbursement uh, as, as the project is moving forward, but we can't complete our request for reimbursement until all of the projects are complete. And so most of these, uh, there will be pieces of all of them that will be holding off until we've completed recovery of all of the public uh, capital projects relating to the, the Tubbs fire. And I'm happy to go uh, into more detail of that at another time if needed. Um, so as we go to the next slide, Again, additional projects that we're working on as far as recovery. Um, we've got uh, some, some that are fairly small, some that are larger. A majority of these projects are currently in the design phase with the idea that they're gonna be uh, moving to active construction within the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and so it's our hope that, we, that we're gonna be able to really start to see substantial improvements and changes uh, in some of those damaged products here very soon. Uh, and the next, so to all total, we had uh, just about $16.5 million worth of projects that relate to our FEMA recovery program. Um, this is money that we've held, as I said, in an effort to try to keep these projects moving, uh, but we will receive reimbursement uh, up to about, uh, up to with about 93.5% um, once we are fully complete uh, with all of the work and we've submitted for full reimbursement. Um, move to the next slide, please. So also under tier one were projects that we identified as being currently underway and critical uh, or projects that were already complete and just haven't been fully billed. So uh, we have two ADA projects that are up on, that are the first two. Uh, those are projects that the ground is already open, construction is actively working, uh, and we feel we need to complete those projects um, in order to, uh, one, realize the benefit of it, but two, to not leave the area in a, in a, a more precarious position than it may have been previously. Um, we've got a couple other, like the fire engine replacement, money's already been spent. Uh, it just hasn't been fully realized in the in the um, in the management system, um, but it will be by the end of the year. Uh, the Portland Blue is one that the project is ongoing. We've got the Lou ordered. Um, we have uh, ground uh, work underground that's already being done right now. Uh, pad is being constructed as part of the sidewalk project that's out there. Uh, so project is well underway. Uh, again, we just haven't spent all the money at this point. Um, on Sam Jones Hall, uh, we do have some funds that we may be able to recover, but we're still trying to rectify through all of the construction 
invoices to make sure we know exactly what that will be. Uh, and this is one you, you see uh, the word final reconciliation. Um, there will be some funds that we may be able to shift back to another source at the, uh, once we've been able to get through all of the, um, uh, the invoices. Uh, we have a safety project uh, in Courthouse Square. We're installing bollards. Uh, that project was awarded by council a few weeks ago. Uh, we feel at this particular stage, this is one that we should be moving forward with um, because it is something that's that that will help us move forward in the efforts, the recovery efforts and the safety in the downtown as we put more and more events uh, in that downtown space. Um, there's a financial system uh, upgrade and some communication systems. Um, those are that's work that is is already complete at this point, uh, and they're just waiting for final reconciliation of the uh, of the funds. Uh, and then the last is a hazard mitigation project uh, that we were successful in receiving relating to battery backups. Um, this is part of our local match for that project uh, and and reimbursement. So some of this fund will come back to us. Uh, once we've completed the project and turned in all the final paperwork. Um, so that's a total of about $3.6 million that we believe the projects are far enough along uh, or they're at a complete stage that we can't really take the money and repurpose it. Uh, next slide. There are, are a couple of projects that we're considering uh, as, as mandated because of regulatory issues. Um, we did complete a uh, some work in and around our corporation yard uh, at the requirement of the Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, as well as some work that happens in and around Garage 9, doing some groundwater compliance monitoring. Um, those are all regulatory. We really don't feel like there's a way for us to change that without uh, incorporating some level of fine from that regulatory agency. And then there is a, a fire line that has been damaged um, that feeds the, the basement of City Hall, uh, and that is currently out of compliance with the fire code, and so we feel it's appropriate to move forward with that in order to pull our own facility into compliance. The next slide, please. And then the last tier one category is one related to donated or dedicated funds. Um, you can see there's a number of funds here that came from that have been provided to us by other agencies or, or, or uh, communities. Um, we have donations relating to the tennis court or the person senior wing, um, the funds for our, the fire district, the pavement maintenance and the CCTV of uh, the storm drain. Those all are a component of the Roseland annexation agreement and, those, and, and are transferred over from, um, from the county. Uh, we do have funds relating to ecosystem restoration, um, and then monies that we received uh, from PG&E in an effort to restore pavement uh, for work that they did up in, in Fountain Grove as a response to damaged equipment. Um, and so we've, we've entered into an agreement to, to take over the final pavement lift, but they're paying us uh, this to make that happen. And so all total, we feel that there's about $2.3 million or $6.3 million worth of dedicated and donated funds that we really don't believe have, uh, we have the ability to be able to shift or transfer into any other project. Um, all total, we're about $26 million um, under the tier one, um, uh, under the tier one category, uh, about 26.7 million actually. Uh, and so uh, we think that those are, those are funds that probably have to remain in projects where they're at. Moving on to the next slide. Our tier two projects, um, we're identifying these as projects that are in, in some process, um, but there may be, even though we think that these are things that we should move forward with, um, they're at a stage that if we had to stop, we probably could. Um, so you'll see that there's work relating to fire station number five. Um, we think that we need to move forward with this because we have a due diligence associated with the acquisition of that property. Um, it's about a year long uh, work of due diligence as we work with that particular property owner. And we think that this is important enough for us to move forward. Uh, you'll find later on in the presentation that identifies the same fire station number five project with funds that relate to the design phase that because of the phase of the, of the project and the timeline of it, it, we probably could, we probably could see those funds utilized right now uh, for another purpose, as long as we get those funds back when the time comes to do, to do the design. Recently, uh, council awarded the uh, Luther Burbank roof um, 
redesign project. So we, we think this is one that we should be moving forward with, uh, albeit the contractor has not yet, or the design team has not yet started. Um, Corporation Yard, um, three years ago, the council provided the city or provided Public Works with some additional funds to try to um, secure the Corporation Yard. Uh, we have the design complete and we're ready for construction. Uh, we've been waiting um, for some agreements to, to be put in place for us to be able to get some electronic locking device, uh, the electronic door devices um, set up so that we could start to organize that. Um, Colgan Bellevue Park, uh, we had a vehicle accident that occurred that took out a park playground. Um, it was our intention to utilize the, the general funds that were assigned to that specific replacement, um, but we could use uh, park development impact fees uh, if needed uh, to replace those, but we were on the verge of selecting a, a, a company to come in and replace those uh, that equipment that was damaged. And then of course, there's the streetlight replacement program. Um, this is funds from the prior year uh, that remain, that we're still actively working on finishing uh, the LED conversion program. Um, and uh, it, it's something that we could cease that operation, um, but our recommendation is right now that we continue to move forward. Uh, there are some reconciliation uh, components in there, meaning we, we've spent money, um, and I'm not sure if all $567,000 is actively available, um, but we would need to reconcile to determine if there was a, a component that the council could repurpose for another, for another project. Next slide. Uh, the tier three projects are all associated with accessibility. Um, these are funds that have uh, been uh, appropriated for ADA improvements over the last year. Um, and we have about uh, just under a million dollars of projects uh, that are currently assigned to our in-house construction team um, that we believe are, are just about ready to go and we're, we're prepared to deliver this year. Um, with that said, uh, they are funds that have not yet been spent, uh, and and if we determined that it was appropriate to repurpose those, we, we could. Um, this is the primary funding source where our in-house construction crew uh, is funded from. And so we did a, a separate this from the fourth tier because it does directly relate to uh, individual positions that we would need to find other work for them to do if, the, if these funds were removed. Um, from this program. This is distinct and different from the uh, last ADA project that we discussed for fiscal year 2021. Those are new funds. These are funds currently existing uh, within, pro within these projects uh, in, our, in our capital system. Uh, next slide. And then in tier four, these are funds that tend to be uh, uh, immediately available or um, projects that we have found um, suspended or uh, on long-term hold. So uh, we labeled this one immediately available. These were hazard mitigation grant projects that we came to and received approval from council to appropriate funds, uh, hoping that we would be successful in receiving these grants. Um, we were unsuccessful uh, with these and therefore Council can recover this eight hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars without any questions in an effort to repurpose those for other uses. Um, and even though we have full intention of looking after these projects in the future uh, and hoping we can be successful with some other grant program, at this point in time, uh, these funds are are not being utilized. Next slide. And then this last program or this last uh, slide, as I mentioned, is, is projects that, that currently have no activity or no activity immediately pending. I talked about the Fire Station 5 component. We have set aside $1.5 million that, we've, that we believe were going to be necessary for design. Um, given, the time, given the timeline and the fact that we probably won't be getting into design for another 12 to, 12 to 18 months, um, it's not necessarily required for us to have that $1.5 million in the account right now. However, when we get to that point, um, we will be lobbying or requesting the council identify funds moving forward so that we can keep that project on track. You'll see that there are other uh, projects in here, the temporary fire station, there are some leftover funds from the reconstruction uh, or the placement of the temporary fire station at the Parker Hill site. Um, 
fire, the fire department has requested that we make some additional modifications out there. So um, we were intending to use these funds. However, um, if, if we have another uh, use for these, then we thought that this would be appropriate to, to place in this tier or this category. The other projects that you'll see uh, listed here are projects that um, are annual requests. Uh, things that uh, we don't have any specific project associated with it, such as the ped safety project or the pre-design. Um, these are things that, that we've, we've utilized to address requests that come up on an annual basis. And then there's the facilities infrastructure. Um, council provided $3 million uh, in this last year to begin making facility improvements. Um, we have utilized some of those funds to begin uh, advancing certain projects. Our intent was to hold the remaining as we did this comprehensive um, energy audit so that we could do a strategic investment so that we made sure that we were utilizing these to the best of our abilities. However, at this point, we don't have that audit complete. Uh, the funds are sitting there and um, it seems appropriate at this point in time that if council needed to repurpose those for another uh, reason, um, that they would be available for for those purposes, and uh, the tier the tier four total is about five point three million dollars that the that council would that we believe from a capital program that council could recover uh, immediately and reinvest as needed. And that uh, concludes uh, my presentation on the capital improvement program. Thank you for that presentation, Jason. So in addition to questions, do you, do you want any additional feedback from council uh, specifically regarding any tier four projects or what, what feedback, if any, would you like from council or do you just want to hear any questions? I, I really would like to hear feedback uh, relating to all of the tiers in addition to questions. If there's specific areas that council believes we need to take a deeper look at or they'd like more information for us to uh, for us to return with more information. So, um, so so I'm going to assert the city manager also is is we're looking very closely at tier three and tier four projects to bring back to council uh, to provide more uh, flexibility in the reserve. So if there's what between now and today, there may be some questions on tier three and tier four, but the intent is to bring back in the July in the June. Um, uh, uh, public hearing and propose defunding some of those projects. So there is, uh, uh, so that we have more in our reserves to get us into the to the next fiscal year. So I, I, I think we really want to know if there's anything on that tier three and tier four list that council's concerned about. Um, there'll be opportunity at the public hearing to comment on them, um, but we're looking for feedback on all the tiers, but specifically tiers three and tier four. Okay, thank you, Sean and Jason, for those clarifications. I'm just going to go through council then uh, and ask for your opinions and feedback. I'll just go with where I see the squares. Mr. Dowd, you're up first. Um, I, I'm glad that you're looking at it that way on those tier three, tier four, without picking out any one particular project, but the fact that <clears throat> They, they may be the funds there that they could be brought in to help us uh, with a little safety net of uh, reserves. So uh, I certainly support that analysis being made. Okay, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So first, Jason, if I could ask uh, a couple of questions. Certainly. Um, so specifically on slide 110, for the tier three, the accessibility projects. Can yes. You, can you give the council uh, a little bit more information around the terms of that settlement? Was it based on a uh, expected completion date of these projects or was it based on, and I, and I seem to remember this is the case, that it was based on an amount that we would spend per year until we completed these projects and came up to speed. Uh, but I think that that'd be helpful for us to understand. Yeah, so the, the settlement of the, of, the, of the case, actually, we concluded um, all of the specific requirements to um, complete that. Uh, there were a list of capital improvements that needed to be finished by around 
um, I want to say it was uh, 2014, uh, and I think we did complete all of those. Um, it also required that we develop a transition plan. Uh, that transition plan needed to have a comprehensive evaluation of um, work that needed to bring all of our facilities into compliance. Uh, and we did complete that transition plan. Um, and then uh, we have, at council's request, uh, established a, an annual allocation to deliver that transition plan. And that's why every year you've seen a request of $1.2 million specifically set aside for that. Um, that was not specifically outlined in the settlement agreement. Um, but it is something that council had determined at that point in time was a necessity in order to uh, come into compliance and deliver that transition plan. Okay, so it's it's not a regulatory or legal requirement on how much we spend. It's been more council practice around how much we put forward to this, uh, similar to what we we started talking about and doing last year with deferred maintenance on our buildings, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I would I would just I, I think that that's part of the reason though in the early part of the presentation there are projects that are dedicated to meeting the terms and the tradition of that am I incorrect Jason but those are no you are absolutely correct um, that's why the million dollars that you see here on slide uh, 110 for tier three that's that's the fiscal year 1920 allocation of that 1.2 million dollars and then that's why I broke out. Uh, for the current fiscal year, all of the projects we were intending to deliver with the $1.2 million for fiscal year 2021. All right, All right on uh, slide 111, the tier four, the immediate availability, uh, can you walk us through, uh, you know, I remember uh, bits and pieces of each of these projects coming forward. And can you walk us through which ones like the chipper program that uh, were a, we'd love to do this, but they're not critical versus the, which ones do we absolutely have to do uh, right now? Or let me rephrase, not right now. Which ones do we absolutely feel like we have to do uh, and uh, would want to fund, even if we had known at the beginning that it would be de denied the funding for the hazard mitigation grant? I, uh, wow. Um... I think the, the the chipper program is one that that fire department is actively is actively working on in other with other program with other financial programs. Um, all, all, we'll just say all, all of these are things that we feel are important. They're consistent with our hazard with our local hazard mitigation plan. Um, they're they're items that we are responsible for ensuring uh, completion at some point in time. Um, do I believe that we need to fund these right now? No. Um, if we were successful at leveraging the little bit of money that we had in here with federal or state dollars, then I would absolutely say we should be keeping that money in place. But the fact that we don't have any other outside funding source to assist us with completing these projects, I think at this point in time, we'll continue to look for other opportunities with all of these. Um, but right now, this $830,000 is not necessary to hang on to right now uh, at this point in time. Okay. Then last but, but, but let me let me ask a question, council member. I think it's a valid question. We have lots of needs within the organization. Uh, I, I, I would be comfortable going back, and you heard some of the challenges that we're potentially facing. Uh, you'll hear some more weed abatement uh, questions uh, finishing. Uh, the the community wildfire protection plan, we could look at those particular items, look at this resource and say, this is some priority alternatives instead of just turning back to the reserves. If that's the direction, we're happy to, to pursue that. I mean, I think these are these are projects that are happening based on a federal application, but there may be some direct immediate needs that we need to address uh, going into next season that would make us all feel better. So we're happy to do that for the July, for the June uh, public hearing. If that's what, what the question is, we can look at these defunded projects, these unsuccessful grants and come back with alternative proposals uh, to address some of our ongoing needs. Yeah, I mean, and specifically you mentioned uh, some of the weed abatement work that's being done. 
obviously that's something that uh, most of us would be supportive of continuing to push forward with, even if we don't have the reimbursements from FEMA. But I know that we have also submitted projects for FEMA reimbursement uh, that we would not necessarily pursue right now sh should that funding source not be available. So that's that's sort of what I'm asking uh, about these. We're, we're, ha we're happy to analyze this and bring it back in the in the in the June hearing and say this is alternative plans for consideration. Okay. Yeah. And then and, uh, and you'll see council member, you'll see one of these is already incorporated the storm drain master plan where the intention right yeah. now since we were unsuccessful here is to utilize uh, storm drain fees. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one of the listed items earlier in the presentation that we've decided to move into that space. Right. Okay, last question uh, on this list uh, for me is on slide 106 in the tier one, the traffic signal backup, uh, power, battery backup power. Uh, it says project, project incomplete, but it's reimbursable. Um, is this specifically to aid us during PSPSs uh, when those traffic signals go go out? Is it on the emergency side or is this an ongoing issue uh, with specific uh, locations around the city? So the installation of battery backups at traffic signals is just simply a best practice at this point, um, especially on high volume corridors. Uh, it does provide us with a benefit for the PSPS events. Uh, and those are the signals that we're, that we're installing first with an effort to try to get those in place before this season comes about. Um, but we do have uh, instances where we see power outages uh, or power interruptions and the four to 10 hours of additional operational time that the battery backup gives us is a substantial benefit to allowing our community to feel comfortable, safe, and to help um, evacuations occur as needed. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I, uh, just for my feedback, uh, I think you've got a good classification here. To me, the regulatory compliance section of tier one uh, is uh, actually the real tier one because those are the things that we have to do to stay within compliance. And, and so some of the other things that we can sort of wiggle around if we really needed to uh, are secondary to me but I get it for all, for all of the tier ones. Uh, I do think uh, we have a discussion about the tier three and the tier fours. Uh, overall, I think that the tier fours, uh, if they can wait, or if we can try to identify different grant funding sources, uh, that's a, a better route for us to go than to program it, uh, particularly in light of the uh, our uh, challenges around understanding what our budget is going to look like six months from now. Um, and so I'm, I'm uh, I think that you've got it right how you're trying to do this here. All right, Mr. Tibbetts, you're next up. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, um, what I'm looking at here, I really like and appreciate, Jason, and I echo what uh, my colleague, Councilman Rogers, says on, on focusing on your Tier 1 priorities and, and the Tier 4s uh, to maybe wait until we can identify additional funding. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Merritt. I will also want to echo my appreciation for the way this is set up. It's a really great model. I think it's, it's really clear, easy to understand. Um, can I also, did I hear the city manager say, Sean, that we will be reviewing three and four um, subsequent to this, to this overview? So, so the intent is to get, if there's some specific direction right now, council member, uh, but I wanted to tell you what we're going to be doing is bringing back three or four and presenting options to council. Um, and, and if there was any input right now, we wanted to make sure we received that input and took that into our consideration as we go through that. Um, I also will say that we will be trying to, on the tier one FEMA projects, give a better event horizon for those projects to understand um, uh, in the next iteration, uh, how and when may these reimbursements become available to the city. Uh, but that's, you see a lot of those projects are in design phase. They're not even in the ground yet. So, yeah. so but we're still, this is still a work in progress, um, but, uh, but, but we're, we're committed to bringing back those tier three and four projects in the public hearing uh, with options that the council could consider. Okay. 
Thank you. I appreciate that because that, that could be quite a, um, depending, it could be quite a conversation. Um, I do have one simple question on slide nine. Um, Burbank Gardens is a pet um, uh, site for me. And I'm curious, is CAP another name for, uh, for roofing material? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. It's a technical just, name for roof. It's just the funny way that it, that they described the project. Okay. And it, and it says design, the contra design contract awarded. Any sense of when that design might actually come to fruition? So they, we just awarded that contract, I, I believe, uh, within the last six weeks. And okay. so um, they are just now starting to gear up to begin the work. And this is just this is just a roofing material, is it not, or is there actual construction that has to take place as well? Because it looks like an expensive roof. So it's it it's because it's a unique it's a unique product that they used, and we're trying to be historically accurate. Um, it is predominantly the roofing material. However, if because new products have to be utilized, it changes some component of the structure, then that'll be incorporated. I appreciate that. We wouldn't want to lose our historic status because of the putting in the wrong material up there. So I, I appreciate that sensitivity. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Mr. Olivares. Thank you, Mayor. I have nothing more to add. I, I like what we have right now related to our priorities that have to get done. And I look forward to the discussion later on on some of the opportunities we may have uh, next month. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Fleming. I thank you, uh, Assistant City Manager Nutt, for this comprehensive overview. I do have some questions around the Tier 4 um, stuff, primarily because it disproportionately affects um, District 4 and probably Districts 2 and 3 as well. Um, and just some curiosity around um, the chipper program, the wildfire early detection, and um, the storm drain. Well, I guess I'll focus in on the fire stuff. Um, is are either of these things things that regardless of funding that you believe would pose significant hazard or uh, damage to our city if we don't do them so the wild or the the chipper program is one that that uh, we've been talking quite a bit about with the fire department they are they are actively trying to ensure that we have a program this year uh, they would like to get additional funding to expand that program, to provide more outreach, to, to, to be more present. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, you know, right now we don't have that additional funding source, uh, but that is something they're actively working on. And I think you'll hear um, uh, Chief Gosner at some point here in the near future talk about the, the type of programs that they're looking at for fire season. Because um, okay. I do believe that they've got one in place that they're, that they're getting ready. Uh, the wildfire early detection... Um, I think our urgency on that one, and, and, I, and I don't want to speak for Tony per se, um, but uh, I think our urgency on that one is somewhat decreased because our partners have been so successful at, at receiving funding and deploying products, whether it's cameras or other that we've been able to, that we're able to utilize for our benefit. Uh, I see the city manager. So I, I'm just going to continue the, the theme of what I said before, which is if, if that's the question, we absolutely can take it back and run it through that lens, Council Member, uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, and come back in the, in the June scenario and, and present that uh, as the analysis. That's exactly the direction we're looking for. I, I hear and appreciate the, the flexibility and that this is um, a work in progress. And so uh, Definitely not going at it from a, a perspective like this is a done deal or um, that you're not thinking about the fire fire season. I will say that I, you know, on a daily basis, the amount of fire concern emails that I'm getting grows and grows and grows. And, you know, it's I'm starting to learn that it's, you know, a, 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 a wave that comes and there's a lot of anxiety, but I don't see that going away anytime soon. And I think that staff and the council has learned that I, I like to look at these things from also, and I get that we don't have money, but also what the cost of not doing it is. And so, you know, $250,000 is a lot of money when you don't have it. But as we know from the Tug Fire and other events that it's a heck of a lot of small change when you look at the cost of, of an actual wildfire. Um, so I appreciate you coming back with that. I also, you know, on behalf of families wanted to 
check in with you around um, the the two um, items on uh, slide 112, the Neighborhood Streets Initiative and the School Pet Safety Project that say they're both complaint responses. Can you describe the nature of those complaints that initiated the inception of, of those projects or starting to think about them? Uh, these items have been, these projects have been uh, on our books for, for many, many years. Um, and we utilize them as a, as sort of a placeholder that uh, we put money into when we get the opportunity to be able to respond to complaints that come up. For example, um, we, uh, when we had um, the concerns about pedestrian safety on Franklin Avenue, it started, it started with one of these as an investigation. And then, so we utilize these funds and then it spun into a, an individualized project of its own. Uh, so, so to be clear, these are not, um, funds that are on hold in response to particular concerns in the community. They're, they're funds that are waiting to respond. Correct. These are funds we would utilize to pay for us and our ability to respond in, initially to a request. Okay. And then, um, so that's very helpful to know. Thank you. The last question I have is around um, fire station number five. And just trying to, I know that this has been something that's really important. And I know that my residents in Fountain Grove are, anxious to have a fire station, fully functional um, actual fire station. And I'm sure that our firefighters are also really looking forward to having that. I'm wondering if you could um, describe a little bit um, what, what is going on with the additional site modification um, uh, for Kemp's fire station number five. Yeah, so the right now the uh, fire department has a um, mobile, uh, a mobile foot building that they're utilizing as the station itself. And then they have a fabric structure as uh, their apparatus bay. Uh, and they've asked for something more permanent than the fabric structure on the apparatus bay. So they'd like to see more of a carport, um, stick built carport. Uh, and uh, we, it's, it's a fairly new request. So we've just started to evaluate and then we got put on hold because of, of COVID. So um, it's not something we've really had a lot of time to, to spend looking at this. Um, I'm sure the fire department has, has, uh, has something in mind that they would like to see, uh, and we'll continue to work forward with them on what we could do at that location. Yeah, and I'm sure um, you can understand my concern over fire station number five and that sometime in the future, it'd be great to sit down with you and the chief and the city manager and discuss uh, where we are in terms of working with FEMA or not working with FEMA and what we can do if uh, we are not ultimately successful in those efforts to assure the um, safety of both our firefighters and our residents in that area. So I appreciate that this is not something that's going to happen right now and doesn't seem prudent to happen right now, but that it is something of great concern. And those are all of my questions. Thank you. Be happy to talk with you further about station time. Thank you, Mr. Nutt. Thanks. Great, thank you. And Jason, I have one question, then some comments. Um, regarding on slide 106, the Sam Jones Hall roof, does that also include the modifications we were going to be making to be uh, separating some of the different um, dorm areas for a more vulnerable population? So if you recall, we, we asked the council to increase the contingency fairly significantly because of the unknowns relating to ADA compliance or structural deficiency at the site. Um, we didn't find any of those. And so some of those funds that, that um, could be used uh, to make some of those interior improvements and, and could, is likely going to go back to housing and community services for repurposing. Um, the way uh, housing and community services phrased it was, uh, we ultimately would like to use those funds to do this interior work, but the roof is the far more important. So we're going to delegate it that way first. So, so to answer your question more simply, the answer is yes. Those could be utilized for those interior improvements. But again, this 813K was just for the roof, not for the funds allocated for the redesign of the interior of the building. So, so this included all of the additional contingency that we had requested from council. And that, and that cut into the component of funds that we had set aside to do the interior improvements. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then um, just feedback for me, I, I too am uh, appreciative of these different tiers prioritizing it. So for me, just on a higher level, um, tier three um, projects, I would say take a 20% cut off of that. 
can come back to council with and see what that would look like. And on tier four, I really think all those still need to be on um, the table until we get more information on the budget. And what would be helpful for me is on all the tier four projects, is there any possible alternative funding source or is it just the CIP budget? That'd be very helpful for me because obviously um, the city's anticipating some funding um, in the near future outside of the general fund that may be applicable for those projects. So that would be helpful for me if I could see the breakdown uh, specifically those that the only way this project would be paid for would be out of our CIP budget. We'd be happy to make those make those modifications. Okay, great. Uh, last opportunity, Council, any questions or feedback for Mr. Knight? Seeing none, uh, concluding comments, Mr. City Manager. Uh, now, I just want to thank the Council for uh, sitting through this uh, this long presentation, uh, but abbreviated, believe it or not, presentation from prior years. Um, really, thank you for the input. Uh, thank the team for the information they've provided. Um, just want to quickly switch to 115, uh, slide 115. It is uh, the, the challenge that we find ourselves in uh, is, is as the proposed budget stands, um, it would do, uh, it would diminish our unassigned reserves significantly. We're taking that very seriously. And as if we can go to 116, uh, right now we're, we do have a hiring freeze. We're going through a process to, as I said, to evaluate certain positions uh, to help us uh, advance against some of the challenges that were outlined by the team. And we're taking public safety, advancing economic recovery and um, uh, uh, regulatory compliance as, as the ways to uh, evaluate and uh, release positions to be filled. Um, we're still looking at the budget. Um, uh, there are two programs that we may have a deeper conversation about um, in, in the June public hearing. We're still looking at conferences and training and we're, we're looking at the community promotions budget. Uh, I'm not saying we're gonna propose it, but those are the places we are, we're taking another look at it. And as a, we'll, we'll bring back some proposals around the CIP based on the feedback today. And then in the next six to 12 months, uh, you know, there's some important conversations that we're gonna need to have, which are in September, uh, we'll have a better idea of actually where we sit because uh, year end will have happened and we'll been able to close and analyze uh, the year end uh, position that we face. We'll have a better fidelity on our, our revenue forecasts, and hopefully uh, we'll have something to report about um, future relief acts to help us through the next uh, two to three years. Um, at the same time, uh, we'll, we'll have brought back to council and uh, we're, we're in the process of going through as, as uh, the interim um, uh, CFO stated, Alan Alton, we're evaluating uh, some sales tax measures uh, to bring that information back to council um, for consideration in the July uh, time, per time period uh, and see if there's any desire to be part of the general election scheme. But that, that concludes the staff's presentation. And I just wanna thank a, a really great team effort um, from, from the, the group I get to work with. And thank you for your questions and consideration, council members. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, I too wanna to thank the staff for that presentation. It's been very thorough and complete. Before we go to public comment, I one more opportunity for council. Any final comments or questions for staff? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to bring up here is that when you look at slide 15, you know I, I can tell that austerity is definitely the message um, that the council needs to take heed of and probably the public. But but one of the, my question is also a little bit of a comment and that is to the effect of when we do these budgets, uh, we make predictions about the future. We, we predict uh, what our expenses are gonna be based on knowns from our various departments, but also we make predictions about what uh, is going to happen vis-a-vis -vis economic recession and incomes that come from different uh, taxation sources and fee-based revenue sources. The one, I guess one of my only concerns though, is that um, one thing that we're not talking about is the potentiality. And I use that word carefully of the PG&E settlement funds. Um, and on the one hand, it's very much like the predictions that we're making about our expenditures. So I'm curious why we're choosing not to also make a prediction about that potential revenue source. 
Uh, we can only make predictions about the, the resources we have in hand. I'm sure the city attorney can uh, elaborate that. I mean, uh, beyond that, but, but for accounting purposes, uh, we have not received the final determination nor the cash uh, that would be connected to that. At that point, there would be potentially a realignment. Uh, we're, we're in uncharted territory as it relates to that. We're uncharted territory as it relates to the pandemic. Uh, that's why I suspect during the course of the year, council member, we will be back in front of you, not just on September 15th, but um, if that comes to pass, we'll be coming right back to the council and saying, uh, what do you wanna do uh, with, with this particular resource that is now uh, officially part of the city's consideration? Yeah, thank you, Sean. I, I and I, I do appreciate that that analysis. I just wanted to air that out there for the public's benefit because although that the outlook right now looks bleak, 1.1 million when we are uh, done with the possibly de depleting our our uh, our unassigned reserves. Um, not to mention, we do need to probably discuss with the hiring freeze and its impact on the budget further. But I think it's just important that the public also knows about the the possibility of what the future could hold that looks a lot different from this. Madam City Attorney, I see you're muted. Did you wanna make any comments on that? Uh, I think that the city manager covered it well. Um, these are funds that are not yet uh, secured. Um, the, they are subject to bankruptcy court approval. Uh, that hearing has not yet begun. Um, so at this point, uh, there is nothing that we can uh, count on or include in our budget. Uh, if this comes through, we will, if the bankruptcy court approves it, we will then see when is the effective date. We will then see when, uh, when, uh, if we're gonna receive any monies, when we might see them. And at that point, uh, it would be appropriate to come back to council and discuss uh, the amount of the funds and how they might be uh, allocated. Uh, but uh, to, to address any of that now would be very premature. Thank you for that. You. Mr. Tibbetts, were you done or do you have more? Or talk? I'm Come done, in. thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to everybody for the, the presentation. I think it really helps with our understanding of where we're at. Uh, I do know that there's a lot of work still to be done. And I know if we were to come out of uh, budget season telling the public that we were exhausting our reserves again after we have uh, worked so hard to claw them back. I, I think that there would be real heartburn around our ability to deliver the services that we've been able to do to make investments in our community to help them to recover in the past. And so I'm, I'm looking at it. Uh, if we were to uh, eliminate the, the tier fours, move that direction, it bumps up our, our potential reserves to about 3.5% of our general fund, far below the 15%. I'm also looking at uh, the potential 5 million in savings from the, uh, from the uh, hiring freeze, which would bump it up to 6.36%, uh, still below the 15%. Uh, I'm still curious around potential reimbursements from FEMA, and I heard the commitment from the city manager to get me what that figure looks like for projects that have been approved for reimbursement from FEMA where we have already fronted the dollars because I think that that's a source for some money. Um, Sean, I guess this is a question. Uh, have we realized any reimbursements from the state related to PSPSs? Related to PSPSs? Yeah. Uh, we, we, I mean, again, it's gonna depend on how you're defining that. We did get some uh, some reimbursement for some of our public safety uh, investments. We'll, we'll give you, we'll, we'll lay that out. But yes, there have been some reimbursements, but it's not full reimbursement by any stretch of imagination, but we'll, we'll provide that detail. Yeah, and I think uh, going forward uh, for, for folks who weren't watching the meeting at noon when we started this, I think that the way to look at our reserves is to subtract up to $1.5 million from our reserves and assume that that is money that has to go towards addressing PSPSs or other emergencies. Uh, and, I, and again, for the edification of the public, if we budget it, our 
very tricky and complicated situation. And I think for the council's perspective, if we come out of June with only a million dollars projected in our reserves and understand that we might have a $1.5 million event happen again, we're doing our community a disservice. So I know we've got a lot more work to do and thank you for everything that, that folks have done so far, but I think, uh, I think June is gonna be a really difficult conversation for the council, uh, whether or not that pg and &E money comes in. Great, thank you. Okay, those are the only hands I saw raised. Um, so as we go into public comment, uh, first if I could ask council members, um, I need to make sure we continue to have a quorum. So if you turn off your video, I can't tell if you're there. So if you do need to take a break or turn off your camera, make sure there's at least four of us here so that we can continue on the meeting. So with that, um, I am gonna open the public comment. Uh, we're now taking public comments on items 3.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial nine to raise your hand. You'll have three minutes for your comment. And now, uh, Dina, I think you will provide a little bit more information about this process. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, thank you. Um, a countdown timer is going to appear before uh, the audience via Zoom for the convenience of the speaker and the viewers. This first speaker will be acknowledged and invited to speak. When the countdown begins, please make sure to unmute yourself, um, members of the public, when you are invited to do so. And your microphone will be muted at the end of your statement or comment or at the end of your the countdown. The first public commenter will be Susan Hammond, followed by Thea Hensel. Susan, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? All right, hello. Hi, um, your yes. camera starts now. Okay, I am um, Susan Hammond, uh, and I'm representing the Indivisible Sonoma County. Uh, I'm on their advisory uh, board, and um, what I wanna talk about today and bring up is that we feel very strongly uh, that this, the city needs to adopt measures to close these loopholes that we're seeing in the fe federal's uh, program, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. And in, in specific, what we would like is to have an approval of a 14 day emergency paid sick leave for all Santa Rosa um, workers uh, that are not covered by the federal mandate. And let me just uh, go through, if you're not aware, that the federal program um, only covers employees that work for firms under 500 employees. You can imagine the number of companies that are outside of this for instance, McDonald's, um, Marriott, Exxon, Chase. Um, there's a, a huge number of employees that are not covered by this. And in fact, the other area that is not covered are um, firms that employ less than 50 employees. They are allowed, these firms are allowed to actually um, get a hardship exemption and often do. Therefore, um, when we look at the number of people that actually do have access to the federal government's program, uh, we're seeing that only 20% of the entire workforce is covered. And therefore, essentially, we are finding 80% of our community does not have this kind of coverage. And most of these workers are in the um, lower levels of the income brackets. And they are often in areas of um, employment that serve uh, service conditions so that they see a lot of community members in their daily business. Um, this leaves a huge concern, not only that those people are not getting adequate um, safety for their themselves and their families, but also for our community. Um, I hope that the uh, city will take up and 
consider uh, joining other communities such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Jose to cover these um, uh, gaps and allow these other workers to get coverage. Thank you. We are moving on to Thea Hensel, followed by M. Bennett. Thea, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic. Can you hear me? Thank you, Thea. You are live. Your comment period starts now. Thank you. I appreciate all the work you've done. It's been very informative this afternoon. I am Thea Hensel, who's co-chair of the Southeast Greenway campaign. And I have wanted to ask you if you would consider putting us back into the tiered level so we can get staff time to continue working on the Greenway process. We are in the midst of the acquisition phase of this process. And I would hate to see it tabled at this point in time because we're making a lot of progress and it would be an opportune time for us to push this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thea. The next speaker will be M. Bennett, followed by Courtney Mulroy. Hi, am I there? You are there. One moment, let me reset your timer. Okay, M. Bennett, please identify yourself for public record if you choose to do so, and your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marty Bennett, and I'm representing the Union Unite Here Local 2850. Um, we are requesting that the City Council adopt an ordinance to provide all workers employed two hours a week in the city, 14 days or 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave. San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Long Beach, Los Angeles have approved emergency paid sick leave and other California cities will do so soon. As mentioned, the federal first Coronavirus Response Act enacted in March to address the pandemic does provide 14 days paid sick leave for workers who have virus symptoms or are subject to a quarantine or isolation order or must care for affected family members or children whose school is closed. But that legislation contains giant loopholes. Companies with more than 500 workers are exempted as a consequence. The New York Times estimates only 20% of the entire workforce is eligible. Sonoma County's emergency shelter in place strategy simply cannot succeed without emergency paid sick leave. Most essential frontline service workers cannot work from home and experience high levels of contact with the public daily. Home care, nursing home, health care, child care, janitorial, pharmacy, transit related, grocery, food service, warehouse and delivery workers constantly risk exposure to COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, which they can pass on to other workers, their families, customers and patients. Sadly, most essential services workers don't earn a living wage, which in Sonoma County is about $23 an hour for two parents, each working full time to support two children and to pay for basic necessities. The Economic Policy Institute reports that only 30% of the lowest paid workers receive paid sick leave beyond the three days mandated by the state. And as I've suggested, these workers are the least likely to work from home. Low wage essential service workers cannot afford to stay home without pay. No worker should be forced to choose between working when sick and taking unpaid sick days. To, clo to close the federal legislation loopholes, the, San the city of Santa Rosa should approve as soon as possible 14 days or 80 hours emergency paid sick leave for all workers. Thank you. Mr. Bennett, the next public comment is from Courtney Mulroy, followed by Laura Nish. 
Courtney, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Great, thank you. Thank you, your time starts now. All right, good afternoon. My name is Courtney Mulroy. I am a clinical quality consultant and public health worker here in Santa Rosa. I am here to represent the physicians and nurses of each piece. Um, with businesses opening up, we believe it's imperative that we ensure the protection for our workers as the virus continues to spread, now more than ever as a matter of public health. We ask that you all bring a paid sick leave ordinance to the council meeting for a discussion and vote as soon as possible. We believe providing at least 14 days of paid sick leave is critical for any reopening and will limit how many people with illness will go to work and further spread the virus. I urge the council to consider bringing this ordinance to the agenda and vote as soon as possible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, the next public comment will be from Laura Nish. Laura, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute yourself? Got it. Perfect. So I'm Laura Nish, I'm the executive director of 350 Bay Area and on the steering committee for 350 Sonoma. And I uh, want to thank you all very much for making it possible uh, for us to very easily get our comments included and for your hard work, once again, facing a major crisis in the county. Um, we join Marty Bennett, North Bay Jobs with Justice, the Alliance for Just Recovery and other groups in asking for a 14-day sick leave policy and also no delay of the uh, minimum wage increase. So this just seems like a respectful way to treat the workers that are low paid and also considered essential. Now, I think we need to treat them as, as if they're essential and protect their health. Uh, also, the paid sick leave policy, as noted by others, protects public health in general in the county. Uh, so it really does protect us all. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Mayor, I do not see any additional live public comments. Therefore, we can move on to the recorded public comments we received earlier this week. Dwayne DeWitt, study session 3.1. This is the time for fiscal restraint. It's really important that the city tighten its budget tighten its belt and be ready for, ready for tighter times ahead of us. The situation will not be getting better. I do not believe that the federal government or the state government is going to be able to backfill any of the revenues that have been lost by the city. So now is the time to start thinking about making sure for the next couple of years you have perhaps a wage freeze, perhaps cutting of some positions especially in the mid-management to upper-management, big-dollar situations. Also, it would be nice if you folks would make this information available on the bulletin boards at City Hall because libraries are closed. Many people aren't able to use the Internet. Many people don't have it at home. And essentially, these online virtual meetings that you were doing are cutting out a specific a large group of people from being able to be involved. It would be best if you could at least put the presentations up in front of City Hall so that the public can see them before you act on any of this. Thank you. That concludes the voice message public comments. And we'll turn it over to City Clerk Stephanie Williams for the email and e-comment readings. Yes, I'll now read the emails um, received in cc-comment at srcity.org and any e-comments received for item 3.1. Um, if you've already spoken on item 3.1 through live Zoom, um, your e-comment or voicemail um, pre-recorded comment will not be replayed. So um, starting with a duplicate email received from Alex Shore, Daniel Jenkins, Tony Saunders, Renee Riggs, and Bo Simons. 
I support your continued allocation of $150,000 for the operation of the Roseland Library branch and the prioritization of capital improvement front funds from the PG&E settlement towards the building of a permanent Roseland Community Library. A full service library in Roseland will feature bilingual librarians embedded in the community and committed to success. Services will include partnerships with local schools and community organizations that support educational attainment, literacy, and civic involvement, access to reliable and accurate information and resources digitally and in person, job training, career coaching, and workforce development, computer literacy training, and one-on-one -on -one tech assistance, free high-speed internet and access to technology, a valuable place for community gatherings and meetings. Your support for the library will address the long-term commitment made to our newest neighborhood to build infrastructure and achieve equity with the rest of our city. Thank you for your consideration to this request. Comment received from Gail Alas. I am requesting your continued allocation of $150,000 for the operation of the recruit of the current Roseland Library branch. I also implore the prioritization of capital improvement funds from the PG&E settlement towards the building of a permanent Roseland Community Library. As a former superintendent of the Roseland School District, I fully understand the needs of our students and their families. These needs could be met in good measure by a Roseland Community Library. Our students have proven their abilities and rank as one of the highest high school graduation and entrance to college statistics in the country. As a community, we must show our support for these hardworking students and their families. Roseland families deserve a library. Thank you for your consideration. Comment received from Catherine Martin. I'm a retired librarian who worked for the Sonoma County Library for over 25 years. Even in the 70s, there was talk of someday building a library to serve Roseland. So you can imagine how happy I was to see the current temporary branch. I live in Roseland and have looked forward to having the branch even closer to my house in its new temporary location. But I'm now discouraged to learn that there is some question about continuing the allocation for it. As a librarian, I can attest to the importance of this facility in the community, which needs it so much. I have watched attendance at Spanish language programs and see how much they were appreciated. I was a volunteer to set up the current facility and was excited to see such a good collection of Spanish language items. I had worked in the Hillsburg branch and I know that this branch had a much better collection than that one. I am grateful that people who have no computer access in their homes because of their low incomes can use the library to, to keep up with classes and government forms and reports, as we see now, especially with shelter at home. It's time, it's time, go give our community the facilities it needs. Roseland has waited long, a long time for equal library service. Please don't take it away. comment received from Cynthia Denenholtz. I am commenting, I strong, I'm sorry, I strongly support your continued allocation of $150,000 for the operation of the Roseland Library branch. I also fully support the prioritization of capital improvement funds from the PG&E settlement towards the building of a permanent Roseland Community Library. Your support for the Roseland Library will help deliver the city's commitment to build infrastructure and achieve equality with other Santa Rosa neighborhoods. A full service library with bilingual staff and connections to local schools and community organizations is essential to the true integration of Roseland into the city of Santa Rosa. Comment received from Chandler Jordana. 
I am emailing you today on behalf of the Secure Families Collaboration Collaborative in support of your plan to continue the Secure Families Fund contract in the amount of $50,000. Thank you for this invaluable backing of Santa Rosa's immigrant community. In a Press Democrat article published on May 12, 2020, it was identified that Latino members of Sonoma County and Santa Rosa are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 at an alarming infection rate, one that is 450% higher than their white counterparts. Although the Secure Families Collaborative assists immigrants from all over the world, approximately 98% of our clients identify as Latinos. COVID-19 has only exacerbated this community's struggle, a population that is still recovering from the Tubbs and Kincaid fires, severe flooding in 2019, high costs of housing and indispensable goods, immigration concerns and mental health issues culminating from these multiple stresses. Santa Rosa's immigrant community is vital to the city's sociocultural fabric cultivating a diverse community, community with rich cultural backgrounds. Furthermore, multiple economists and publications, including the Wall Street Journal, have identified immigrants as being key to economic recovery post COVID-19 and after multiple wildfires. It is estimated that one in four Santa Rosa residents are either undocumented or have a household or family member that is. This is why your continued support of the undocumented community is so appreciated and vital at this time, largely because of generous contributions from donors such as the City of Santa Rosa. The collaborative has already provided immigration services to over 500 individuals living in Sonoma County, including affirmative immigration services for 200 cases and complex removal defense for 80 cases. Nearly three quarters of these individuals live in Santa Rosa, representing a significant portion of your constituency serviced from November 2018 to present. With your support, we will continue to provide immigration services reaching nearly 1,000 city immigrants before November 2021. We will also work with our partners to, to disseminate vital information regarding current and relevant topics such as COVID-19 and the DACA Supreme Court decision. Comment received from David and Margaret McPhail. Please support the Roseland Library with your continued allocation of $150,000. It is badly needed in the Roseland community and the library will make Santa Rosa a better city. Thank you. Comment received from Ray Hawley on behalf of the um, Library Commission. We are reaching out today to you to urge to continue and expand your commitment to the Roseland Community Library. Specifically, we request that you extend your support for the Roseland Library for $150,000 in fiscal year 2020-2021 and consider allocating $2 million from the forthcoming PG&E settlement as a Roseland Library Capital Fund leadership investment from the City of Santa Rosa. Every public agency in Sonoma County has been impacted financially by COVID-19 pandemic, yet the need for public services grows every week. The Sonoma County Library is no exception. Despite a projected revenue shortfall in the millions, the library's commitment to the Roseland community is stronger than ever. The new temporary location at 470 Sebastopol Road will be in service as soon as we complete our tenant approvements and can open safely following state and county guidelines. We hope that will be later this year. Our lease is through June 2025 and as we explained last year at this time, a $150,000 commitment from the city 
will allow us to cover lease costs so we can designate our funds to building improvements, technology, books, and programming. As we begin to reopen our communities with abundant caution and common sense, a modern library in Roseland will be an extraordinary community resource and support a wide spectrum of Roseland residents and their individual, family, and business needs. The Sonoma County Library is launching a capital campaign to build a permanent community library in Roseland. With an allocation of less than 1% of the settlement funds from PG&E, you have once in a generation opportunity to make a powerful impact on school readiness, workforce development, community equity, and the digital divide. Public facility funding in California is complicated by the loss of redevelopment funds, a series of massive fires, and now the pandemic. The most successful strategy to create a permanent library for the Roseland community is through a community partnership with local government. The library, the philanthropy community, and community organizations all playing a role. Based on what we know about library construction and the economy, we estimate that a permanent Rosenland library will cost approximately $10 million, and we urge Santa Rosa to boost the momentum of this campaign that, conc that concludes emails received um, on item 3.1. All right, thank you for that, Madam City Clerk. Um, any additional final comments on the study session from Council to City Manager? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since so many people were asking about the Sonoma County Secures Families Fund and the Roseland Library, I wanted to just clarify for their sake on slide 16, general fund expenditure highlights 1.3 million. It looks like we are continuing that 150,000 and 50,000 for the secure families fund. Is that correct? That is staff's current proposal, correct. Okay, thank you. And I did want to say thank you too. I noticed this early on in the slide and, and I know that was, those are kind of council initiated programs. So thanks for including those in there. Any other questions or comments from council? And Mr. McGlynn, did you get the information from council that you were seeking? Yes, we did. Thank you. All right. With that, we are going to take another break before we start the regular council meeting. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes or at 540. 10 minutes.
All right, Madam City Clerk, it being 540, I will call this meeting to order. Can we please do a roll call? Yes. Council Member Dowd? Here. Council Member Oliveris? Here. Council Member Rogers? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Tibbetts? Here. Vice Mayor Fleming? Here. Mayor Schwedhelm? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. Okay, so for those just joining us, council members will be keeping their audio on mute unless they are speaking. Uh, and council members can mute themselves. Staff will remain muted until needing to speak. And as members of the public join the meeting, you'll be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and camera will be muted. Only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. If you're calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during the public comments portion of today's agenda, for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to citizen in the last four digits of your phone number. Uh, Madam City Clerk, could you explain the public comments, how they'll be handled during today's meeting? Yes. Um, as each agenda item after it is presented, the mayor will ask for council comments and then open it up for public comment. The host in Zoom will be lowering all hands until the public comment is open for that specific agenda item. Once the mayor has called for public comment, the mayor will announce for the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on the agenda item. If you are calling in to listen to the meeting audibly, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on the public who have raised their hands. Public comment will be limited to three minutes and a timer will appear on the screen for the public and the council to see. All public comments received will be made part of the archive record. All right, thank you for that. Uh, item five on our agenda, Mr. City Manager, could you report on the study session? Nothing to add, add additional. All right, thank you. No proclamation, staff briefings. Item 7.1, Mr. City Manager, do we have a report? Yeah, we have several reports. Uh, first, I'm going to ask uh, for fire recovery build update. Uh, Assistant Fire Marshal uh, Paul Lowenthal. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, Paul Lowenthal, Assistant Fire Marshal with the Fire Department. Um, obviously, following an excessively dry uh, winter and some late season rains, we were asked to discuss briefly the weed abatement and vegetation management programs in process. Um, our original projections for start of this weed abatement season uh, were on track for June 1st. However, uh, we did get a recent update that the season was anticipated to start uh, as early as May 25th. Uh, that fire season is dictated by what information we get from the state. Uh, with that information, uh, we are still on track right now, given the late season rains, to start uh, our inspections and season June 1st. Uh, the ordinance that covers the weed abatement program uh, covers all fire areas within the wildland urban interface. Those are our hillside communities that make up 30% of the city that Chief Gosner spoke about earlier. It also include, includes all of our undeveloped parcels. And our undeveloped parcels are those uh, that currently uh, are across the entire city of Santa Rosa and also those in the rebuild areas. It also includes all other parcels over a half acre of undeveloped land. Uh, inspections will start this year uh, within our burn zone of Fountain Grove and Coffee Park, and we'll move to the remainder of the wildland urban interface. Following that, they'll move across uh, the remainder of the city and do all undeveloped parcels. Um, last year, we conducted approximately 12,000 inspections, uh, several thousand of which were found to be out of the compliance. Uh, following the first inspection that takes place, a reinspection will occur, and eventually, if the property remains out of compliance, the parcel itself will go to abatement. Uh, not only uh, are the city residents and property owners doing their jobs to keep our community safe, the city is also doing its job as well. We have a lot of work that's currently be done by, being done by uh, public works, parks, and the water departments uh, with field services as well as contracts. And this uh, fire department is currently overseeing a contract with SAC. One of the challenges that we prevented, presented with this year is the ability of SAC to actually fulfill all their obligations. 
with the pandemic, uh, the suspension of the courts and the probation uh, program has hampered our ability to do some of our larger, more challenging parcels. Uh, with that, we're actively working on a backup contract, utilizing an existing contract uh, that our parks department has and getting them to uh, potentially jump on those uh, quickly in light of uh, this fire season. Our priorities across the city uh, focus on what we refer to as high, medium, and low. Uh, we prioritize those based on risk to our community and most of our high priority sites are within our wildland interface. And our medium sites are our larger undeveloped parcels, place to play, youth community park, and other parcels around the WUI. And then those move uh, further down the priority list into the lows. Uh, there's a lot of coordination that takes place between the various departments of the city, making sure that we're uh, achieving our goal in anticipation of what could be a busy fire season. As for, excuse me, as for vegetation management, uh, as was discussed earlier by Chief Gosner, uh, we've unfortunately been uns unsuccessful uh, in securing a number of grants, both at the state and federal level. Uh, we've also been denied a number of notice of interests. Uh, we are looking at other options. However, we do not have any additional grants in play. Uh, with the Community Wildfire Protection Plan wrapping up, uh, we are in the process of reviewing the draft and we'll be bringing forth uh, our final plan uh, to council at the end of June as discussed with earlier. Uh, and we'll be looking for different funding opportunities to implement uh, what's discussed under the CWPP as it relates to vegetation management throughout our community. And one last uh, item that we're currently working on to help with vegetation management is we're currently working with uh, the city attorney's office on a ordinance that will relate to dead and dying trees and uh, potential open burning. And that is the end of the report. Thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. Council, any questions for Paul? Seeing none, thank you for that presentation. Mr. McGlynn, 7.2? Yeah, 7.2 is going to come in. Excuse me, 7.2 is going to come in two parts. Uh, the first is by Dave Wine, and it's on the Project Finley update, and then I will be handling the second part. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mayor Schlotham and members of the City Council. So this is an update on our safe social distancing program at Finley. As you know, it's underway. We're in day two, and we have the first 17 occupants arriving uh, yesterday and today, we know that 12 of these 17 are from our underpasses. We're in the process of still doing engagement to see if we can get more to come in this evening. But the council may recall that this is the city's fourth step in our COVID-19 homeless emergency response to protect those experiencing homeless and our greater community from the spread of the disease. And just very quickly, step one was to create proper social distancing at Samuel Jones Hall by relocating our most vulnerable, high-risk individuals to a local hotel. Step two was to partner with our county partners on the placement of portalettes, hand-washing stations, and trash receptacles in or near our known encampments just to try and create better hygiene circumstances. Step three was to identify high-risk unsheltered individuals and place them in a non-congregate shelter or local hotel and now we're in the middle of step four, which is to establish the safe social distancing program area at Finley to invite, and again, it's a voluntary program, lower risk individuals to relocate from known encampments to better create social distancing at, per the guidelines of the disease control, combined with a planned cleanup of those known encampments. And so quickly, just by review, the, the area at Finley was set up last week we conducted a virtual community meeting last Thursday. We have outreach and transportation to the site occurring this week. The site details include tents spaced 12 feet apart, portalettes and hand washing stations. We have our shower trailer restroom set up on site. We established a smoking area where we have three meals coming in per day. And the site is managed by Catholic Charities and security is present 24 seven. So that's a quick review of the Finley Center uh, status. We are in day two of inviting folks in, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you for that presentation, Mr. Wine. Council, any questions about that, Mr. Rogers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So first and foremost, I wanted to, to say thank you, Dave. You've been uh, incredibly responsive, and I thought that the community meeting that happened on Thursday was 
one of the best uh, one of the best forums that I've, I've I've been able to watch, but in particular. Uh, one of the best Zoom forums uh, that we've all been uh, getting used to. So I just want to say hats off to, to you and to your staff. It was a really good uh, presentation, I thought. Um, you and I uh, have been talking for uh, the last couple of weeks where uh, one of the things that uh, the city has developed is a direct line for neighbors who are interested or have an issue uh, around the Finley Community Center. Uh, I was just hoping you could share that number for folks uh, since I haven't seen it, uh, I, I've seen it just from you, but I haven't seen it yet uh, put out there for folks to take care of. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. Yeah, so the city established a direct line just for the Finley Safe Social Distancing Program site. It is area code 707-543-4605, and it's in the process of being included if it hasn't already in our frequently asked questions section of homeless services. Thank you so much. Council, any additional questions? All right, Mr. City Manager, 722. So uh, a couple updates um, and I'll run through them. Get tested for COVID-19. Testing remains a priority as data continues to drive decision-making around a safe reopening of Sonoma County. Testing is available for all Sonoma County residents and appointments can be made online or by phone. Testing for all essential workers, symptomatic individuals over 65 or with an underlying health condition are eligible for testing at the county's drive-through testing site by making an appointment online or by phone. Stay home, save, save lives. Data shows that shelter in place and prevention measures are working in Sonoma County. The longer we stay home and continue with social distancing, wearing a face covering and washing our hands, the quicker we will be able to return to normal. The governor's May 18th announcement and what it means to Santa Rosa. It's anticipated that an update to the uh, Sonoma County shelter in place order will be released this week in response to Governor Newsom's May 18 update, allowing some counties to move more deeply into phase two of the recovery plan for COVID-19. Santa Rosa is hopeful for this opportunity as the county has indicated they are taking steps toward reopening under the state, state's guidance. Reopening the economy is important for Sonoma County and Santa Rosa continues to collaborate with the county as they develop the, a plan for safe reopening in the region. As, as for right now, all, for all of Sonoma County, including Santa Rosa, the latest amended shelter in place health order, which was effective 5, May 15 remains in place. It is anticipated that the county may provide an update to the shelter in place later this week. We know that they're currently work, working to finalize their official variance request and submit it to the state. City parts access. The city of Santa Rosa has park users FAQs posted on the city's COVID-19 website to help clarify park service adjustments based on the latest amendment to the parks closure order. What's open in city parks, basketball courts, bocce ball courts, tennis and pickleball courts, non-motorized boating. What remains closed, playgrounds, sports fields, swimming pools, picnic areas, dog parks, skate parks, barbecue areas, drinking fountains, volleyball, handball and horseshoes courts and the RC and bicycle pump tracks and other gathering and high touch areas. New business resources, the counties, Sonoma County EBD has introduced SoCo Launch, an online portal featuring resources for businesses to safely and successfully reopen in accordance with the latest public health orders. For more information about all these items, please go to srcity.org slash prevent the spread. Residents may also subscribe to a free, receive frequent updates from the city by email or text message by visiting the website. And that concludes the report. Thank you for that report, uh, Mr. McLean. And I also want to compliment you and all of staff, not only on the FAQs for the variety of different websites that the city has, but also for pushing out the uh, now three times a week informational updates. I know almost uh, 70,000 folks are receiving that, but I've received a lot of positive comments about all, A, the content of the information and how appropriate it is to be up, being updated that frequently um, from the city of Santa Rosa. So thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Rogers, questions? A uh, similar comment to what I asked uh, Director Gwine, uh, for the testing services, Mr. McGlynn, do you have the email or the phone number that folks in the public uh, should look at, or excuse me, website 
uh, for folks who want to be tested? We're, we're directing them to the city website and they can launch from there. Um, it's srcity.org slash prevent the spread and everything is on that site. Great, thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Just briefly, I just wanted to report that getting the test is easy, it's fast, they're very well organized. The, the results come back in a couple of days. My negative results came back in a couple of days and they also send confirmation in the mail. So um, to, to, the, to those within the sound of my voice and, and the council, I'm not sure who has been tested or who has not, but it's a very simple process um, and it will help um, uh, help with our numbers with the state and uh, also relieve any, any concerns that you might have about your exposure. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Mr. Dowd. You can do this. Oh, you, you had it. You're still on mute. There you go. It should be all right now. Yep, you're on. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I have a similar report to that of council member uh, Sawyer. I also uh, went in and had my uh, COVID test and I'm, it took me 30 hours to get the return uh, results. And I'm also negative that, I hate it that it works that way because negative sounds bad, but I don't have the COVID virus. <laughs> That's good news, thank you. Any other questions or comments for the city manager? Okay, Madam City Clerk, do we have any public comment on item seven of our agenda? Yes, we have one voicemail recorded comment that will be played now. Dwayne DeWitt, item 7.2, COVID-19 response. The activities that the city has undertaken have essentially been cutting the public out of the decision-making process. An example of this is not just the project at Finley Park where the decisions were made and then the public informed afterwards and said, well, that's just the way it's going to be. One of the things that you've done with these uh, virtual meetings is you have taken out the early notification that you were obligated to do because of the settlement with the Sierra Club in the past where you should be giving the public notice earlier than 72 hours before meetings you're hiding behind the COVID response and saying that, well, you don't have the bandwidth, but you do, you haven't laid off any employees. No one's been furloughed. So you've got the employees to do the work to get the information out to the public in a timely manner as you're required to by that previous settlement. Certainly you can step up and begin to abide by that. You folks should actually try to do something called the 10,000% approach. That's 100% enforcement of your laws and ordinances 100% of the time, especially the ones that apply to you as well as the public. Thank you. That concludes our uh, public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Mr. City Manager, do you have a report for us this evening? No report. Madam City Attorney, any report? Was that a no? Oh, you're still on mute, Sue. I think I know what you're saying. You're still on mute, Sue.
sorry about that. Not uh, there we go. Press the several wrong buttons. So uh, no, I don't have anything else to report. So that was a long ways to a no. Thank you for hanging in Thank there. All right, Council, item nine, uh, statements of abstention by council members. Do we have any of those? See? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, oh, sorry, right. Mr. Mayor, I put my, my uh, hand up. Uh, I will be uh, abstaining from item 12.1 on the consent calendar. Okay, any other abstentions on this agenda? Mayor, um, this is the clerk. Um, Council Member Rogers, can you just state why you're abstaining? I need to note that in the record. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the uh, proposed grant uh, is done in partnership with uh, the organization that I work with. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Seeing no other abstentions. Okay, uh, item 10, mayors and council members report. I'm just gonna go through each of you to see if you have anything to report. Mr. Tibbetts, anything? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have a request tonight for the council's consideration. One of the things that I've been participating in on behalf of the city during COVID-19 is uh, a member of the Community Engagement and Input Task Force. And through this process, um, I've been reaching out to a lot of local stakeholders, uh, chief among them, a lot of small business owners. And one of the prevailing concerns that I uh, have been hearing from them is they, they, there's a desperate need in this community for access to working capital. Um, you know, many people are, do not have access to the payroll protection plan loans. They're having difficulty uh, obtaining them or understanding the application process. And uh, specifically, the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber of Commerce has been seeing a lot of success with the Community Foundation Sonoma County micro grant program. Um, recognizing that we have a, uh, our, a negative financial outlook of our own at this time, um, one thing I was hoping that the council would consider discussion on is uh, looking at a loan program where we could provide funds to our local businesses to help keep the doors open uh, while they would then make payments back at a low interest rate. Um, instead of going into any details, I, my hope is that the council would just be interested in discussing this, and I'm hoping to get a second on that tonight. Second. And uh, well, if I, if I can just get clarification, because I believe it's the same material that was presented to the Economic Development Task Force, and that they were going to be studying that, considering it for a recommendation to the entire council. Is that the same topic that you just now want to bring to the council individually? That's one of them, but the reason why I'm doing that is this was not mentioned as something that the Economic Development Task Force is currently looking at. So I want to bring it to the full council. Okay. So we have a motion that's been seconded. So Mr. City Manager, Madam City Attorney, so we will put it on a future agenda for further discussion to have additional Correct. discussion Correct. on it. Correct. 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 All right, Mr. Tibbetts, you hey. got your motion and second. I appreciate that. I, I do have one more though, and that was um, a, a discussion over an agenda item to have the entire council discuss possible policies uh, relating to COVID-19 and also receive an update from city staff on uh, issues that are being discussed with the Economic Development Subcommittee. Second. Okay. Uh, Madam City Clerk, did you get that second motion? If um, Council Member Kibitz would please repeat it, I got some of it. A discussion on po possible policies related to COVID 19 and. Um, well, it would, it would be discussion of that very thing. One thing that I found is in, in limited conversations within the confines of the Brown Act, it seems that okay. there's, there's council members that do have. Uh, kind of ideas they wish to contribute uh, to staff, but also in a public setting and to, and to the entire council. Um, and I thought it would be beneficial for the city to have an opportunity for the their elected representatives to do that in a public forum. Okay, and then I have that um, council member Rogers seconding that. That was correct. Okay, okay Mr. Davis, anything else? Thank you. No, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, Mr. Sawyer, do you have anything to report? 
Nothing to report. Mr. Oliveras? Nothing to report. Mr. Dowd? Nothing, Nothing to report. Mr. Rogers? No report. And Vice Mayor Fleming? Uh, nothing to report. Okay, and the only thing I had to report, uh, Mr. Wine mentioned it, I was a panelist on last Thursday's community meeting uh, regarding the Finley Safe um, Distancing Program. And I would echo the comments uh, of Mr. Rogers that it was, um, I thought, a very well-managed uh, public community meeting using this new technology to its greatest asset. All right, with that, consent items. Uh, Mr. McGlynn. Yes, uh, item 12.1, resolution request authorization to submit a 2019 U3 investment grant program application to the board of the state and community corrections. Item 12.2, resolution bid award purchase order for Chevrolet 3500 Silverado LT cab and chassis with nine foot crane body. Item 12.3, resolution bid award purchase order for 2021 Chevrolet 3500 Silverado cab and chassis with nine foot utility body. Item 12.4, resolution bid award purchase order for 2020 Ford F350 standard cab and chassis with nine foot utility body. Item 12.5, resolution bid award purchase order for 2020 Ford F350 Cat, standard cab and chassis with nine foot utility body. Uh, item 12.6, resolution bid award purchase order for 2020 Ford F450 extended cab and chassis with stake dump body. Item 12.7, resolution bid award purchase order for 2020 Ford F550 standard cabs and chassis with three dash four dump body. Item 12.8, Resolution approval for purchase orders for various heavy equipment purchases under SOAR slash NJPA cooperative agreements. Item 12.9, resolution free garage parking between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. Item 12.10, resolution approval of an exclusive negotiating agreement with Freebird Development Company LLC and Allied Housing Inc for the potential lease and development of the former Bennett Valley Senior Center Complex located at 702 Bennett Valley Road, subject to approval of a disposition and development agreement for the project. Item 12.11, resolution, a council ratification of a blanket purchase order with Hotel La Rose Incorporated to provide emergency rooms for first responders who need to quarantine due to potential exposure to COVID-19 from 3-23-2020 through 5-22-2020. Mayor, you are muted. Thank you for that, Dina. All right, Council, any questions over any of the consent calendar? Mr. Sawyer. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I just want to, it might not be a bad idea, uh, perhaps, if Jason could address given our financial situation, how our fleet maintenance um, division uh, uses their vehicle replacement um, program um, and, and how that how that functions so that people can understand why this is happening all at once. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Sawyer. Um, the uh, fleet team uh, works with each of the departments to identify replacement needs. Um, we currently have a, a computer management system that tracks each of the vehicles and their useful life. It tracks uh, costs of providing the service and updating or uh, maintaining each of those pieces of equipment. And uh, after the useful life has uh, been achieved, uh, we've evaluated how much it's costing us annually to maintain. Uh, fleet management is working with each department to determine if that vehicle is up for replacement. Um, this is the time of year when we typically come forward uh, with our replacement program. Uh, and that's what you're seeing today is a series of uh, requests predominantly from Santa Rosa Water uh, to replace vehicles that have now met or exceeded their, their useful life. Uh, and are at a point where it's costing more money for us to maintain uh, than to keep them serviceable in the fleet. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, and I'll just uh, note because it is something that I frequently uh, look for and bring up particularly around these 
these types of purchases. Uh, the Santa Rosa bidder was off by about 9% on almost all of them. Uh, so I, I've been, been pushing and I hope that we'll see it soon. Uh, still the update to our local preference, uh, but the 9% uh, is a little bit further out than we normally see for, for these sorts of things. Okay, Council, any additional questions for staff? Okay, we're now going to take public comments on item 12 of the consent calendar. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing, dialing in via telephone, please dial star 9 to raise your hand. Madam City Clerk, do we have any public comment on item 12? Right now, I am not seeing any attendees raising their hand on item 12. We can give it a moment. Oh, I see one hand. One moment, please. Okay, I have a public comment from June Prisier. I will enable your speaking permissions, June. Let me share my screen so you can see a timer. June, do you see the timer on your screen? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you, your time begins now. Um, yeah, hi, good to speak with you all. Fun to see you all on Zoom. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment on the paid sick leave topic that um, some of the previous speakers have brought up. I'm speaking on behalf of the Green Party of Sonoma County, and we would support uh, the City Council putting on your agenda a very time coming up very soon the item of paid sick leave. It's a very urgent matter and we really need this basic standard for our community. It's the basic decent way to support our workers and to have just uh, basic public health measures uh, in place. And uh, you know, we really need this uh, support for our workers as and, and this baseline standard across all our businesses operating here. You know, we do have businesses that have under 500 employees meeting this standard, and we need those larger uh, organizations, corporations, businesses to be meeting the standard and not undercutting the businesses that are complying. And uh, we really just this is something we need for all our workers to have equal access to paid sick, sick leave. Um, we also support the continuation uh, to move forward with the bringing up the minimum wage uh, this year on schedule. And uh, that is uh, the comments I wanted to make. Thank you so much. Thank you, June. I wanted to um, just note that the mayor will be calling items as they appear on the agenda. Um, I wanted to let June continue or complete her comment, but we are hearing public comments on item 12, the consent calendar. And at this point, there are no additional hands raised. And Mayor, we, do, we, do. we do have two um, emails received on agenda item 12.1 and 12.8. Um, 12.1 from Jack Osborne. Their designee in post, define their designee as used in this segment. Delegate authority to the assistant city manager or their designee to submit the application. For item 12.8, you will note if you look at the darn documents that there are problems with the signatures on almost all of the supporting documents and also the dating of said documents. But of course, it is just public money and not important. Of course, the total amount is a lot of money and we are facing a shortfall of funds that is yet to be determined. Is there a really good reason that we should spend that much money today? How come the purchases are not all at one place, if possible, to get the benefit of combining purchases to get discount? Did buyer check with actual vendors to try to get a better price or is it just public money and no need to minimize expenditures? That concludes uh, emailed public comments received. Okay, and we have one final voice message public comment, and I will play it now. Dwayne Hewitt, consent items 12. 
this is the time when you should perhaps put all of your purchases of heavy equipment and basic trucks on hold. You need to tighten your belts. And spending millions upon millions of dollars right now on this equipment might not be a good idea, especially because you could probably get this stuff at less expensive prices in a short period of time. Now would be the time to wait until you make sure that your budget in the future is going to be able to withstand the shocks that are coming its way due to what's occurred with the pandemic of COVID-19. Please, some hard-headed fiscal restraint would help us now. Thank you. And that concludes the public comment. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Fleming, you have this item? Indeed, thank you, Mayor. I'm going to read uh, it in two parts to allow for the abstention. So I would like to uh, move item 12.1 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Seeing none, can we do the roll call, please, Madam City Clerk? Councilmember Dowd? Aye. Councilmember Tibbetts? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Oliveras? Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming? Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm? Aye. That passes with six ayes and one abstention by Councilmember Rogers. Thank you. I'd like to move items 12.2 through 12.11 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second on that. Any additional questions from council? Seeing none, roll call vote, please, Madam City Clerk. Council Member Dowd? Aye. Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Oliveras? Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming? Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 13, public comment on non-agenda matters. We're now taking public comment on item 13. If you wish to make comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. We will take 10 speakers under this item. Madam City Clerk, can you take it from here? So it looks like we have one hand raised. One moment, please. Can I set the timer? The first comment will be from Jack Buckhorn. Uh, Mr. Buckhorn, I have unmuted or enabled your speaking permissions. Please go ahead with your comment. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Swedhelm and council members and staff. My name is Jack Buckhorn, CEO of the North Bay Building Trades Council. I'm um, commenting this evening on the 14-day paid sick leave uh, request. We, we've been talking about this for some time. Uh, working with cities and the county of Sonoma to try and close the loophole that was created when Congress passed the Families First Corona Care Act. Um, they exempted workers w who uh, are working for companies of 500 or more. So the largest corporations in Santa Rosa have been uh, exempted from the 14 uh, paid sick days. Um, this these critical workers who are very low wage, many, in fact, most of them do not have paid sick days, are being forced to go to work when they're sick because they are struggling to put food on the table and pay rent. We know how hard that is. Um, this just makes sense. And if anything, it has exposed um, some of the flaws uh, in our social safety net that would 
would allow or would require a worker to have to go to work sick and possibly spread a disease um, that's caused us all this financial and uh, economic and health harm in our county, in our nation, and around the world. So I, I would ask that um, you stand with the building trades and support uh, these closing this loophole for the largest corporations in uh, Santa Rosa. And uh, I, I would ask that you uh, put this on your agenda for a future comment. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Buckhorn. The next comment will be from Will Lyon. Will, I'm enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Good evening, members of the council. I'm Will Lyon. I'm the president of Santa Rosa Teachers Association, representing over 900 educators in Santa Rosa City Schools. Um, I'm also a member of North Bay Jobs with Justice. I'm here, I came tonight here in the comfort of my own home, Zooming with you to urge you to not delay the implementation of the Santa Rosa $15 minimum wage law which is set to affect on July 1st. Um, I was surprised to learn that 25,000 low-wage Santa Rosa workers will, see, will receive a pay raise. That surprised me. That's a lot of us, right? Um, I was also surprised that a third of the Sonoma County work team dollars in average. Their average age is 33, and they, on average, they contribute half of their family's income. Speaking personally, our students and their families, we have over 40% of them that are in poverty, right? So this makes every single thing harder for them. It's hard to be a student anyway, but and in a COVID times with access to uh, safe learning environments gone, with technology issues, with every other problem that comes with income inequality, to, to delay that $15 minimum wage is really going to hurt those students and those families. And those students become members of our community who often go right from high school right into the job market. If Even if that includes the job market and the JC or the job market and um, other uh, higher education. So the, I heard Marty Bennett say earlier tonight that in order to get out of poverty, a family needs two family members making $23 an hour or more. 15 is still far below a living wage, but it just isn't right for our students and our families not to implement those incremental steps we've already agreed to. Thank you for hearing me out. Okay, Mayor, there are no additional hands raised under item 13, but we will have some non-agenda comments under item 17 for playback at that time, we call it. I'm sorry, so there are, we're allowed up to 10 at this period. Do we have no one else on non-agenda items that wants to make a comment? I no hands raised, but I could read the few um, emails I did receive. Please, let's, let, let, let's okay. do 10. If, if we have at least 10, we'll stop after 10. Yes. So comment received from Joanne Fishman. I listened to the meeting regarding the homeless setup at Finley Park. First, let me say the meeting was a setup. Mostly the questions asked were to praise the council's job. It certainly did not contain much useful information. The west side part of our city has become the dumping ground for unwanted situations. Finley Park is the only park on the west side. I don't understand why facilities that are already prepared are not being used for the homeless. The fairgrounds are located near a very fine hospital and the police department. There is ample parking, food areas, and hygiene areas. It is also closed to the public already makes a bit more sense to utilize what's already available than take away a park in the middle of a residential area. Has the council been bribed or worse? Innocent lives of residents of the west side will be forever changed. Get a spine and find a better solution. Don't be the pawns of the influentials of this town. I do expect a timely response. Also, one more solution. Set up the homeless at St. Eugene since the Catholic Charities is so involved. 
comment received from Sonia Bedford. I am writing to ask about your plans on reopening the Finley Aquatic Center. I can understand not opening for swim lessons for kids this summer or running a full session. I am asking that you look at water therapy classes and water fitness classes for adults and lap swim. I have been taking Donna Birch's water therapy class for a decade, which has helped me enormously in controlling my arthritis. Accessibility to the pool made it possible for me to get knee replacements. My knees, lower back, and other joints are suffering without water therapy. I am 72 years old and need the pool for continued health. Is it possible to open up on a limited basis, especially for those who have medical need? I'm sure the swim instructors, facility director, and lifeguards could come up with a plan that falls within the county health officer's guidelines. In therapy class, it is easy to do social distancing, and you could keep the showers closed. Water fitness classes could have a maximum cap on participants, so social distancing could occur. One swimmer per lane in lap swim could also work. Please include Finley Aquatic Center in the reopening plan soon. Thank you. Comment received from Michelle Farley. While I am grateful for a temporary site, I believe the selection process has a dangerous precedent for our city and county. It appears that Santa Rosa City staff are given the responsibility to select a site. The Board of Supervisors and Public Health were not involved, and now the taxpayers are on the hook to pay for it. How can this be legal? The tenants pictured in today's press suggest that they must have been ordered weeks ago. During that time, someone must have known who authorized the purchase of the tents. I am also very concerned with the picture of the portable toilets. What I see is Germ City. One must touch the door handle to get in. Transmission site number one, and you can go on from there. If the Sonoma County Fairgrounds was in use, those bathrooms do not have an entrance door. They are sanitary buildings. In fact, as I see it, there are other positive amenities that exist at that site. Near first responders on Sonoma Avenue, essential services could be organized and clients need to prioritize in one of the buildings. Bathrooms could be easier to maintain. Food services would have space. There is room for off-street parking. The location is part of the city bus route. There is space for the relocation of the tiny houses currently near Oakmont. There are no close neighborhoods, so to speak. Security fences could be adjusted as needed. Security services and patrols would have a clear line of sight. In the next few months, the homeless population is slated to increase. Why not be prepared? Comment received from Renee Riggs. This letter is to support keeping the Greenway as a tier two classification described as plan and implement in the South East Greenway for budget year 2020-21. As the submitted support letter states, it is our intent that the co direct cost of purchasing the property will be covered by grants, donations, and other non-city sources. The Greenway campaign and the other partners will continue to be involved in the development, operation, and funding of the Greenway. Thank you for your consideration. And that concludes the emails received. All right, so no more public comment submitted on item 13. That is correct. Okay, thank you. On to item 14, item 14.1, Mr. McGlynn. Item 14.1, report submittal of a substantial amendment to the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan, acceptance and appropriation of additional funds allocated to the city of Santa Rosa under the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Securities Act, CARES Act, and the established of COVID-19 rental 
Assistance Program. Megan Bassinger, ACS Manager, presenting. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good evening, Council. I'm Megan Bassinger, Housing and Community Services Manager. Joining me tonight is Rebecca Lane, who also is a Housing and Community Services Manager and oversees the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Before you is the submittal of the Substantial Amendment to the Fiscal Year 1920 Action Plan, appropriation of funds allocated to the City under the CARES Act, and establishment of the COVID-19 Rental Assistance Program. Next slide, please. As you are well aware, on March 17th, the Sonoma County Public Health Officer issued a shelter in place order. The state followed on March 19th. The CARES Act uh, was signed into law on March 27th, and this provided additional funding to jurisdictions throughout the country through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as one of the many agencies that are implementing the CARES Act. From this act, the city of Santa Rosa will be receiving $859,608 in community development block grant coronavirus funding and an additional $65,180 in HOPWA funding, which is housing opportunity for persons with AIDS. And this is specific funding for HIV positive and AIDS patients throughout Sonoma County. So the city of Santa Rosa is the county's administrator for these funds. In addition to the funding, HUD has provided a numerous waivers and guidance to provide flexibility in the administration and implementation of these funds. Included in the waivers are reduced public comment periods in order to move forward with implementation rapidly, Suspen suspension of the public services cap. So traditional community development block grant funds are limited to 15% to public services organizations. And traditionally we see those going towards our homeless uh, support services. And then also there's been additional guidance to allow uh, rental assistance through the home program and rapidly deploy that to assist tenants. Next slide, please. In order to implement the amendment, um, the city of Santa Rosa had to develop an action plan amendment and identify the use of the CDBG CV funds as well as the HOPWA funds. We are also shifting um, CDBG funds that had not been committed to any projects. We receive about $1.4 million annually and we have a little over 400,000 that I'll get to in later slides that we are recommending be moved to public services programs. And then finally shifting unprogrammed uh, home funds from housing production to rental assistance. As I mentioned, HUD reduced the public comment period to five days. We had an open period from May 5th to May 12th. We've still received comments up until today. And it should be noted that we've received the most comments um, that we have in years for any of our action plans, even with the reduced period. We received over 25 comments. Um, many of them were supportive of the proposed rental assistance program. And there were also um, a significant number of comments that are critical of the homeless spending that's being recommended. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, as part of the amendment, we are recommending that the balance of the fiscal year 1920 CDBG funds be reallocated to uh, public services to support homeless programs that are being rolled out and are currently being developed by our homeless team. The additional HOPWA funds of 65,000 that we are receiving as part of the CARES Act be used to maintain and enhance our existing HOPWA services, which is what has been directed by HUD. And this is through face-to-face, um, -face, which is the city's service provider. And that the balance of the home funds, and this is the fiscal year 1920 funding, be moved from housing production to rental assistance. And the timing on this was quite good because we were preparing to issue a notice of funding availability for production when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic began. Next slide, please. I'm gonna now turn it over to Rebecca Lane. Thank you, Megan. A July 2019 report published by the National League of Cities identified housing as a prerequisite for economic nobility, job security, and health. The critical role of stable housing has perhaps never been so clear 
as the staggering impact of pandemic-related income loss looms for millions of Americans, especially renters, who entered into the current crisis with generally higher housing cost burdens. Slide six, please. The city of Santa Rosa has some existing resources for rental assistance, which we will go over in more detail in the next slides, including the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, short-term and emergency programs administered by nonprofits in the community, and should council approve the reallocation of federal home funds tonight, a new tenant-based rental assistance program administered by the city of Santa Rosa will be established. Slide seven, please. The Housing Choice Voucher Program is a federal resource administered by local public housing authorities. The Santa Rosa Housing Authority Board of Commissioners oversees the local program which is staffed by the Department of Housing and Community Services. We currently serve over 2,000 extremely low and very low income households in the city. The program allows participants to identify and afford housing in the private market. Households pay 30% of their income towards their rent and the voucher program pays the balance of the rent directly to the owner. The level of assistance adjusts as the household income changes, which ensures that the rent is always by definition affordable. As the current crisis hit Santa Rosa, the number of households requesting readjustments for income changes increased from 42 in January to 108 in May. The CARES Act authorized additional funding for housing authorities to meet this sharply increasing need in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Slide eight, please. Additional rental assistance programs available in Santa Rosa provide one-time assistance at generally flat rates. On DocuFund is a disaster relief program that was founded after the October 2017 wildfires and has reactivated to serve undocumented children, families, and communities in Sonoma County affected by the pandemic. They provide one-time assistance in the amount of $500 for an individual or $1,000 per family where at least one wage earner is undocumented. Beginning this week, undocumented California residents are also able to apply for the Disaster Relief for Immigrants Program, which in Sonoma County is being administered through the California Human Development Corporation. Community Action Partnership of Sonoma County has a program that provides one-time emergency rental assistance to households at or below 80% of the area median income, generally in the amount of $1,500 to $18 per month. Slide nine, please. The Salvation Army also provides one-time assistance in Santa Rosa to households that include children, persons over 55, or people with disabilities. And these grants range between two and $3,000. Slide 10, please. As we noted uh, several slides ago, we are recommending that the home funds for fiscal year 1920 be reprogrammed to provide COVID-19 rental assistance program. So of the 775,000 that's available, over 600,000 would go directly to um, rental assistance. The remainder would be used for administration of the program. In order to be eligible for this proposed program, you would need to be a household of the city of Santa Rosa and have demonstrated lost or reduced wages as a result of COVID-19. Your household income after your lost or reduced wages needs to be at or below 60% of area median income. And just for reference, uh, for a four person household, that's $68,160 a year. And then finally, at least one member of the household needs to be a documented individual. And this is a federal regulation. So that could include a minor of any age. Slide 11, please. If approved by council tonight, the following steps would be taken to implement the substantial amendment and the rental assistance program. We would uh, forward the amendment to HUD for approval and anticipate that taking a couple of weeks. Following their approval, there would be a one week application period for the rental assistance program and Rebecca will provide more detail on that. And then the rental assistance would be available through December 31st, 2020. And this is pursuant to HUD regulations um, they have provided a waiver for the short-term rental assistance. Uh, it should also be noted that staff is evaluating uh, ways that we can continue to assist households uh, after the expiration of this particular program, because we do anticipate there will still be need out there. 
To implement this new program quickly, we are capitalizing on the existing structure of the Housing Choice Voucher Program, including staffing, software, payment processes, and technology integration. We have developed an online preliminary application that we plan to open for one week to Santa Rosa residents. We will sort the pool of applicants into a list of households through a randomized selection process to ensure impartiality and equal access. Tenants will pay 30% of their income for their rent and the program will pay the balance directly to the owner through December 31st, 2020, or at such time that the household income is restored. Slide 12, please. So with this program, we acknowledge there are uh, several limitations. Based on the funding we have available, we are estimating we can assist 50 households. Um, noting that the need is probably much greater and we'll get a better understanding of what the true need is once the application period opens and closes. Also, the limited time of assistance is only through December 31st of this year. And then finally, a limitation is that we are not able to assist uh, households that are entirely undocumented. So one member does need to be documented. Next slide, please. Some of the solutions that we are working on in order to address the limitations are uh, potential funding from nonprofits to help assist with the undocumented residents and also keeping up on changes in the community and programs that are available, as noted by Rebecca, and to establish partnerships that will help um, address our residents in filling their needs and expanding the number of households that we can assist. Next slide, please. To ensure that eligible residents are made aware of this opportunity to apply for rental assistance, we are developing a multilingual outreach strategy utilizing the city's social media channels, Nextdoor, srcity.org slash emergency, and the City Connection service, which has 68,000 subscribers through text and email. We will also engage our nonprofit partners to help spread the word about the program and assist their clients in applying it if necessary. The application and eligibility certification process will be accessible to persons with disabilities. And the outreach effort will evolve as we have conversations with the community and identify additional ways to market the program. Slide 15, please. So with that presentation, we are recommending um, that the council take five separate actions. I'm going to briefly summarize these for you. One, that you authorize the submittal of the 19 20 um, action year amendment. Two, that you authorize the city manager to execute all agreements and amendments for the HOPWA and CDBG funds as required by HUD. Three, that you authorize the director of housing and community services to amend the fiscal year 1920 HOPWA agreement to incorporate the additional CARES Act funding. Four, that you authorize the additional CDBG CV funds for public services and authorize the execution of uh, agreements once we have identified programs. And finally, that you appropriate the additional funding available through the CARES Act funding, which is $65,180 of HOPWA and $859,608 of CDBG CV funds to the city of Santa Rosa. That concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Megan and Rebecca, for that presentation. Um, I do appreciate you talking about the comments because I know I've mentioned this in the past, the lack of public comment previous years. It's nice to see that we do have some folks engaged in this process. Um, so with that, do uh, we have any questions from council? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so a quick question that I had for staff is, the way this is being structured is similar to Section 8. So does that mean that we're going to be essentially serving 50 households more or less um, on an ongoing basis. So the, the program is very similar in so far as the rental calculation is the same uh, for the Section 8 program and mm -hmm. the, the home uh, TIBRA program. And as we've uh, discussed, there is a time limit on this particular funding source, but we're working on strategies to, as we approach the end of the calendar year, what resources would be available to extend the assistance if people still require it. Right. I think I remember reading it was December 31st. Um, so I guess I'm try let me try to phrase it a different way. So instead of tailoring 
tailoring it to an individual's needs, let's say they, they miss two months of work, um, are we able to go back and, and pay for 70%? Because I know that 30% has to come from their own pocket. Uh, so are we able to pay 70% of that for them uh, for those two months? So this is Megan. Um, the HUD waivers allow the period of assistance to be April 10th through December 31st. So in theory, if you were not able to pay your full April rent because you had lost your job at the end of March or beginning of April, then it appears as though you, we could possibly assist you in arrears. Okay, great. That was my question. And I did want to say thank you. Uh, you know, I'm proud that the city brought this forward so quickly because um, it's obviously an ongoing concern and in my day job I'm bumping up against a, a large number of people that are calling asking for rental support who are really scared and so I just thank you for um, you know being sensitive to that need. Vice Mayor Fleming question. Thank you Mayor. Uh, my question is um, having to do with uh, the documentation status of at least one member of the household receiving services um, or support. Um, would it be possible for a child under the age of 18 to be the documented member of a recipient family or is it um, over 18, which is common in a lot of federal aid programs? No, this is Rebecca. In this program, it can be a minor who is the documented member of the household. Anyone who's uh, birth to age 18. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Council, any additional questions? Seeing none. So we're now going to take public comments on item 14.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand and you'll have three minutes. Adam City Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? And mute myself. Yes, we have one hand raised so far. Uh, the first public comment will be from M. Bennett. I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and proceed with your comment. Hi, my name is Marty Bennett, uh, representing Unite Here Local 2850, a union of gaming, hotel, and food service workers in the East and North Bay. Uh, we strongly support the amendment of the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan uh, that would redirect the city's existing home funding for rental assistance. Um, as city staff has reported, the program will only affect a very limited number of residents and thousands of Santa Rosa renters desperately need help. Uh, particularly as between 2006 and 2017 in the North Bay and across California, median household rent rose by 16%, while median annual renting earnings for a typical full-time worker increased by just 2%. Moreover, 40% of renters have at least one person in the household experiencing significant income loss as a result of the economic impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. In order for rental assistance to have the most impact, we must procure additional funds um, for rental assistance. Renters must be forgiven for any missed payments in the months of March, April, and May, and not be evicted for missing payments after the crisis is over. And certainly rental assistance has to be coupled with other policy approaches to dealing with um, the unaffordability of housing and the rental crisis in our community, such as raising the minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. The next public comment will be from Jorge, followed by, oh, they lowered their hand. One moment. Jorge, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone and begin your comment? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Jorge Um, I'd like to thank the council 
and encourage them to pass this uh, this this agenda item. I think that rental assistance is something that's um, much needed in Santa Rosa, and I think the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated that need. Um, we need to remember that before the pandemic, we did have an affordability crisis. And even though this program is only going to help a small number of families, I think any family help by the city is an amazing step forward because it's a symbolic action that shows that the city is in it um, for everyone. And so I would just like, again, to encourage the council to pass this and to thank the city staff for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. That concludes the live public comment. And we will move on to the recorded audio files. One moment, please. Hello, my name is Rachel Marcus. I am a Santa Rosa resident and I'm with the um, Sonoma County Tenants Union and I'm commenting on item 14.1. My comment is that I support uh, the amendment of the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan that would redirect the city's existing home funding for rental assistance. But it must be also noted that this funding will not even scratch the surface for those who need it. Uh, a UC Berkeley study estimated that 40% of renters in California have at least one person in their household experiencing a significant income loss as a result of the um, impacts of the pandemic. In Santa Rosa, that translates to about 12,000 households. This um, proposed $600,000 in funding will only cover about 52 households for six months um, if we are to prioritize the people who are most in need of assistance. So while this is an important first step, we call on you to both um, expand the funding, in particular for undocumented and mixed status families, um, and to for, for renters um, who are getting this assistance, uh, the money will go farther if we, if you all can um, forgive rent payment for the months of March, April, and May um, for those receiving rental assistance. And um, people must not be evicted for any missed rent payments after the crisis is over. Um, we urge you to do right by, we urge you to do what is right by renters. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rachel Marcus. I am. Uh... Okay, now we have email and e comments for 14.1. This is the city clerk, and I'll read um, email and e comments for 14.1. This is a duplicate comment submitted by Bruce Berkowitz, Jason Kishineff, Patrick Michaels, Ruth Witchery and Roseanne Day. I support the amendment of the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan that would redirect the city's existing home funding for rental assistance. However, this funding will not even cover the tip of the iceberg for those who need it. In California, 40% of renters have at least one person in the household experiencing significant income loss as a result of the economic impacts of COVID-19. In Santa Rosa, that's at least 12,000 households. $600,000 in funding will only cover about 52 households for six months with average rents of $2,000 a month and with prioritizing families who would need the maximum assistance. In order for rental assistance to have the most impact, additional funding needs needs to be secured and allocated, in particular for our undocumented and mixed status families. Renters must be forgiven any missed payments in the months of March, April, and May, and must not be evicted for missed payments after the crisis is over. We urge you to do what is right by renters. Thank you. Next public comment is from Jacala Kenny. 
I support the amendment of the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan that would redirect the city's existing home funding for rental assistance. This funding will not cover those who need it so badly, so additional funding needs needs to be secured and allocated, especially for our undocumented and mixed status families. Renters must be forgiven for any missed payments in March, April, and May, and not be evicted for missed payments after this crisis is over. Please do what's right by the renters. Comment received from Sharon Beckman. I support the amendment of the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan that would redirect the city's existing home funding for rental assistance. Additional funding needs to be secured and allocated, especially for our undocumented families. I urge that you do what is necessary for renters. Thank you. Comment received from Larry Morgantini. I am a homeowner, homeowner and support this very important issue. Thank you. And duplicate e-comment submitted by Michael Stanford and Nicole Perry. I support the transfer of funds towards a rental assistance program so long as it is tied with rent and mortgage, mortgage cancellation and any rent debt for the months of April, May, April, March, April, and May be considered consumer debt like what other Bay Area jurisdictions have done. The funds for the assistance program should be used to assist landlords who have, need help with their bills. This way, we can assist the greater number of tenants with the least amount of dollars since the current concept would only help less than 100 tenants and the city has 16,000 rental units. Thank you. That ends uh, email and e-comment submissions. All right, thank you for those comments. Uh, Council, did that generate any additional questions for staff? Seeing then, Mr. Oliveras, you have this item. Nope, oh, you're muted. My apologies. Let me bring the uh, item up. I uh, introduce it. Uh, an urgency ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending Chapter 10-45 of the Santa Rosa City Code. Nope, sorry, wrong one. Hold on. Okay, how about a resolution? I have a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa authorizing submittal of a substantial amendment to the fiscal year 2019-2020 action plan and acceptance and appropriation of additional community development block grant and housing opportunities for persons uh, with, aid, with AIDS funds allocated under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, CARES Act, and establish COVID-19 residential assistance program and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Second. Uh, so I heard the motion, I heard a stereo of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, who got it, Mr. Rogers, did you get that? Sure. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any additional comments on that first portion of this item? Seeing done. Madam City Clerk, we do a roll call vote. Yes, Councilor. I, I, I raised my hand, but sorry, it takes me about three full seconds to hit raise hand. Can I make a quick comment? Sure. Thanks. I just wanted to ask staff to, and I know you're probably going to do it anyways, but if if part of your updates that you bring to the council relating to the COVID relief effort, if you could let us know uh, how quickly or how slowly these funds are being accessed, that would be much appreciated. Okay, uh, Ms. Vice Mayor, do you have a comment? 
Yeah, Jim. Um, my comment is just one of gratitude. This um, was an act of creativity and really uh, intense concentration, as far as I can tell, from our housing and community service workers, and in particular, Ms. Bassinger and Ms. Lane. I want to thank you for doing the research, putting in the time, and bringing forward something that could well, only assist maybe 50 families. That's 50 more families than would have been assisted otherwise. And I know it will mean the world to those families. So you have my gratitude. Thank you. Any additional comments? Seeing none. Madam City Clerk, could we do a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Dabb. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Oliveras. Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming. Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, Mr. Oliveras, I think you have a total of five different motions in there. You're on. You're on mute there, Ernesto. My apologies, Mayor. I don't have access to Granicus uh, because of my password, so I'm only looking at the online agenda for my uh, resolution. So I don't have access to those. Does another member of council have access to the agenda packet? Because correct me if I'm wrong, um, Megan. Did you say there's a total of five different motions that need to be made for your rec based on your recommendation? No, there was one resolution that had five components. So the resolution that um, Council Member Oliveras read and was approved captured all the actions that needed to be taken. So we're done? Correct. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. <laughs> As do I. And I also want to add my compliments because I know talking with you, Megan, that this is a total staff came up with this idea. And what was really nice is that it didn't take from another existing project and have to prioritize this. You saw the opportunity, as you mentioned in your presentation, and I think this is a great use of these dollars. Again, wish we had a few more zeros behind that, but um, thank you thank you for bringing this forward. Okay, so with that, uh, we're gonna need to take another break. So we'll take a 10 minute break, reconvene at 7.15, 7.15.
Okay, Madam City Clerk, I think we're ready to con reconvene. Could you please do a roll call? Yes, uh, Council Member Dowd. Present. Council Member Tibbetts. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Council Member Rogers. Here. Council Member Oliveras. Here. Vice Mayor Fleming. Here. Mayor Schwedhelm. Here. All council members are present. All right, Mr. City Manager, item 14.2, please. Item 14.2, report consideration of amendment by ordinance of the implementation date and modification of the adjustment dates for increases of the City of Santa Rosa minimum wage chapter 10-45 of the Santa Rosa City Code in response to impacts to businesses caused by COVID-19. Raisa De La Rosa, Economic Development Division Man Director presenting. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwetholm and members of the council. So this item before you lays out the consideration for council of two options regarding the implementation timing of the city's minimum wage ordinance. So specifically the question is whether to maintain the current implementation date or to delay implementation by six months to January 1st of uh, 2021. Slide two, please. As a reminder, it was back in October 2019 when council unanimously passed an ordinance establishing Santa Rosa's $15 minimum wage uh, that is set to start on July 1st of this year. Other jurisdictions within the county who also did this, uh, they implemented their ordinances past January and I show them on this chart uh, so that you can see uh, in comparison uh, where we stand to those other jurisdictions. And that is the city of Sonoma and the city of Petaluma. Uh, from both a timing and content perspective, we align uh, most closely with the city of Petaluma with the exception uh, again that they started on uh, January 1st. Elements uh, back in October that were important to the council at the time were to reach a $15 per hour plus CPI uh, by January 1st, 2021 uh, to use the Bay Area Index for the CPI versus the state's use of the U.S. Index to not cap the CPI at 3.5% as the state did and to offer no off-ramps or pauses in the event of an economic downturn as is written into the state law. Also, um, beyond the desire to be ahead of the state's timeline, uh, there was a desire to also be consistent with Petaluma's minimum wage ordinance that, uh, you know, that again started in January 1st. And so, um, as you can see on this chart, uh, we reached that on um, January 1st of, the, of this uh, coming year. Slide three, please. So I took this slide from the original presentation as I think it remains relevant to the considerations before you today. Based on the study done by the UC Berkeley Labor Center, uh, they found that the average increase in earnings for minimum wage employees in the North Bay is estimated to be 15.8%. Uh, the data on who is affected is also taken from that study and serves, you know, really to dispel the myth that it's mostly teenagers and entry level workers who make the base minimum wage, because the, the data shows, in fact, that uh, this isn't true, but, you know, closer to 50% of um, minimum wage earners are 30 years older, years old or older, uh, and have at least some college experience, if not a, a bachelor's degree or higher. And, um, you know, it, it remains true from that time as well that most of the affected uh, workers are employed in retail, food services, and healthcare, which are, of course, among the very industries that are most impacted by this current pandemic and subsequent economic crisis. So, as you can see on in the chart on the right, healthcare and social assistance is lumped together and comprise 17% of Santa Rosa's employed population as of 2018. And 2018 was the most recent uh, data I had access to for this uh, particular data. And retail accommodation and food together make up an additional 22% of the city's employed population. But obviously not all of the workers in those industries make minimum wage. This is really just to show you uh, how large those industry sectors are to Santa Rosa's employment base in general. 
In terms of the industry sectors in a region most affected uh, by job or work hour losses resulting from COVID-19, uh, those are retail, hospitality, and construction, which comprise 30% of Santa Rosa's employment base, with an additional 39% of the workforce employed in professional services, administrative services, and other services, uh, service occupations that have also been affected by varying degrees. Slide four. So it was only two months ago when the Sonoma County Health Officer issued a shelter in place order allowing only essential businesses to operate. All other businesses or services deemed non-essential to the health and welfare of the community were required to close their in-person operations. From there, we had a series of orders that in part extended the shelter in place and clarified and strengthened the previous order. On uh, May 1st, um, the most recent order uh, though it, uh, it extended the shelter in place requirements, it also gave us the first baby steps towards reopening our economy. Slide five, please. The events of the past two months and the state of the economy, both for employers and employees, are what prompted the question uh, today before council. Under the first option, if no action is taken, the minimum wage for large employers, which are those uh, that employ 26 or more employees, will go from $13 per hour to $15 per hour. And the minimum wage for small employers would jump from 12 to $14 per hour starting this July 1st. And then on January 1st, 2021, the minimum wage for all employers, regardless of size, will be $15 per hour plus the Bay Area CPIW. Because it's a requirement that local jurisdictions that adopt a minimum, I'm sorry, minimum wage different from the states notify businesses of the change, as staff would have to quickly restart the efforts, we stopped very abruptly in early March. At that time, we were in the midst of finalizing our notification materials and uh, had to pivot to focus entirely on uh, prepping for and then, of course, responding to the pandemic. Uh, but before that, we anticipated having printed notices in the mail by uh, late March, early April. And at this point, I think we can quickly finalize and print those notifications uh, to get them in the mail by uh, early June, if not uh, mid-June at the latest. Um, so again, still meeting that, re that uh, requirement for notification. And then, of course, uh, at the same time, uh, we'll launch a traditional and social media outreach plan as well. Uh, on the other hand, should council decide to delay the implementation date by six months, you would need to adopt an urgency ordinance, which would require five votes to pass. Next slide, please. This chart illustrates what that six month delay uh, could look like. So the blue columns are the state time timeline, the orange, the proposed modified timeline, and then the gray is Santa Rosa's current uh, ordinance timeline. Uh, following the orange columns, so we would skip that July 1st deadline and go immediately to a $15 per hour plus CPI on January 1st, 2021 for large businesses. And this would match where they would have been on the original timeline. Uh, on the same date, small businesses would go from $14 per hour plus CPI. And then six months after that on July 1st, and we'd bring small businesses uh, up to the $15 plus CPI to match large businesses. So at that point, small businesses would be back on track uh, for them too to that original timeline. And I, I just want to pause here and just a, a note on CPI. Uh, the ordinance states that the annual CPI rate will be announced in October based on a 12-month average. So that would be October to October. Um, we have data for the first six months of this current time period from October to March, uh, which, you know, obviously during that period, uh, we were in uh, economic stability uh, and uh, times that were considered normal. Uh, and then during that time for both the U.S. and the Bay Area CPIs, the rates were within a 2 to 3 percent range. Um, of course, the Bay Area CPI is a little bit higher and remains higher generally than the U.S. CPI. Uh, obviously, the data began to shift in March and um, will affect, uh, we assume, the next six months. Um, however, at this point, though it's hard to know what the CPI average will be come October, uh, I did read something today that estimated it could be around 2.2%, but we just don't know. Uh, slide seven, please. 
Uh, I put this slide in here because I, I just want to reiterate that no other changes to the ordinance are being considered. This is only a question of timing. In addition, consistencies with the state also remain in effect. So tip credits are still not allowed by the state and are not considered in any changes to our ordinance. Uh, the same exemptions will still exist. Um, that includes public schools. So public schools are exempt from, uh, from the Santa Rosa ordinance and follow the state's timeline and all other consistencies with the state labor law would remain in, in place. Next slide, please. Over the past few weeks, uh, staff and council have received input from the community on this matter, uh, all of which was brought back to the Economic Recovery Task Force, where we you know, truly earnestly discussed and weighed the impact on both employers and employees. Both employers and employees note that their sudden loss of income and uh, compromised ability to pay their fixed costs are two of their core stressors. Uh, but the same uh, is, uh, can be said for access to assistance funds, um, it, which is another huge stressor. For small businesses in particular, uh, in California in general, federal and state assistance funds have uh, not just been difficult to figure out, but also difficult to access. On top of the fact that the process has been inconsistent, and this is most, mostly because the rules for these are uh, have been written in real time, sometimes uh, just after uh, money has been allocated. Uh, and then therefore the, the, the programs are slow and given the demand, uh, we found them to be uh, mostly inadequate. Uh, though the infrastructure for unemployment insurance already existed, unlike that for the business assistance, to be fair, the same complaints exist for employees as well. They've had a hard time accessing or sometimes it's confusing. And, you know, it, it has to be noted too that not all of our residents are actually eligible for relief through the enhanced existing programs for workers. In terms of unemployment, back in October 2019, unemployment hovered around two to two and a half percent. Unemployment remained very low through uh, February of this year, but uh, come March, uh, employment numbers uh, began their plummet. Um, according to the April Bureau of Labor Statistics report, about two thirds of the drop occurred in leisure and hospitality, mainly in food service and drinking establishments. Uh, but the the VLS also uh, said notable employment declines occurred in uh, retail trade, healthcare, and social assistance, uh, professional and business services, as well as construction. Ultimately, and and again after robust and, and earnest discussions, it was decided by the task force to present council with the options outlined here, and to recommend no action. And with that, it is recommended by uh, that the council consider whether to a, maintain the current implementation date of the minimum wage requirements of city code chapter 10-45, currently set for July 1st, 2020, or B, by urgency ordinance, delay the implementation date of the minimum wage by, uh, requirements by six months. And that concludes my presentation and I'll take questions. Thank you for that presentation, Raiza. As usual, you're all over this one. Council, do you have any questions of staff on this topic? Seeing none, uh, we'll open up for public comment. So again, I'm just gonna repeat what we've said for the other items in case you just tuned in for this item. Uh, we're now taking public comments on item 14.2. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You'll have three minutes. Madam City Clerk, would you take over from here for public comment? Yes, thank you. This is Dina, the host. And I will, I see several hands up. The first comment will be from Ever, followed by Brian. Ever, I have enabled your speaking permissions. One moment, please. Uh, it looks like I'm encountering a Zoom challenge. I'm going to promote Ever to a panelist because he's using an older version of Zoom. I will request that you leave your camera off and only unmute your microphone. Thank you. 
Good evening, uh, Council. My name is Eric Flores. I'm a school counselor in Healdsburg. I'm also the president of the Healdsburg Area Teachers Association, and I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. I am here to discuss or to talk about the importance of not delaying the $15 minimum wage increase. Low wage workers were on the economic cliff prior to the COVID crisis and to delay a minimum wage increase will only contribute to their increased economic insecurity. We need more and not less economic security for low wage workers by increasing wages, providing paid sick leave and affordable health care and housing and particularly for those low wage workers providing essential services during the COVID-19 crisis, such as grocery work, home care, child care, cleaning, janitorial, and retail work. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you, Ever. We will now move on to Brian Ling, followed by Patricia Sabo. Brian, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good to go. Brian Ling, Sonoma County Alliance, uh, lifelong Sonoma County resident. I support the six month extension. Uh, my concerns really are with the restaurant industry. This ordinance was passed pre-COVID, knowing at that time that the restaurant industry was going to likely have the most severe impacts upon implementation of the new minimum wage rules. The COVID restrictions are dealing a financial stranglehold on the entire industry that was obviously completely unexpected when you pass this ordinance. While I acknowledge the individual employee needs, if the restaurants are forced to close, then no one gets any payroll regardless of what the minimum wage is. Maybe the solution is to try and carve out the restaurant industry if that's even legally possible. Ideally, I'm supportive of an indefinite delay of the minimum wage until at least six months after phase three of the economic recovery has begun. Uh, alternatively, I would request uh, follow just the state minimum wage laws and don't go beyond that as I've expressed in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next speaker will be Patricia, followed by Susan. Patricia, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone and begin your comment. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Pat Sabo, and I am the chairperson of the Sonoma County Democratic Party. One week ago this evening, May 12th, the Sonoma County Democratic Central Committee voted unanimously to support a recommendation to not delay the implementation of the $15 minimum wage. As the representative speaking on behalf of the Sonoma County Democratic Party, I am urging you, the Santa Rosa City Council, do not delay the implementation of the $15 minimum wage on July 1st. Thank you for your consideration. I mean, a problem with my mute. Um, I'll move on to Susan, followed by M. Bennett. Susan, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and okay. your time will begin. Thank you. This is Susan Shaw, and I'm speaking to you tonight as co founder of Sonoma County United in Crisis and the director of the North Bay Organizing Project. I'm here to urge you to not delay implementation of this ordinance. Now more than ever, it's time to stop delaying the step towards a fair wage for women, for families, and for our communities. Women of color, Black and Latina women make up a majority of Santa Rosa residents making less than $15 an hour. I also wanted to say that we at MBOP and SoCo United in Crisis 
urge you to implement a paid sick leave ordinance for 14 days. And thank you for implementing the rental assistance fund and allocating this small amount of money to assist 52 families who need protection from accruing rent debt right now. Please vote to keep this ordinance in place. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Susan. We'll move on to M. Bennett, followed by Christy Lubin. Hi, uh, this is Marty Bennett from Unite Here. Um, I strongly urge the council not to delay the implementation of the 15 citywide minimum wage law approved last September. Why? First, the city of Petaluma implemented a minimum wage law on January 1st, 2020, that boosted the minimum wage in that city to $15 an hour for large employers. Elsewhere in California, on July 1st, 2020, 10 cities and one county will either raise their existing citywide or countywide minimum wage to $15 an hour. And this includes the city and county of Los Angeles, Pasadena, Santa Monica, San Leandro, Alameda, and Fremont. Or implement a cost of living adjustment to an existing citywide minimum wage now set above $15 an hour. This includes the cities of Emeryville, Berkeley, and San Francisco. None of these cities are considering a delay of raising their minimum wage. And the numbers of workers covered by these local minimum wage laws represents more than one third of the California entire, of California's entire workforce. Second, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Raising the minimum wage is an economic stimulus for the local economy that will spur greater business activity, particularly for small businesses, as low wage workers will spend their increased earnings locally for basic needs. The Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago reports that for every $1 an hour wage increase for a minimum wage worker, this will result in $2,800 a year in new consumer spending by that worker's household over the following year. Third, California and eight other states first established minimum wage laws for women and minors uh, in 1913. And over time, these laws were expanded to cover most workers. By 1925, 15 states approved minimum wage laws and seven more enacted minimum wage legislation between 1933 and 1938. At the national level, the administration of Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal coalition enacted the first federal minimum wage measure in 1938 at the height of the depression. It was explicitly enacted as an economic stimulus and to set a floor on wages. Canada should replicate the new Thank you. The next comment will be from Christy Lupin. Christy, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Christy Lubin. I'm the director of the Great Day Labor Center and its domestic worker organizing group, ALMAS. Um, we are also members of Sonoma County United in Crisis. And I'm here today because I want to urge you to not extend implementation of the minimum wage ordinance. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of our members who are day laborers and domestic workers, but they are also construction workers, restaurant workers, farm workers, and work across multiple low wage industry sectors. These workers cannot wait any longer for a $15 minimum wage to take <clears throat> to take effect. Low wage workers are the backbone of Sonoma County's economy and their labor fuels are whole existence here in Sonoma County. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to skip a lot of what I wanted to say because people before me have said it, but I just want to say that most of our members live and work in the city of Santa Rosa. Many of them have been out of work for over two months. They are suffering. They do not have money for food. They do not have money for rent. They are really, really, really in a dire situation. And the 200 members that we are organizing with represent just a fraction of the undocumented community in Sonoma County. Almost all of them low wage workers. Delaying the minimum wage increase will negatively impact their ability to make ends meet, especially at this time when returning to work means paying back rent, unpaid rent, and debts that have been incurred during shelter in place. These are workers who were contingently employed to begin with and were already struggling to make ends meet. Santa Rosa became the 40th city to, in, to accelerate to a $15 minimum wage in the state of California. No other city, as Marty mentioned, is proposing a delay, pause, or removal of their accelerated wage, let's do right by all of our workers by recognizing their right to a dignified wage. Let's raise the wage now. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. The next comment will be from Mara. Mara, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and start your comment. Great. Um, thank you so much. Hi, Council Mara Ventura. Executive Director, North Bay Jobs with Justice. Um, I'm pretty sure every point has been made and you heard tons of them last year when you unanimously passed this proposal, but I just wanted to add a little bit more information. Um, I did send this, but I know you're getting inundated with emails. Uh, just recently, the uh, Sonoma County Economic Development Board brought a guest speaker about two or three weeks ago, economi economist, PhD, Dr. Robert Eiler, who recently presented around what he believes it would take to recover for our county. And what I really appreciated that he pointed out were two factors that I thought specifically touched on the minimum wage. Um, one was that Santa Rosa's economy is a lot less dependent on tourism compared to other cities in our region and in our county um, than it is on having locals spend money locally on local businesses. Um, one of the most important things he said Santa Rosa can do is just to ensure that our residents over this year have money to spend and spend it locally. Um, two, he also pointed out that our low wage workforce during this economic shutdown are close to leaving the high cost Bay Area or they're on the edge of homelessness. Um, and he did a wonderful job of, of really showing the economic impact that unemployment has. Um, he really uh, dug down on the fact that any policies or policy changes that create barriers for our low wage workforce stunt the ability for businesses to have a workforce to recruit and rehire as they slowly reopen over this year, or um, as uh, recovery also creates innovation for new businesses. Um, this is particularly important for undocumented workforce, he points out, which is much more difficult to track and who are much more transient. So I thought he just made a really good point. This is a recorded webinar that I encourage um, all of you to watch, but um, he really dug home the point that um, it's so important right now that we ensure that our policies uh, keep money in people's pockets and ensure that our workforce stays around in the long run. Um, I just also wanna add that uh, North Bay Jobs with Justice has endorsed several small business proposals to support the recovery for small businesses, um, which include the proposals by council member Tibbetts. We'd love to see the council vet these options before lowering wages on our low income residents first. Thank you so much. Okay, I see no additional hands raised in Zoom. We will move forward with the audio or the voice message public comment received. Jack Osborne, uh, 14.2 on the agenda. Given that the governor is talking about a 10% rollback of state salaries, perhaps the city council would be better off delaying this for two years or so to allow the economy to recover enough to pay the $15 an hour thing. You might not think it's possible, but I think we might be in for three or four years of bad, bad things. Thank you very much. Jack Osborne, uh, 14.
And now we will go to Stephanie, our city clerk, reading our email and e-comments received on this item. This is a duplicate comment submitted by Kim Caldaway, Dennis Posake, Karen Kellum, Sandra Breary on behalf of Indivisible Sonoma County Advisory Board, Jack Wixey, Christine Hoax, Jean and Jody Hotel, and Anna, Anita Rich. I urge you to support 14-day emergency paid sick leave for all Santa Rosa workers. To close the loophole in the Federal Family First Coronavirus Response Act, the Santa Rosa City Council should approve 14 days emergency paid sick leave, 80 hours, for Santa Rosa workers affected by the coronavirus and employed by firms with more than 500 employees. According to the UC Berkeley Shift Project, only one in four workers employed by some of the nation's largest employers, such as McDonald's, Holiday Inn, Pizza Hut, Wendy's, Subway, Old Navy, and Family Dollar have access to paid sick leave. Emergency paid sick leave is a necessity for public safety to slow the spread of the virus and to prevent new infections. Workers employed by firms providing essential services such as grocery, pharmacy, retail, home care, and health care who work while sick may infect customers, patients, and their fellow workers with the virus or other illnesses if they report to work sick. Seven in 10 low-wage workers have no paid sick leave beyond the three days mandated by the state, and most cannot afford to take an unpaid leave of absence for diagnosis or for quarantine, isolation, or to care for an ill family member. No worker should be forced to choose between working when sick and taking unpaid sick days. Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose have all recently approved 14 days paid emergency sick leave. Oakland and San Mateo are expected to do so in the near future as well. I urge you not to delay the implementation of the Santa Rosa $15 minimum wage law on July 1st for the following reasons. According to a UCB Labor Center report, approximately 25,000 low-wage Santa Rosa workers will receive a pay raise due to the $15 minimum wage law. More than one in three Santa Rosa and Sonoma County workers earn less than $15 an hour. Their average age is 33. On average, they can contribute one half of their family's income and three out of four Santa Rosa workers receiving a pay raise belong to working poor families earning less than $50,200 a year. Between 1987 and 2017, the adjusted gross average incomes for the top 20% of North Bay and California families increased by 55%, while the income Comes for the bottom one-fifth dropped by 15%. Between 2006 and 2017 in the North Bay and across California, median household rent had risen. Comment received from Deb McKay. Dear council members, I am writing to give public comment on agenda item 14.2 minimum wage ordinance on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County. Thank you for your opportunity to give input on this important topic. This is one of the most important things you can do to stimulate the recovery of the local economy. Low wage workers will immediately spend their increased wages on basic necessities. This will increase the money circulating in our local economy. Many of our local residents are finding it very challenging to pay their rent or mortgage, and some have fallen behind. This increase in the minimum wage will help low-wage workers catch up on their housing costs. This is one of the most important things you can do to prevent eventual evictions and more individuals and families from becoming homeless. As we said when you passed the ordinance, this is one important step you can take to improve the ability of residents to stay in our community. Approximately 25,000 low-wage Santa Rosa workers will receive a pay raise due to the $15 minimum wage law, according to a UC Berkeley Labor Center report. 
And between 1987 and 2017, the adjusted gross average income for lowest paid workers dropped by 15%. So this raise is badly needed. Please implement the Santa Rosa minimum wage on July 1st, 2020. Comment received by Mark, Mike Turgeon. It is unfortunate for many reasons that the coronavirus has disrupted all of our lives, particularly those operating paycheck to paycheck. Please proceed as promised last year to accelerate the phasing in of the $15 minimum wage. While a tough decision, no doubt, the reality is that a $15 minimum wage is still not a living wage in Santa Rosa, and it was way past due a few years ago. Many thanks for your efforts. Comment received from Fred Allback. I urge you in the strongest terms to not delay the implementation of the $15 an hour minimum wage ordinance that starts July 1st, 2020. The Santa Rosa City Council voted unanimously in the last year to support an expedited $15 minimum wage ordinance. How could that support cave so quickly? The need for minimum wage workers has not changed. One in three Santa Rosa worker earns less than $15. Should you roll back your ordinance, 25,000 25, workers will be denied a financial boost they desperately need. And that would amount to $2,500 more in earnings per year. Most persuasively, many of these minimum and low wage earners are now classed as essential workers who are actually risking their and their families' lives to work and pay their rent. Should the council act to reduce these people's wages, that would be a travesty and a slap in the face to people who clearly need to be honored and valued more highly. Please do not cave on this matter. Voting to pay essential workers less is the absolute wrong thing to do now. Hold the course, do the right thing. Comment received from Devra Avanch. I am writing to express my gratitude to council members for approving the 15 minimum $15 minimum wage ordinance for the city of Santa Rosa slated to begin July 1st, 2020. I also support the Im implementation of an emergency two week sick leave provision to assist those without this coverage during the pandemic. Especially during these times of pronounced employment upheaval, I am hopeful you will not delay these two promised labor supporting laws. It makes a big difference in our workforce's ability to live in Sonoma County. Stay well and thank you for all your hard work. Comment received from Jasmine. I hope this email finds you well. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, small businesses in Santa Rosa are struggling. My family has personally watched many of our counterparts' businesses struggle. We are requesting a halt on the minimum wage increase in Santa Rosa. As small business owners, we cannot afford to handle our own costs right now. We will be devastated if minimum wage increases. Many small businesses like ours will be forced to shut down due to overwhelming costs of operating. Our local economy will not be able to handle the mass shutdown of small businesses. According to a survey by the Center Square, 90% of businesses are being affected by the pandemic. A minimum wage increase will affect these businesses even more. Small businesses are not receiving government aid and are being forced to handle their own costs. This will be an added cost that will threaten their livelihoods. As a lifelong Santa Rosan from a small business owner family, I request a halt of this in order to save our local economy and the livelihood of many of our residents. Senate, Senate Bill 3 had a clause where if dire circumstances arise, minimum wage would not be increased. This is a dire circumstance for everyone. It is our lives and our livelihoods at stake. Comment received from Michael Stanford. 
I ask that the council maintains the current implementation of the minimum wage, which is currently set to implement on July 1st, 2020. It is important that those who currently see receive poverty wages for this region be given the deal that they were promised before the current economic contraction. If we are to grow the city's tax revenue, we must do so by maintaining wage growth above the rate of inflation. And that must be done by sticking to the July 1st, 2020 date. Thank you. And that concludes email and e-comments submitted. All right, thank you for that. Bring it back to council. Any uh, additional questions you might have for staff on this item? Uh, Mr. Sawyer. Mayor, I have a comment, not a, a little history, not a, um, not a question at this point. Okay, yeah, we'll go for comments after we get a motion on it. Are there any questions um, from anyone? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Sawyer, you have this item. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I'm, I'm going to start by thanking um, Raisa for, and, and, and actually the, the and Vice Mayor Fleming and everyone um, that is serving on the um, Economic Recovery Task Force. I wanted to, um, before I make the motion, um, give you a sense of, of why we find ourselves back having this conversation today. And I'm going to quote one, one sentence from the executive summary. In response to the economic distress caused by COVID-19 pandemic, the city's economic recovery task force identified in implementation of Santa Rosa's new minimum wage ordinance as a potential issue to address. We were concerned about it, um, the impacts both, both ways. So we decided to have so some very in-depth conversations and we did, and we tackled it soon on the beginning of um, on our service on this particular task force. Um, we had a very robust discussion and it was really, really clear that no matter which direction we would move in, there were going to be, um, there was going to be pain. Every direction took us to pain and the pandemic, uh, even, if, if, even if, if the pandemic had not uh, arisen um, the way it did, it's, it, it would have been perhaps a little less painful, but the pandemic clearly um, made, this, made this question even more important uh, to discuss at our level. And um, we, last October, the council unanimously um, approved the increase in the minimum wage. And, and because we were uh, feeling so torn about what direction to move in, we decided that it should indeed come back to the council um, for to have a, a, um, some more conversation uh, and, and kind of confirm um, or change uh, the nature of the, the ordinance that we approved um, last October. Um, so that is why the task force came forward to the council with a recommended um, no action um, for this evening um, to both allow conversation to take place um, or to, uh, to bless our recommendation um, and move forward with the with the um, the item as it was originally approved last October. So that's a little history, and and and, and also con contained the motion, which was uh, recommended no action. So, Mr. Sorry, is that your motion? That is my motion. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there someone who would like to second that motion? I would. Vice Mayor Fleming seconds that motion. Any additional comment from anyone on council? Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Fleming. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just want to second what uh, Council Member Sawyer said and that add to that that this was not arrived at um, with a crystal ball, nor was it arrived at just by guessing. We acknowledge that we don't know um, all of the variables and we can't know the future, but that uh, what we did do was we genuinely and holistically wrestled with this without any preconceived notions. And that what we also did was we listened to various stakeholders and we went back and forth on it. This was not something that we arrived at easily or without heartburn. And um, it was something that I believe was done in a holistic and 
completely community-minded approach and uh, I'm proud of our recommendation and I don't know that there's any way for us to know exactly what's going to happen but this is what we ended up feeling most comfortable with and with that I want to pass it on to the council for your for your input thank you very much is, would any other council members like to make any comment before we bring it to a vote Mr. Rogers Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually, I, I wanted to thank uh, Council Member Sawyer and Vice Mayor Fleming for, for their comments on this. It was not lost on me that on our agenda where we'd be discussing this, we would also be discussing a rental assistance program for many of the same people that we're talking about, as well as some ways that we can try to help our small businesses as well. Uh, we know that people haven't recovered from the Great Recession, uh, and yet here we are having to have a conversation around whether to lower or raise their wages. Uh, and I know it's a really difficult conversation for most of us. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, I, I think there's a level of frustration uh, that I have and I know that other council members have feeling like this item was brought to us as sort of a Sophie's choice because the federal government has absolutely failed to do anything meaningful uh, long-term to both support our workers as well as support our small businesses and I'm glad that we were able to uh, start the discussion tonight about how we do both to make sure that Santa Rosa recovers as one entity and not divide us into the haves and the have nots going forward. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna be supportive of the uh, no change recommendation coming from the, the subcommittee. Uh, and thank you guys for your, your discussion on it. Any other comments from council? And so uh, whether it be Madam City Clerk or Madam City Attorney, so with the motion of no action, that's a simple majority, whereas if it were to enact the ordinance, that would have required five affirmative votes. Am I correct with that? Uh, you are correct. Uh, and the, uh, the motion that's on the table would require only a majority vote. Um, and I will note that no action, taking no action, uh, actually does not even require um, a formal vote, but I understand that the council uh, may be interested in moving forward to take a vote on the pending motion, uh, given given some of the sensitivities of this issue. Yes, thank you for that. And if I could just add my comments for getting this on the agenda, because it had come up, you know, like say from both sides to me about this, and I asked the Economic uh, Recovery Subcommittee or Task Force to take a look at that. Um, and I really think it is uh, important for us to demonstrate we're willing to have these discussions in public, get that input, and take the course of action that the majority of council wants to take. So um, with that, seeing no one else wanting to make comments, Madam City Clerk, could you please do a roll call vote? Yes, Council Member Dowd. I vote in favor of the motion. Council Member Tibbetts. I vote in favor of the motion. Council Member Sawyer. In favor of the motion. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Oliveras. Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming. Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm. Aye. That passes unanimously. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. City Manager, item 14.3. Um, 14.3 report urgency ordinance suspension of late fees and penalties for overdue transient oxygen tax and Santa Rosa's tourism business improvement area payments. Alan Alton, interim chief financial officer, presenting. Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the city council, uh, the item before you now is an emergency ordinance to uh, suspend late fees and penalties for overdue TOT and Santa Rosa tourism business improvement area payments. Uh, next slide, please. So currently the city collects transient occupancy tax or TOT um, and two uh, tourism business improvement area assessments. Um, and these are uh, charged to uh, people going to lodging establishments uh, within the city limits. Um, those establishments collect the tax uh, on behalf of the city and then remit to the city 
uh, th those taxes on a quarterly basis. Although I will say there are about seven uh, businesses that, that remit on a monthly basis. Next slide, please. So uh, the TOT is currently 9%. Um, the Santa Rosa Tourism BIA is 3% and the Sonoma County Tourism BIA is 2%. So any lodging establishment that uh, fails to remit the TOT or uh, the Santa Rosa Tourism BIA um, on time are subject to a 10% late fee and uh, interest penalties. So, and then also uh, just for uh, where the money goes, the TOT is a general fund revenue source so any late fees or anything like that would go to the general fund. The Santa Rosa Tourism Business uh, uh, Improvement Area Assessment is uh, revenue that's split between the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. Uh, they receive 70% of that revenue and the city's economic development uh, division receives the other 30%. Those are not general fund dollars. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we are proposing an emergency ordinance to suspend the late fees and interest penalties uh, for over to TOT until October 31st of 2020. Uh, the suspension of the late fees and interest uh, will be for stays during the April, May and June. So the last quarter of, of fiscal year 2020. Um, the payments are not being waived. I wanna make sure that we're clear on that. We are expecting uh, to receive those tax and assessment payments um, and uh, they must be up to date by November 1st, 2020 or October 31st, but essentially November 1st. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we believe that the suspension of late fees uh, and penalties uh, would provide some cash flow flexibility to uh, um, lodging establishments that are being hit extremely hard uh, by the current pandemic. Um, uh, we realize that, that TOT is gonna be low to uh, virtually non-existent for that quarter anyway. Um, however, we, we feel that if they, uh, um, uh, are able to hold on to those uh, um, uh, to those payments a little longer and not penalize uh, by late fees. That that would be a benefit to those those businesses. Um, this will have a temporary impact on the general fund, the metro chamber, and the economic development division. But we believe that that is just going to be a temporary thing as as uh, the um, the tax payments, the TOT and the business assessment payments will be made to us eventually. Um, it'll basically just cause a uh, kind of a reporting issue uh, and a little bit of a cash flow issue for us as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with that, uh, it's recommended by the finance department and the uh, planning and economic development department um, that the council by emergency ordinance suspend the collection of late fees and interest penalties for overdue TOT and Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Area payments uh, for stays during the last quarter of fiscal year 2020 until October 31st, 2020. And I'm available for any questions. And I believe Raisa may still be on the line that could help as well. Thank you, Mr. Alton, for that presentation. Council, any questions? Not seeing any. Uh, so we'll open up public comment on item 14.3. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You'll have three minutes. Uh, will our host take it over from here? Do we have any public comment? I do not see any hands raised on this item yet. Maybe we'll give it a moment. Let's 
Still no hands raised there. Okay, and do we have any written or uh, voicemail message comments? No, Mayor, no written or voice. Um, we ha do have voicemail, but we do not have any email or e-comments submitted for this item. All righty. And we'll bring it back to council. Uh, Mr. Rogers, you have this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will introduce an urgency ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa suspending portions of section 3-28.110 and 6-56.330 of the Santa Rosa City Code implementing late fees and interest penalties for transient occupancy tax and Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Area Assessments for stays during April 2020, May 2020, and June 2020 until October 31st, 2020, in response to impacts to businesses caused by COVID-19 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Motion by Mr. Rogers, second by Mr. Tibbetts. Any additional comments by council? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Dowd. I vote in favor of the motion. Council Member Tibbetts. Yes. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Oliveras? Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming? Aye. Mayor Schwedhelm? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right, thank you. We have no public hearings, no written communications. Madam City Clerk, do we have additional public comment on non-agenda matters for item 17? We do have additional public comment and the deputy city clerk will be playing the recorded voicemails received. Mayor, do you want to open it up for any members of the public still participating via Zoom to raise their hands if they would like to make a comment? Yes, if there are any members of the public who want to comment on non-agenda items, please raise your hand. And if you're on the telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand. Okay, Mayor, seeing no hands being raised via Zoom, I'll move on to the recorded public comments. One moment. Hi, this is Alex Crone. I'm leaving a message for agenda item number 13. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Members, I hope you are all doing well and are healthy. I'm calling again to ask you to please take action. There's something that you can do right now to protect the Not citizens now. of Santa Rosa from having powerful cell phone towers placed outside of their houses, affecting their health, well-being, privacy, and property value. And just like many other cities have done in California, you can create right now an emergency ordinance that one, requires insurance from the providers against harm, and two, cuts out these residential zones and other sensitive to institutions and requires telecom to provide significant proof of a gap in services and put it on them to prove that they need to put cell phone towers next to homes instead of just allowing them to go do that freely like they are right now. It would be very simple. You just need to cut and paste. You can plagiarize several other city ordinances in order to do something that's legal and really effective to protect your citizens. And I please ask you to do that. Mayor Schwedholm, looking back at some of the study sessions, you have asked Telecom to provide a health expert to talk about the health effects uh, of these things on several occasions. 
And the best they could do was send their engineer, who is a consultant for AT&T and Verizon, who shares an attorney and who's made millions of dollars off those companies over the last couple decades, to talk about health effects, who clearly has a conflict of interest and is not a medical expert. The people of Santa Rosa, let me remind you, in the last study session, had two physicians, two medical doctors, talking about the health effects and biological harm of RF radiation. So please do something to protect yourselves legally and the people of Santa Rosa from this corporate tyranny. Um, again, this is something that is very practical and easy to do. The city staff can simply look at other ordinances and create... Create an emergency ordinance to uh, limit the placement of small cells in really a few hours. So, again, I hope you take this to heart and I hope you are all well and healthy. And let's continue to keep Santa Rosa a great place to live. And um, thank you for your consideration and time. Hi, my name is Rachel Andreas. I'm calling on agenda item 13. I'm calling to ask that you please create an emergency ordinance to control the placement of these small cell towers. Several other cities in California have done this. We need this in place until a permanent ordinance can be made. I absolutely do not want any 5G or small cell towers in our neighborhood or near my children's schools. Please, we ask that you protect the residents that you represent. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katya Miller, and I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. Uh, I have a comment about agenda item 13. I just want to say that cities around California have created emergency ordinances to control the placement of small cells in residential zones until a permanent ordinance, wireless ordinance, can be made. And we also in Santa Rosa need that immediately. Please, Verizon and other telecoms need to prove a significant gap in telecommunications uh, coverage in order to put the small cells up. And they're going in right now on College Avenue and other places. So uh, please demand insurance protections against physical harm from RF radiation. Act now, please, for our safety. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes, this is Paul Shabrak, S-C-H-A-B-R-A-C-Q, owner of prop, rental property at 137, 139 Scott Street in Santa Rosa. I'm calling with regard to the need for the city to adopt an immediate uh, self-emergency ordinance to control the placement of small cells uh, like many other cities in California have done. This can be easily done. We simply need to copy and paste ordinances that have been adopted all over Northern California. Um, the uh, placement of 5G's uh, uh, cell phone infrastructure is progressing now that the lockdown and social distancing is in place. This is of, of huge importance. Uh, it will have adverse health and property values effects for the the city of Santa Rosa. So I urge you to please act on this now. Jack Osborne, Public Comment 17. How in the world did a bunch of intelligent people ever accept the word of a person in England that there are going to be two and a half million people killed in England and just say that's a true thing and then let it propagate through the U.S. government to the point where now you have people sheltering at home. The death rate in in this county is five, five, five people dead since March, and that's way below what would happen with a real pandemic where you might expect thousands, two thousand, three thousand. As it is, it's less than the one tenth of one percent, and there's something wrong because now the, you don't dare say you were wrong and to do all this because it would look badly on everybody. 
first thing you do is you never believe people claiming horrible things will happen unless you do this. Unless you know that's going to happen. But I don't know. I'm just a 97-year-old man. I've never seen such a fouled up situation in the USA since 1922. Thank you very much. Hi, this is for agenda item 13. <clears throat> this is Kim Schroeder, and I'm requesting that city council and the city staff create an emergency ordinance to control the placement of small cells, um, like so many other cities have done. Uh, Mill Valley was a great example. They did an emergency ordinance before they could um, then do a permanent one. And that could require the providers to provide prove, excuse me, a significant gap in telecommunication services, a gap in coverage, in order to put a small cell anywhere, um, as well as require insurance protections and so forth. So again, if, if it could please be an emergency ordinance, uh, the urgency is because we are shut down, yet the wireless companies are moving full steam ahead in placing small cells in, in residential zones and school zones. So, and able to, to provide the city with the local control um, to have more, more say in the placement, um, the emergency ordinance would, would take care of that. Thanks so much. Roberta Godby Tip, Agenda 13. Please create an emergency ordinance to control the placement of small cells. It's been done in other cities. Um, there needs to be a significant gap in telecommunication coverage to have to place small cells, and you need to protect our residents of Santa Rosa. Please uh, provide a emergency ordinance for Santa Rosa. Thank you so much. Duane DeWitt, public comment, item 13. Thank you for having staff come to the Roseland area, Southwest Community Park, especially to clean up the graffiti that's been left by the Norteños and the Soreños who are still involved in their gang warfare. And some shooting has occurred recently to the south of Roseland at Moreland area and the Unity Park. So please, bring law enforcement back to Roseland. Pretty much seems like they've been missing in action since one of their own passed away to COVID, and we can understand that. But now that you've reopened the park for the drunk drivers to come in and sit at Southwest Community Park in the parking lot and drink all day, we need to have some law enforcement come through. Let folks know that you folks are in charge, especially up on Sebastopol Road also. There were concerns that People didn't like that you broke up the sideshow on Cinco de Mayo, but many local residents were glad you did that and glad the police presence was finally reappearing. It would be nice for the police department to be given a full reign to do what they are paid to do, but when you talk with them, they say the city council is keeping them from doing it, from higher up, that they're uh, not able to do things. It's frustrating to residents to hear, well, there's nothing we can do. It should be the opposite. It should be, let us do what we can to help these, these neighborhoods, these residents, make sure that we don't get overrun by the lawbreakers who essentially look at it like they can do whatever they want. Now you can put them over to Finley Park and hang them out there for a while. Thank you for your time. Thank you for cleaning up some of the things that we need. No more graffiti. Let's get rid of those guys, the Norteños and the Sereños. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sydney Cox. I'm calling with for agenda item number 13. Um, bas basically, I would like to request that you please create an emergency ordinance to control the placement of the telecom small cells, like many other cities are doing. It's important to include in that ordinance that any small cells must be subjected to independent testing for radio frequency levels, specified radio frequency levels, not someone from the industry. That's really important to include in the ordinance. 
thank you so much for your time. Thank you for helping to make sure that our communities are safe. And we really appreciate your interest in creating a good ordinance to help keep neighbors, neighborhoods, and schools safe. Thank you so much. Bye. Hi, I'm Martin Miller, and I'm calling regarding item 13. Please create an emergency ordinance to control the placement of small cells, like several other cities in California have done, until a permanent ordinance can be made. The ordinance would require providers to provide a significant gap and the, to prove a significant gap in telecommunication services that that significant gap exists before placing a small cell in a given location. And please demand insurance protection against physical harm from RF radiation. This request is not just for the essential protection of the citizens of Santa Rosa, but for the protection of the city of Santa Rosa itself. Right now, you have hundreds of people noticing negative health effects from close placement of cell towers and tens of comments sent to the Santa Rosa C uh, City Council. With the increase of tower placement close to residences and schools and businesses and the increased intensity of effects that occur over prolonged exposure time, those numbers will, will be pushed into the thousands of people noticing, noticing health effects and responding to the city council. If Santa Rosa allows the unnecessary placement of cell towers in areas with satisfactory coverage that allows for unnecessary illness, the city will be opening itself up to hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits from its justifiably angry citizens. That is also a reason for the city to demand insurance protection against the physical harm caused by RF radiation placed in areas that did not demonstrate the need for significant gap coverage. Finally, along the same lines of creating legal protection for the citizens and the city of Santa Rosa, the city should create an ordinance that allows for its independent random testing of 4G and 5G transmission sites without giving the telecom companies any advance notice in order to verify that the site complies with accepted standards of safety. Thank you. Mayor, I believe that concludes our public comment on item 17, which was the overflow from 13. Stephanie, our, our city clerk, read all of the emails and e-comments under 13. All right. Thank you so much. I first want to just really appreciate everyone both in front of the screens and behind the screens who've been hanging in there, all the staff that have been supportive of us, of us since uh, noontime today. So we covered a lot of ground today and I really appreciate everyone's um, effort and energy throughout this entire meeting. So with that, having no other additional items, I will adjourn this meeting. Have a great night.